Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 11 a.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the September 24th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. <laughs> Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. <coughs> Mayor, council members Crone. Present. Weber. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on our closed session agenda? Seeing nobody here <laughs> other than our staff, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to the courtyard conference room where we'll go into our closed session. Uh, it's just safe. Okay, <laughs> now we're extra loud here. We'll go ahead and get started. Let's call um, to, to order our afternoon agenda. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the September 24th, 2019 Santa Cruz City Council meeting. And I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers is currently absent. Uh, Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Um, I'd like to ask our clerk to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this point, we get to meet some of our new employees. And so we have the introduction of the new employees to the council and the community. And I'd like to first start with our um, interim acting director of finance, Cheryl Five, to introduce her new employees. Um, I'm happy to introduce Ross Brandon. He's a principal management analyst for the finance department risk, manage, risk division. Um, he's a long-term resident of Santa Cruz and spends the majority of his time surfing, frequently frequenting the east side from Pleasure Point to Capitola. He comes from his last position as regional manager for Pete's Coffee in the San Francisco and Monterey Bay area. He has a bachelor's from UC Santa Barbara in history and religious studies. He's married, has two children, and his daughter is heavily involved in Santa Cruz Roller Derby. Um, his son plays soccer and baseball, and Ross has the privilege of helping coach the teams. He regularly travels to Mexico to surf, and he also travels abroad with his family, mostly spending time in, recently spending time in England. Ross says he's excited about serving the community in which he lives, and we look forward to his development and his career and benefiting from his commitment. Thank you, Ross. Welcome, Ross. Thank you. All right, so now we'll go ahead and invite up our interim assistant city manager, director of information technology, Laura Schmidt, to introduce her new employee. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. That's what that's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> so Kendra, dang it, I've been rehearsing her name all week. Kendra DiGirolamo is our new business systems analyst too in our information technology department. She comes to us most recently from neighboring Driscoll's where she worked for 11 years as a business systems analyst. Prior to that, she worked as a senior EDI analyst in Minnesota. We very much lucked out getting someone with such relevant experience to help us with our varied application projects and analysis work that we do here at the city. Her roots, her roots are deep in our community and her family has been in the Monterey Bay area since the early 1900s. Starting in commercial fishing at Cannery Row, they moved to other parts of the bay including My mic is dead, I'm obviously alive. Um, Kendra's great aunt Sally, Sally was even once the mayor here. Aww. How crazy is that? Um, the latest offspring of this great family of hers are her two boys, Cade and Jack. They keep her busy running around at ages 
eight and one and a half, she's pretty well consumed being a super working mom. She sits here at City Hall along the wall of our IT folks, so please stop by and welcome her to the city. Welcome, Kendra. Welcome, Kendra. Welcome, Kendra. So we have, um, last but certainly, certainly not least, uh, Director of Public Works, Mark Dental, here to introduce his new employee. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, and it's my pleasure to introduce Eduardo Ruiz. Uh, he's our new engineering technician, um, and it's an existing position. He was born in Mexico and was brought to, to the U.S. as an infant, uh, grew up most of his life in Salinas, and after community college, moved to Sacramento and worked on his bachelor's uh, in civil engineering. He's currently living in Salinas. Um, he graduated from Sa San Francisco, uh, Sacramento State um, and he's worked full time as a staff engineer. He's also, his focus was land development, road design, flume work, surveying. Uh, before he transferred to Sacramento State, he worked for Monterey County as an intern and he worked in the public works department doing uh, calculations of superstructure, uh, inspections, rebar placement, abutments, and other construction in the Carmel Valley. He graduated from Hartnell College, transferred to Sacramento State, graduated with a bachelor's of science in civil engineering in, in 2018. When he's not working, he's a soccer fanatic. He loves to play, walk, watch it, talk about soccer 24 seven. Um, he also likes to do outdoor activities, bike riding, hiking, riding off road, power vehicles, aquatic power vehicles, and other fun activities. So, and he really likes to see new places and travel in the U.S. and internationally. So please join me in welcoming Eduardo. Welcome. So we had a presentation that has been canceled for today, but we'll have at a future time. And then we have another presentation, um, a proclamation to support uh, the Global Youth Climate Action Strike, but that will be heard at a time certain at 3.30 when some of our students can join us. So I just have a few announcements at this time, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and is streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our council chambers. I'd like to ask any council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if our city clerk has any additions or deletions. We do, but there was an update reflecting it, but in the event you aren't aware, the presentation was removed and then agenda item eight, which is the firefighter's tentative agreement was removed. Okay. So I have an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. this evening. I do have a, a note that I'd like to let the community aw uh, become aware of. Oral communications at our October 8th meeting will occur immediately following the afternoon agenda items, but no later than 6 p.m., ending by 6.30 p.m. In, in, in observance of Yom Kippur per council policy. So we'll go ahead and now turn it over to our city attorney to provide a report on closed session. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. Um, four categories of items discussed in closed session uh, this morning and uh, afternoon. Uh, closed session commenced at 11 a.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. Item A uh, were public performance evaluations of the City Manager and City Attorney. Item B is a liability claim of Louis Anthony Ugarte um, that is also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon as an open session item. Item C, uh, involving significant exposure to litigation. Uh, specifically, this item was a threat of litigation under the California Voting Rights Act, uh, which was communicated to the city by a letter 
dated July 8th of 2019, which demanded that the city adopt a resolution of intention to transition to uh, elections by district within 45 day period. That's the, the time period specified by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and upon receipt of the demand letter, my office was able to negotiate an extension of that 45 day deadline to the end of this month um, to provide us with an opportunity to do further analysis of the claim. Uh, council considered that analysis in closed session today and based on that has declined to take any further action in response to the claim at this time. Uh, item D was labor negotiations involving uh, fire, IAF Local 1716 and executives. Um, the council met with and gave instructions to its negotiators. Uh, there were no reportable actions on uh, other, otherwise on those items today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kondorki. Um, so the council meeting calendar is the next item and it's an opportunity to see if there's any um, revisions and I'll look to our city clerk to see. Nope. Okay. So that moves us on to our consent agenda. And that's items number four through 13 on our agenda with the exception of item number eight. Um, that item has been removed from today's agenda as uh, um, previously mentioned by our city clerk. So all items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. So I'll ask my colleagues if any of you are interested in pulling a, uh, Consent item, Council Member Cohen. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, number five. I don't want to pull it, and I would like to pull number nine. Okay. Are there any other uh, consent agenda items to be pulled? Okay, seeing none. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question about item number five at this time? Sure. I'm very happy that it's um, in front of us, and I'm glad that it mentions, it talks about the launch of the Downtown Employee Eco Pass program, which I understand is happening on October 2nd. Uh, the, and then I see a partnership with the city schools and creating idle free campuses. Um, this is on page two of the staff report. I wonder um, frequently what, what our policy is in Santa Cruz about idling vehicles. Um, is there a time limit? Uh, if you go behind the catalyst, for example, I saw two buses, huge buses, just idling for a, a while. Uh, and I'm wondering what is our policy around that and if, if somebody could maybe respond to the idling uh, vehicle issue. Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor Tiffany Wise, West Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Yes, the city does have an ordinance that idling within the public right of way for 90 seconds or more is prohibited. So we are utilizing that in this campaign. Over the summer, uh, we actually have been working for a year on this campaign with the city schools. Over the summer, we installed um, uh, signs, uh, public works inside, uh, installed signs in the loading zones that cited the ordinance and has a very graphic image of children with exhaust kind of coming out of a tailpipe with a no uh, next to it. And we also provided signs to the schools to install in their parking lots and worked with the schools on putting out on their social media and in their parent teacher newsletters um, a blurb about why we're doing this, why it's important. And so those went out uh, just within the past month of September. Just a quick follow up. So does the 90 seconds in a public right of way, does that include parking spaces? I believe if they're public parking spaces, yes. So these buses often idle behind the catalyst in the city lot for hours um, and I assume, I don't, I don't know what the deal is that people are sleeping before their gigs or something. Is there anything we could do about that? You know, I would have to defer to uh, the police chief as to how they enforce that ordinance. Um, I know that there is some interest in a second phase of this anti-idling campaign that is more targeting uh, downtown, down, people who frequent downtown businesses. Um, there's interest from the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network to take that up. Um, that's what I know at this time. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Are there any other questions? About any of the consent items. Councilmember Matthews. Let me just speak to that one. I, I think I remember when that one came into an effect and it was because of idling along Pacific Avenue. It was generalized. But um, if in fact it can cover parking lots as well as rights of way, if it covers public lots, 
we could just do the signage, it would seem. So yeah. Yeah. Ma maximize the impact under the existing ordinance. Okay. Any members of the community want, wanting to address the council on our consent agenda? It'd be for items uh, four through 13, with the exception of item eight, which is not on the agenda, has been removed, and item nine, which has been pulled. Are there any members of the community wanting to address us on that? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to the council for um, action. I'll move the consent agenda items. Okay. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So item number nine was pulled from the agenda, and Councilmember Crone, I'll have you go ahead and... Um, Thank you, Bear. This has to do with State Route uh, 1 and 9 improvements. So it is called State Route 1 and 9 improvements, uh, acquisition of real property. Uh, <coughs> and we're, uh, the recommendation is the manager enter into acquisition agreement. Uh, to form a, uh, in a, in a form approved by the city manager for the purchase of three real properties in the right in the form of rights of way and temporary construction easements required. So my question is, and, I, and I'm asking this for several community members who have uh, contacted me from two different groups. I'm being told by community members that this work is being done in order to facilitate the widening of the Highway One bridge over the San Lorenzo River. Is that true? Mayor, Council Members, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, no, it's not true. This is for the Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvement, and it is completely separate from the Highway 1 bridge uh, widening or replacement, and that's being will be considered in the future. Okay, th thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Okay. All right, is there any member of the community who wants to address us on item number 9 on our consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for action. And... Um, I'll any kind of motion to move item I'll number move nine. item number nine. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by <coughs> Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, so we'll go ahead and move right along then. We're on item number 14 on our agenda, and we'll go ahead and turn it over to, um, I think we have our city attorney, uh, Tony Condotti, introducing this item, and um, we'll go ahead and have any presentation on the item by our city attorney, followed by questions, public comment, and then action. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Um, the impetus of this item is uh, several major infrastructure projects, primarily at this point contemplated by the water department coming in the next uh, several months and years um, involving fairly large expenditures of funds for which the city will need to um, uh, provide some sort of financing uh, in the form of a bond issue or multiple bond issues. Uh, currently, and, and by the way, it's being recommended by our outside uh, bond council, Chick Adams from Jones Hall. Um, and uh, under our current system, in order for the city to issue revenue bonds, it's necessary for the council to adopt an ordinance providing for that, um, which takes uh, a couple of months, and the disadvantage of that, my understanding, is um, that when you are prepared to do a bond issue, the underwriters will take a very careful look at current interest rates and current interest rates trends, and there might be a fairly narrow window of time during which you can take advantage of adjustments in uh, interest rates um, in order to lock in the rate that will be uh, applied to the bond issue. Um, since we have to do it currently by ordinance, it slows down the process, and so we possibly would buy, would pass, um, pass up opportunities for favorable uh, uh, financing rates. So um, the recommendation <coughs> is to adopt a new ordinance uh, um, amending chapters 613 and 1626 of the Municipal Code. Uh, chapter 613 deals with uh, the city's refuse collection garbage collection uh, regulations, and uh, chapter 1626 uh, deals with water, sewers, and public services. So it would essentially adopt two identical ordinances in two separate uh, chapters of the municipal code to authorize the city to uh, approve a revenue bond measure by resolution as opposed to by ordinance. So rather than a first reading and a second reading and waiting out the 30-day period, um, you would be able to take an action at one meeting 
and have it take effect immediately. So that's the recommended action. Um, I see the water department director is here um, who can provide some more uh, detail and <coughs> the forest director too, um, should, the, should the council have questions, but um, that's the recommended action. Okay. Any council question, council member Crone. Um, the only question I had, and I'll, I'll move it, but I guess we gotta hear from the public, but um, why did it take so long to do this? Like why now rather than like a year ago, five years ago? <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, and you may recall in 2016, we um, moved a uh, charter amendment that actually changed the provision of Chapter 16 to allow us to uh, pledge revenues um, from the water fund or from enterprise funds. And um, so we changed the configuration of the revenue bond uh, initiation and uh, issuance process. And this uh, ordinance is actually now replacing uh, something else that was in another part of the, um, the, the uni code with the very specific things related to revenue bonds for enterprise funds, refuse, wastewater, and uh, water. So that's the timing. So it was a really, a, we haven't done a revenue bond since, well, we issued in 2014 under the old arrangement, and then we made the changes to the charter in 2016, and we're getting ready to do a revenue bond sometime in the next calendar year, I would say. Any other questions from the council? Is there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? Seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for action and... I would move the item, and I, I think it's a good thing because it's it's actually put us in a better position to get these bonds. As I, I sat down with the city attorney the other day, and, and he explained it, but I mean, it's, it seems like a real positive thing for the city. Okay, I'll second the motion. So we have a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll go, go ahead and move on to item number 15, and um, that item is our cannabis consumption lounges, license transfer restrictions, hours of operation, temporary events, and ordinance revision removing requirement for the new cannabis retailer license when the manager changes. So we have a whole slew of things to talk about. So welcome. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Catherine Donovan, Senior Planner with the Advanced Planning Division. I have with me Sarah Fleming, our Principal Planner for Advanced Planning. And um, as the Mayor stated, we're bringing you a whole slew of items, um, trying to use our time and your time more efficiently. Um, we've brought forth four different things that we are asking for Council direction. Um, and then one uh, relatively minor ordinance revision that um, that we're bringing today is to introduce for publication. And the four uh, direction requests uh, have to do with cannabis consumption lounges, reta <coughs> retailer license transfers, which we brought in May but got delayed because of the length of your calendars or agendas, and then um, expanding the hours of operation and temporary events. And the ordinance revision has to do with allowing a change in manager. So to start with, we'll talk about the consumption lounges. Um, this is an idea that uh, we discussed very briefly when we first um, adopted the adult use cannabis ordinance. And at that time, city council was not ready to consider that. We wanted a little more time to see what was happening in the world of cannabis. Um, but uh, we were asked to bring this back by Vice Mayor Cummings, and we've done a little research. Um, there are several communities there was sort of an expanding number as I was writing the report, and I would say probably under a dozen, but close to that. Um, San Francisco and West Hollywood are being touted as the, the example. Um, San Francisco is sort of the premier ordinance, and West Hollywood is kind of an up and coming, um, has, a, has a different approach. Um, and the questions we had for you, 
first of all, whether, whether we want to go forward with this or not. But if we do, do we want to exist do we want to limit this to our existing retailers, or do we want to allow standalone lounges? Um, and if we allow standalone, do we want to limit the number, or do we want to um, have an unlimited number, knowing that our um, distance, there's a buffering, so the buffering and the allowed zoning would be a restriction in and of themselves. Um, we also wanted to know whether you, to consider allowing them downtown. We did not allow our retailers downtown, but this may be a separate animal. And then um, some of the other cities have multiple permit types, and um, we wanted to know whether you wanted to look in that direction or to simply have one type and then each individual business would be specific. And moving on, the retailer license transfer. This we've discussed several times. Um, <coughs> we've made some minor adjustments, but it continues to come back as the retailers um, continue to push to allow the retailer licenses to be transferred. And at this time, um, We've kind of looked at a couple of different options. What we have now, um, the competitive pro process maximizing maximizes our public benefits because um, when people are applying for a license, they know they're in competition and there are a number of factors that we list and so they're, they're trying to do better than the other guys. Um, but the retailers want to be able to sell their businesses and they also want to take on partners who would own a larger percentage than we currently allow in order to raise capital for their, for their businesses. <coughs> um, one of the problems is that the current limit on the number of licenses creates an artificial value in the license itself, um, kind of similar to what taxi cab medallions in say New York or Boston do. Um, Hopefully not with the uh, really severe crimes that have been um, associated with those taxicab medallions, but this similar process. So some of, and there are multiple options, and these this was just sort of a, the widest range we could give without uh, exhausting ourselves. So. Um, we considered keeping the cap of five licenses and allowing track transfers, um, but without the factors in the process, um, this option would limit our ability to obtain greater public benefit than we currently have. Um, and then there's the, what they call the golden ticket um, issue, which is that because of the limited licenses, those licenses are a golden ticket for the people who hold them and they can sell them for a lot of money. Um, and because of that artificial value, um, it provides an incentive for those businesses to sell to the top dollar, which you know, one of the things we felt from the start is that we wanna limit, that we wanna encourage our local businesses and keep um, large corporations, and we always seem to use Philip Morris as the example, out of the city. Um, a second option would be to simply remove the limitation on the number of licenses or expand the limit so that we um, have more licenses. And under um, that scenario, um, we would allow uh, people to obtain licenses who um, probably realistically couldn't find a location, but that would allow a competition for the sale of an existing license. So, so people could sell their business to people who had obtained a license but didn't have a location. Um, so that would give more flexibility for the seller and for the buy and more certainty for the buyer. Um, and it, it might increase the number of retailers. It might not, because we noticed with just our limit of five, 
two of those five had difficulty um, finding locations. So, so there is a finite number of people, not even in terms of business competition, but just in terms of locational characteristics. There are, there's a limited number of locations and willing landlords or sellers of property. Um, the third choice that we are presenting is to just do nothing um, and leave the ordinance as it is. Um, it provides uncertainty for a retailer who wants to, to sell their business because their buyer would not necessarily obtain the retailer license. Um, but that's the process that we set up at the start, so this is not something that the businesses went into thinking that they could sell and then being surprised. They knew this from the start, so they, they understood what they were getting into. Um, the third thing we're requesting some direction on is our hours of operation. Um, state law allows businesses, cannabis businesses, to operate up to the hour of 10 p.m. Under our original medical marijuana ordinance, um, we were restricted to 7 p.m. And then when we um, adopted the adult use ordinance, we expanded that to 9 p.m. Um, and we've had some requests by retailers to expand that up to 10 p.m. Now we still would, each of these locations requires a use permit, and during that use permit process, we review the individual characteristics of that specific location and limit the hours accordingly. So if they're in a location where every other business around them closes at 6 p.m., they will most likely be required to close at 6 p.m. even if our hours extend to, to 10 p.m. Um, so just because we extend the hours to 10 p.m. doesn't mean every business would be allowed to stay open that late. And then our final area that we're asking for um, for some uh, direction is for temporary events. Uh, and this is something that is allowed by state only if the local jurisdiction specifically authorizes such events and at locations that are expressly approved for these events. Um, and so the direction we're asking is, first of all, whether you want to allow these events, um, and if so, uh, do we want to limit the number of events per year and the location or locations? Uh, many jurisdictions allow only one or two locations that allow events. And then um, if we want to allow these events, do we want them to be for the sale of cannabis only, or do we want to allow sales and consumptions? And then finally, um, do we want to limit this to our local retailers only? Do we want to allow anyone or somewhere in between? Because there, there's a lot of options there. And then finally, our ordinance revision. Um, when we made changes earlier this year to align the definition of proprietor with the state definition, um, we had some unintended consequences. There's a word missing there. Um, and, all right. Um, so we need uh, this revision to allow the retail businesses to change managers without requiring a new license because as it stands now, a manager is defined as a proprietor and you can't change proprietors without requiring a new license. Um, and we have prepared a draft amendment for this so that we can have our, our first reading today. Um, and Sarah has reminded me that at the time that we um, came to the council on the transfer item, we were also, the finance department had come forward with the uh, cannabis tax issue and that was delayed until um, September also. Um, however, the 
finance department has had um, the director move on and so they are not prepared at this time to come forward with that item. So our recommendation on the revision item is here and then we are just asking direction on those other items. And if you'd like me to move the slides backwards, if that would help, just let me know. Thank you, Catherine. And I think when we get to the place where we're probably making decisions, looking at the various options, that would be very helpful as we go through them. At this time, it's an opportunity for questions for council members, um, and then we'll go ahead and open it up to the community and then return back for action. Do we have any questions at this time? Okay. Seeing them, we'll go ahead and see if there's members of the community who would like to address the council, and now would be your time. Please come forward, and you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Possible to request three minutes considering how many issues are being considered? No, we have two minutes for, we have actually, uh, we already have one request for four minutes that's been approved. Oh, um, I saw, I see. I see that person coming forward now. So you can go ahead and, um, and have your four minutes, but at this time it's two minutes per person. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm Nicole Lagner. I'm an attorney with Clark Newbert. Um, we represent cannabis businesses and do policy work across the state of California. Um, since I have limited time, I will stick to the most important issue. The proposed change regarding manager is not a, the appropriate fix. What has happened here is that you all took the definition from owner from the state regulation of Makursa. The reason that that definition works is that they cast a huge net. The state's purpose is they want transparency and disclosure. So they define owner, which really just means an interested party, as broad as possible so they can get as much information as who is involved. However, it's very easy to change who those people are, knowing that these are corporations, LLCs, corporate entities which are fluid. So what you need to do with this ordinance is match it with the state. So you basically went halfway. So if you're gonna say all of these people, anyone with 20% or more, anyone who is an officer or a director, you have all corporations and LLCs here. Officers and directors of a corporation change. So there's a, there's a definition issue here where you're kind of confusing the term proprietor with the term original license applicant. And the easy fix would be to have some threshold, likely 51%, so that you know the one applicant holds control of the entity. Any changes of more than that get reviewed by the city manager's office and they can do a live scan and they can consider the 14 criteria which were part of the original grant of the licenses. This is what almost every jurisdiction does, including the ones neighboring Santa Cruz County, Capitola. Um, you should not increase it to unlimited licenses. Number one, you're gonna have an issue with undue concentration on the state level. And number two, that's not solving any of the issues that are present here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Coffus. I live in Ben Lomond. Uh, before I begin, I want to express my appreciation for, to all of you for uh, your willingness to serve your community. I, uh, God knows it's uh, a lot of sacrifice and um, you have to suffer a lot of slings and arrows that are cast your way and there's not many of us willing to do that. So uh, you have my sincere appreciation for stepping up and taking this on. I want to focus primarily on temporary events. And um, we could start by saying, what is a cannabis, what is a temporary cannabis event? And I think we all know what events are. We have sporting events, entertainment events, educational events, commercial events, all kinds of events. And we have uh, processes and rules and regulations that uh, need to be followed in order to uh, conduct uh, any number of any type of event currently. Now, what happens when you add cannabis to an event? Well, if you intend to sell or consume 
cannabis at the event, you would be required to have a, a state license. And before you can get that state license, you would first have to have uh, an event organizer license. <coughs> so there's two levels of licensing that goes on at the state before you can uh, get a license that would allow you to hold an event that would permit other licensed businesses to participate in that event. So that could be a business to business event or it could be a general public event. There's a variety, uh, just like uh, there. Your time is up. Thank you. Excuse me. No, thank you. Okay, next speaker. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Pat Malo. Um, I'm on the WAM Board of Directors. Um, and uh, th first, thank you for coming back with these issues. I think they're all really important and steps forward. Um, I would like to take one second to acknowledge what wasn't on this agenda, which is a tax rate reduction. I think we've been working on that and we've had some sort of consensus that the number needs to go down, but where that number is, is what we're supposed to be talking about with the county and the rest of the jurisdictions. And I don't know if that got lost in the, the transition of uh, financial directors <clears throat> and Marcus and things, but I really hope that that can come back because this is a fledgling experimental industry. The stakes are really high as, you know, making it sure that it works out for a model for other places and displaces the uh, unregulated black market, so to speak. Um, and so I think those goals in mind, we need tax rate reduction and then we also need these, you know, pieces of the ordinance to get ironed out and then I think going forward on this uh, consumption thing is really important. Um, and then from the WAM perspective, we have a little bit of a uh, different mission, but these things affect us almost more critically. Um, the ownership model is really important to us because we might be in a situation where just by changing boards of directors, um, we might have to go through a whole, you know, unintended consequences with that that other people have spoken specifics on. And then also we have a model that we're trying to get to, to um, you know, sort form some sort of multi-stakeholder worker-directed cooperative, which might get really, really complex with this kind of thing. So, and then also, you know, the tax rate reduction for other businesses, it's life or death for the entity. For WAM, a lot of the time that extra tax rate is gonna translate into, um, you know, medicine for people who can't afford it, who won't get it because we're trying to pay tax rates and things. And this are a lot of the problems, not just with the you know local situation, but state in general. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Forward and you'll have your four minutes that you requested. I appreciate that, Ms. Watkins. Are there any other before you get started, are there any other members of the community who want to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing none, you'll be our last speaker, okay? Okay, perfect. Are you in the are you planning to address the council in the front, sir? Me? No, actually him. You not today. Okay. Just checking. Time begins. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Mayor Watkins. I appreciate the extra time. Um, I support uh, much of what has already been said here today, but I'd like to start with uh, presentation and give you a little uh, background into kind people's uh, jobs and economic stimulus. So we currently employ about 90 people, 80% of those folks are full-time. Those jobs just came out of thin air in the last five years since we uh, were founded. All of our employees do have living wages. Uh, many of them uh, go much, much more beyond that. 40% participate in our company subsidized medical insurance plans. And just to give you an idea of the burden of the CBT, it's about five times what we pay in rent every month. Kind Peoples is 100% committed to any reduction, future reduction in CBT uh, going towards increasing wages of our hourly employees. First topic of ownership, um, much of what Nicole said I am in support of, but um, currently we are only allowed to augment our ownership by 19.9%. Uh, that's simply unworkable for us in order to maintain our relevancy and grow our business and continue to be the stellar employ employers that we are. Um, ultimately speaking, we just don't want special rules that don't exist anywhere other than the cannabis space. So we can continue to innovate and scale and drive economic growth in Santa Cruz, but we really don't want to get left, be left behind with our other competition um, in the neighboring unincorporated area and city of Capitola. Um, 
we're looking to be able to modify our business's structure and diversify our ownership at will. Um, we feel like that is the best way for moving forward. Retail on-site consumption is the next topic. Uh, here's a picture of our Ocean Street location. As you all know, Proposition 64 doesn't allow anywhere for people to actually consume cannabis except in the privacy of their own homes, which doesn't really work if you're in multi-tenant housing or if you are a tourist to Santa Cruz. Uh, so in this regard, we can provide a really memorable and educational experience for, for residents and for tourists alike. It's also an alcohol-free zone, so we can bring people into a space and actually have a social environment where alcohol doesn't exist, imagine that. Um, in Colorado, DUI cases actually dropped 15%. And this is all about education, so bringing people in, asking them, hey, what's your um, experience with cannabis, and really getting them to understand the nuances of the new regulated uh, world of cannabis. And of course, increasing tax revenues is always a bonus as well for the city. Here's a little rendering of what it would look like from the outside. These were done in conjunction with our original design. Uh, it wouldn't actually be seen from the public right of way. And we'd like to be included in any future discussions on best practices for uh, a cannabis lounge. I know that there's a lot to it and we don't wanna rush into it um, in terms of making sure that we prevent access to youth, making sure that um, that we provide proper education and dosaging guidelines for consumers that you know may not have tried cannabis before or are just jumping back into it after a long after a long time. Uh, also, ventilation is very key. You know, I think of a hookah lounge, and I want to do a 180. Nothing like a hookah lounge. Uh, this would be a very safe space, a quiet space, um, a clean and fresh space with a lot of air. Uh, movement and getting an HVAC system that moves all the smoke and particulate out of the air for both our employees and our customers. Uh, we would also be able to provide uh, food, food and snacks for our customers and we would love the opportunity to participate. Our recommendation is to allow the existing five retailers the opportunity to have on-site consumption and then open it up in the future once we have a successful program in place. So thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Grant Palmer. I'm CEO of Canna Cruz Collective. Uh, we're down in uh, Ensenal Street over by Costco. Um, we're, I think, the longest running uh, active retail dispensary currently up and running, and we are just slowly dying. Um, we're losing share to the illicit market every day. The illicit market makes up about 80% of the cannabis market in California. The legal market only 20 um, because we are essentially our, our costs are so high we can't provide uh, competitive prices to people. And uh, that's not necessarily your fault, but it's not the state's fault either or the federal government. It's just a snowball of different taxes and fees that are that we get hit with. I had to pay $150,000 in just licensing fees last month alone. And that came onto me as debt basically. I had no way to pay that money because I get hit with surprise expenses every day now all of a sudden. Everybody thinks we're rich because we're in cannabis, so they want to take more and more, and there's simply nothing left for us to, to take. Um, either we'd really like to either be able to move to a more competitive location like CBD zoning downtown, or please then let us sell if not. Otherwise, we're just going to go out of business and I'll lose my house and all our employees will be fired. Please help us. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Jacob Lagner, I'm owner of Reefside. We recently opened on Ocean Street, and I just want to address, I think a lot has been addressed today. Um, I want to address the uh, concept of the golden ticket and um, the value of the, of the licenses. Um, the, all we have to do is look into the county um, where transfers are readily available. Those businesses are not selling, we're not seeing Philip Morris come in. Um, we're looking to, for strategic partnerships, to raise capital, um, to operate like a normal business. So um, I think you guys have the information. Uh, what Nicole presented is basically reflects what the state is doing, what our neighboring uh, jurisdictions are doing, and we basically ask for the same treatment. Um, it is a difficult business and we need all the help we can get. So thank you.
Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton, the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. I also want to speak in favor of treating cannabis businesses that are locally owned and operated um, as any other business in the city in terms of their restrictions on, yes, there may be a, a limited number of licenses available, but in, uh, whether you look at the state definition or the county, they all allow for license transfers, they all allow for um, these businesses to operate like other businesses in terms of being able to raise capital, sell, share, sell off stakes in their company, which is essentially what businesses need to be successful. Um, we're facing a very competitive environment. I don't need to reiterate a lot of what a lot of the other folks have said in the room. It's extremely competitive. The black market is still very much uh, existing and putting a lot of pressure. If we want our locally owned and operated businesses to be successful, we have to make sure that they're not uh, competing in an environment where they have one arm tied behind their back. They need to be able to raise capital. They need to bring on partners. They need to build a finance expansion. And right now, the way that licenses are regulated at the city level um, is out of congruence with what the rest of the state and a lot of the other surrounding counties and jurisdictions are doing. So just want to further uh, echo that sentiment. Please treat these folks like other businesses. Allow them to be competitive because they are locally owned and operated and they're facing a very steep market right now. Um, and they need all the help we can get if we're going to make sure that we have safe, quality access to recreational cannabis and not be relying on the black market. So thank you. All right. We'll go ahead and conclude public comment at this time and return back for council action. Um, we'll go ahead and have maybe you, if you want to, to put up some of the slides, if we want to move through this, I think this will probably an, a, be a multi-motion um, type of uh, item because there's so many components to it. Is it possible to get it the, um, the slides back up? Oh, thank you. Okay, so we have the consumption lounge topic as our first point for discussion. A motion was handed out to um, the council by um, Vice Mayor Cummings, I believe. Um, did our city clerk receive that motion? Okay, so do you want to um, address the motion that you prepared to make? At this sure, point? yeah, I think that um, having spoken with folks in the community and um, to members of the cannabis industry, it's really important that um, if we're gonna move forward with these consumption lounges, that we do so in a way that's really careful so that we make sure that we're taking into account um, what it can be some of the unintended consequences um, if we move too quickly. And so um, I wanted to direct staff to bring back recommendations for a pilot program for on-site consumption at current retail sites. So really starting with our local, current local providers, allowing them the opportunity to have on-site consumption and being able to see, you know, what are some of the challenges that may come up um, if we implement this and be able to address those before we offer it um, at a larger scale. And uh, just just to, uh, for staff, um, some of the recommendations should include, but not be limited to, the types of consumption, ventilation requirements, visibility from right of way, uh, separation from retail space. So if somebody's going in just to purchase, that they're not walking into a room that's um, heavily filled with smoke. Um, educational and public safety requirements, among others. And then uh, a retailer application process, which includes a uh, best practices proposal from retailers on how they address the uh, aforementioned issues. And I can provide a, com a copy of this if you all need it. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings. Is there a second of the motion? Second. Okay. So I heard uh, Councilmember Crone's first. So we'll go ahead and have a second by Councilmember Crone. Further discussion from the council? Question, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, um, I've been um, pretty direct with the various um, current businesses. Um, I'd prefer to go more slowly on this. Um, not, I'm not going to fall on my sword, but um, I'm, I'm not ready to go this distance. So. I have a question, if I could, for staff, and then I'll go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Myers. If this was the work that you were going to be researching and doing, what would be the opportunity cost associated with that, given our limited kind of planning department capacity? Sure. Um, so Catherine's workload right now, um, the uh, committee, uh, uh, Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness has started meeting, and um, we are getting ready to start some um, subcommittee meetings with them on the transition transitional encampment ordinance. So based on the work plan uh, direction that we had received a, about a month ago, um, this item, uh, were that to pop up, would um, take precedence or precedent. 
whichever one of those is correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so right now, um, that is Catherine's main focus, um, followed very closely by the downtown plan updates, uh, which are also time sensitive. So um, I would request, if possible, um, that council consider that in terms of what the timing would be for us to return with this, um, because those would one of those two things, if we wanted this to come back most immediately, would need to shift. Okay. So I am, I'm fine with researching a little bit further some of these things, particularly as a pilot, but I wouldn't necessarily want them to kind of this particular specific thing to um, consume some of the other public interest and bigger kind of policy work that you're doing. So in terms of time frame, if there's not a timeline associated with it, um, but was um, something you're further exploring, I'd be comfortable with that. I'm gonna go to Council Member Myers. Did you have a question? Then I'll go back to Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, my question, I guess, is um, how would we sort of, I, I mean, we'd have to have a public process, I'm assuming, as well. And so specifically to, even if we were working with the on-site, the, re the current retail sites, um, do you have sort of a picture of what that would look like in terms of, I mean, is that just regular noticing and holding a public hearing with these improvements or outreach to specific areas where these, um, uh, existing retailers. I'm just, I'm just curious about what that would like. Sure. Might look like for you. Um, you know, so there's a variety of methods that we could use, and I think it really depends on what the scope would end up being. Um, Definitely, we'd want to work very closely with the industry um, folks to make sure that um, we're all on the same page with what they're interested in, what their needs are, and then what the city is interested in and what our needs are. Um, and I would expect also that we would have some outreach to um, the, the community as well to make sure that they are uh, informed and also buy into this new type of industry here in the city. I, I would just want to add to that that... Um, since we enacted the original uh, cannabis ordinance in 2017 that went into effect in 2018, um, there hasn't been a lot of public um, input. It, it just seems to be something that the industry is interested in and not so much, I mean, you can tell by the audience today, we didn't have any non-industry people speaking on these items. Um, and we, we have reached out before, and it's just, they're willing to go along with whatever we do. So we would do, we would do some outreach, but I wouldn't expect it to be as intensive as we would on some of our other items that are, are more of interest to the entire community. That said, um, however, if we did find through this process that there was ex uh, an increase in community uh, interest and involvement, then of course we would uh, recalibrate our outreach process and do a little deeper dive if it ended up needing to be the case, for sure. Okay, okay Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Crone, and then I have a question. I was just gonna ask, like, what would an uh, appropriate timeline look like? Because I think that even folks in the industry understand that there are some items that can probably come back a lot sooner than others, and this one obviously would take a little bit more um, mm -hmm. extensive research, you know, looking at other city ordinances around um, on-site consumption sites. So I would just wanna get a sense from you all today Sure, so um, candidly, it's a little bit of a challenge uh, since um, to, to give you a, a solid time frame. If we had nothing else on the work plan, this is probably something we could do in maybe three to five months, depending on the scope, again. Um, and that would be the full process from um, meeting with the groups, developing a pilot program, developing an ordinance, doing the community outreach, and uh, going through the public hearing processes that would be needed for that. Um, given that this isn't the only thing on the plate, um, next year um, or later this year, I know that uh, this council will be looking at your three-year work plan and uh, providing more direction to staff on what you'd like us to be doing um, in terms of our work plan, specifically our AP team. Um, for us, I think most critically next year is the local coastal plan and program update um, and uh, finishing the downtown plan update, both of which are on Catherine's uh, list. So this would need to weave in with that. Um, I wouldn't expect, given the work plan that has already been assigned to us, that we would be able to start on this until maybe 
in earnest until maybe January. Um, and then from there, we could probably be back sometime in the late spring if you wanted us to take, take a jump on this. But she'd also be working on the LCP update as well. Did that answer the question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a couple of um, proposed, um, maybe for consideration as a friendly amendment to the motion. Um, if, if this is the direction the council goes to explore a pilot program, I would propose that the, um, the staff um, not make it number one priority given the other items that are coming up. So within, you know, a reasonable time frame of a year or so, or as it reflects maybe in our three-year work plan, um, to have the community prevention partnerships who are working on youth access and um, social norming campaigns and uh, work around prevention weigh in um, to see how something like this uh, fits with any kind of public health um, implications, particularly if uh, we have a California smoking on-site workplace law. How does that, I'm not quite sure and familiar on how that could be reconciled. And then um, if there's really um, major HVAC kind of ventilation um, impacts that that be uh, considered in terms of how we maybe be able to have some of the carbon offset fund be accessible for some of those so high um, kind of those kind of costs associated with that. I would accept those. I would just with the timeline, I think that'll be good if we could have um, it come back in like late April since that'll give us some time. I think that that would be if I would accept those with that um, just with a rec with having them prioritize this as a recommendation by late April yes. within the six. So having them at the cost of us not working as closely on the downtown plan or no. on the, that's, but that's sort of what I'm hearing. Is that correct? If a late April would be the time frame. So um, what I intended to say was that um, I would expect us to be probably wrapping up the downtown plan. Um, if we were to put this on the shelf and not start on it until the beginning of next year, we would be able to make that progress on the downtown plan and the transitional encampment stuff over the next um, few months and get those in a spot where they're ready to move forward and come before planning commission and council or whatever bodies they need to go to. And then we could start on the uh, picking back up the LCP update and then the um, this cannabis item and we could come back, we could aim to come back in April. That might be a little aggressive, but we could at the very least come back with an update for you with the aim of having something fully, fully vetted and fleshed out. But just to be candid, it, it may be a month, a month later than that, or but sometime in that spring period. Okay. So with a spring update or potential recommendation, if you're there. Yes. Okay. If that's suitable to the council. Okay. So is the friendly amendment acceptable given that, okay, the city clerk received that. Okay. Councilmember Matthews? Um, again, it's really not a priority for me. I'm really <coughs> concerned about the HVAC. I mean, just looking at the uh, um, graphic that was shown at Kind People's, that it looked like it just ventilated right out to the sidewalk. I mean, I personally don't like just walking downtown and being hit with a cloud of pot smoke, you know, so consider that. And um, uh, also just, again, a consideration um, a pilot program is not just going to be a simple adjustment. It will involve uh, a significant investment, capital investment for those businesses that choose to do it. So it's not going to be a, an easy flip a switch or not um, pilot. <laughs> Got to be something to take in, into consideration. Okay. Councilmember Kern. Um, I think what I'm hearing also, I don't know that the folks present can um, Way in, I, they'd like maybe for the summer season. You know, if, is there any chance of this being ready for like next summer, if, given that with the timeline? That would our aim would be to have something based on the the uh, prioritization here, have something ready to go um, by the late spring. That said. Um, the caveat there is if uh, once council meets and you do your prioritization process, you know, the reality is is that this could shift based on some of the other things that we have going on in our community right now and some of the other direction. Um, but we definitely could make that our aim and I would expect <coughs> us to be able to, um, assuming that no other priorities come up or anything else changes on Catherine's work plan, be able to do that by the spring. And could you explain what the neighbor like notification process is that you'll be using? 
Um, I can give you kind of a high level because again, it will depend on the motion that's made and the scope of, of the project. Um, but I think uh, typically what we would do is uh, a, we draft some potential language, we would work, or a potential pilot program, we would work with the industry in coming together with some ideas, and then we would uh, likely hold a community meeting, uh, maybe a couple of community meetings, again, depending on the scope, where we would um, present the potential options, potential language, whatever it is that we've drafted, the potential pilot program, to the community, get feedback. Uh, we may also decide to do some, use some other tools, like some online tools, some surveying, things like that, um, and then take that information and incorporate uh, that feedback into what the final uh, proposal is that we would bring forward to council. Yeah, thanks, and I just wanted to respond to Councilmember Matthews. Um, one of the reasons to have these smoking rooms is to divert people from what, what you just pointed out was Pacific Avenue, because I, I, I share your you know hesitance of having people just smoking all over when it's all when it's blatantly illegal, you know, according to the law. So uh, that, that's some of the support that I'm. You know, I want it to be where um, it's uh, legal. I just have um, one additional consideration that, or two actually additional considerations that maybe could be built into what you would explore. Um, one would be to consult with our PD if we're having people consuming and then driving. And then two, um, to uh, understand the impacts of um, uh, ed edibles and then the time framing and such like that. So, um, you know, in terms of delayed impact or whatever. I, I, and I, I just want to say that um, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but really wanted to point out, you know, like public safety, ventilation, and have those so that, um, you know, we allow some flexibility. But absolutely, I think that it's extremely important that even when this pilot process is moving forward, that um, our retailers and whoever you know, receives these permits, that they're working closely with PD to kind of assess how well this is going, what are the impacts. I think that um, types of um, consumption is, is you know, trying to get to that, like, do we want to consider edibles um, or the different types, like dabs, tinctures, all the different considerations so that we understand how to do this in a way that's safe. Councilmember Myers. Yeah, and I guess I would just add to the, to the conversation, I just want to make sure I know a lot of the um, uh, retailers are here today um, that this is a pilot and the, so those capital improvements kind of goes without saying but please make sure that you know as you are seeking investment that this certainly will be a pilot I, I would imagine for a while so uh, I know it's it's really difficult to spend the, the resources to, to develop you know something that's really attractive and hopefully uh, helpful to your business but just caution on that <laughs> thanks okay. All right, if there's no further discussion on the consumption piece, we'll go ahead and uh, take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Okay, that um, passes with uh, Council Member Ma Matthews voting against. Okay, so the next um, topic before us is on the retail license transfer. Retail license transfer. Um, do you mind putting up the options again? Yeah, um, they, for the city clerk, we have it up. Thank oh, you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I, um, just to sort of orient those who are newer to the council on this one, when we moved forward with this originally, the five was never sort of the idea of sort of a stagnant sort of solid only um, kind of concept. It was sort of thinking about, wow, this is coming, how do we respond? Um, what do we wanna do to have some sort of management over it coming forward? I, um, I'll just personally, since I can't make a motion, just sort of share my thoughts on this. I recognize the challenges around um, sort of the ownership piece. I 100% prioritize um, or wanna see and will my values are to stick to local and increasing minority and women owned businesses. And so however uh, we modify or adapt our policy moving forward, those three areas have uh, to take sort of front and center in my opinion, as we know um, that although we wanna have opportunities for business owners to be able to um, sell their business naturally, that there is an industry coming in, there is big business coming in, and we want to maintain um, local local control, local ownership, and support our local community in, in that way. Um, and I 
I do feel what we have here is very similar to a New York City kind of medallion and that they become these really coveted um, licenses. And, and my, my, hope, my hope would be how can we reconcile sort of the, the opportunity for businesses to be able to sell their business if they want, um, us to also ensure that we as a council and a community are really prioritizing local business and increasing minority and women-owned businesses because of the past um, you know, history around the criminalization of, <coughs> of cannabis in um, communities of color and the lack of access sometimes for those populations to engage in the, in the field. Um, and then, um, so I had, let's see, oh, sorry, I'm going back, no, I forgot. So local cell, um, priority for local ownership, not having big business in, and then also to have an opportunity for us to um, in some way kind of manage the space, which we already do in terms of our land use. So my preference would be to modify the, um, I guess it would be the option two here to kind of look at how we're expanding the limit um, using our land use as sort of the driver, similar to how I think the county does it, but then also allowing for um, us to factor in the areas of, um, of priority of local and women and minority owned businesses while also trying to address the issue of transfer and, and business sale. Um, I guess, so that would be my preference. I don't know if thought if there's thought on behalf of the staff on that one, and then we'll see what my colleagues up here um, want to want to say on that. Yeah. Um, I think when we look at the uh, the applications rece received originally, many of them had um, women and or minority members on on the uh, the boards or as part owners. Um, and then sometimes what we found is we had a conflict between whether they were local or whether they were women and minority owned. And so we had a lot of trouble uh, weighing the different factors involved. Um, I think we have came up with a good mix and I would hope that we could continue to come up with a good mix. Um, but it, uh, that's something that we don't have control of, you know, who, who wants to be here um, is an unknown and, and when we get the applications, then we see. And I'll also add, um, while these certainly are not the only three options, um, we had a lot of internal deliberation and really felt that these were probably the three most viable. Um, I think change nothing um, does nothing to really address the needs of the industry. Um, I think that keeping the cap of five but allowing transfers um, doesn't really allow the, it, it creates that artificial value, which, um, <coughs> when the industry would sell, they would the, the holder of that would be the beneficiary and not the city. And so that raises concern for me. Um, so I would say um, from a staff perspective, probably option two would be the best compromise um, because it does remove that artificial inflation of that um, license while also giving the industry an opportunity to be able to sell the business for the business value without tacking on the art artificial inflation of the license. And this way, if we maintain the factors, then we're still able to kind of go through that vetting process for a better term, uh, a lack of a better term, in order to make sure that that we are um, getting the type of local retailers that are really in the best interest of the community and paying a living wage and all of those good things. Great, okay. All right, thank you. Do you have any other thoughts? Councilman Burke Lovers. Thanks, yeah, so I'm just, uh, I just keep hearkening back to the statements made by the representative from Canna Cruz about the impact that certain different variables are having on the businesses <coughs> and the fact that he may lose his home if we don't change some of the uh, some of the stipulations around whether it be the license transfers or not. Um, in Capitola, because that gets consistently referenced with regards to license transfers, has there been any notable transfers in the last two or three years of large value? Uh, they're very new. I don't think they've even allowed, I think it's less than a year that they've been I, there. What's that? 
county has had transfers. For yeah, we'll be very, we, we, this is the time for the staff. Uh, so have there been any transfers within the county that uh, have taken place in the last? My understanding is out of, it's either 11 or 12 that they've had two. Two, and then were those large trans, the large purchases that were to and out of that area? I don't know. Ooh, so that would be, because I mean, if we're looking at president and you know the potential of the inflation or the perception of uh, the cost with regards of the licensing or the where the benefit lies, I would love to see the information about what's been going on in the county and those two transfers because if there's a, a history of large or big business coming in from outside the area and spending millions of dollars to acquire a local business, then that should be troubling for us and direct our, our decision. But if not, and they've only had two small local transfers that have remained locally owned and are still benefiting the community, then it seems if we go with item one in that case and you know, worst case scenario, Cannon Cruz had to sell their business but not lose their house uh, or you know, just trying to find a middle ground so that we're taking care of the, the people that are in the industry, especially those who are there in the beginning and help to form and structure all of these different guidelines and are, are paying into our community heavily. So yeah. we'll figure out ways that we can acknowledge that. I have heard that there has been interest expressed by large um, industry, <coughs> but, but not Philip Morris as much as large um, pharmaceutical, well, cannabis businesses. And actually I heard a, a major Canadian company was looking to, s they were sniffing around. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I It's a reality, it's, it's, but what happens is, is up in the air, yeah. The only thing I think, I guess if I could add and weigh in and then I'll um, go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Brown, is I think it's such a new industry in general and if we are sort of hoping that doesn't happen but we don't have any constraints to make sure it doesn't happen, I think what we'll risk is um, having an opportunity for big business to come in and buy up our little businesses essentially um, and we lose control over how we're able to vet having local ownership, having to prioritize minority and women population. So even though there may not be precedence or may maybe there is and we just don't know, um, I think even um, potentially opening that up as an option allows it to, to be that Can potentially. That really quick? And then, well, let's go ahead and have Councilmember Brown and then we'll go ahead, I'll go right back to you. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you for the uh, staff report and all of the work that you put into trying to sort through um, how to approach this new um, new industry, new set of regulations. Uh, you know, it, what we are doing here for the, um, at ri the risk of stating the obvious is trying to come up with a set of market distortions that, um, uh, <laughs> which I'm okay with. I mean, that, you know, regulated, um, industry regulated markets is, is okay with me, but we are trying to come up with a set of market distortions that best um, kind of help us achieve our goals. And I don't know um, that these do. I'm, I'm persuaded, um, having had many conversations with folks in the industry locally, that this may not be the best way. Because if we are um, saying that we want to support local business, but we are also constraining them so much that they, they may not be able to continue to exist, then there's a problem there. And so I think that um, you know, I'm also persuaded, I don't know all of the details, but having <coughs> looked into this, that what's happening in other um, communities where we ha there are kind of motivated local businesses who are looking for capital um, to be able to expand, to be able to um, continue to keep up with the um, tax burden that we have placed upon them uh, and other things. I, you know, I think that um, at a certain point we just have to, we do have to have some faith that um, our local uh, businesses are going to do their best to maintain those principles. And I think we also have the ability to um, include some uh, requirements that help us ensure that is the case while providing them with the flexibility to be able to um, 
be capitalized at a uh, you know, rate that allows them to pay living wages, um, provide health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, and I think that the motion that has not been read yet, but um, that um, we had, that we received related to um, uh, the change in the transfer, um, removing the prohibition on the transfer of cannabis retail license. And I'm not sure that, in, that exactly gets at it because this is about investment in the business, sale of the business without losing the license. So it's more about the business than the license itself, although the license is clearly a factor. But, um, you know, requiring some kind of annual audit process, which is the second part of the proposed motion I'm looking at here, there it is, um, that would require that um, business, current business owners um, ensure that their investors are um, also going to be in, maintain compliance with those um, criteria and that those preferences that we give would not be compromised. I mean, I think there's a way that we can do, we can try to do that. Um, and it's not gonna be perfect, nothing's gonna be perfect. Um, but I, I'm persuaded at this point that, um, that we are gonna, we're gonna compromise local business if we don't do something. Thank you. Yeah, that was the point I was also going to make in response to that is that if there's less restriction on license transfers outside of the city and then we have a tighter regulation on it and uh, the, the, the impact of taxes and also the kind of cost of living here and all these other kinds of things, it may have the opposite effect and in fact kill our small businesses as opposed to supporting them and protecting them from big business buyouts or just that kind of uh, feeling within the industry in general. So something to be conscious about to be conscious about. So thank you, Councilmember Brown, for bringing that up. I, I guess my thought would be if we release the cap, then you're still providing access for them to be able to sell their business to more people or to increase the ownership of their businesses, but we'll still have some understanding of who that is and having it reflect our priorities around, um, you know, local and minority and women owned. I guess my my hesitation with going this route is if we have years from now, um, most of our businesses owned by large corporations and we haven't made a priority to have equity and to really sort of in a policy way, try to repair past harms and <laughs> to move forward with uh, sort of I think what I don't know, I would say it's probably reflective of a lot of our, our, our values as a community and as a council to making that a priority. If we don't necessarily consider that and they're sold, then, it, then it, in hindsight, it'd be really unfortunate, I think. So I, I think there is a need to reconcile how to sell your business, the ownership, and then the licensing and that process. Again, just sort of reminding those who weren't on the council at the time, the five was just sort of an arbitrary number sort of to sort of ease us into that. So Holding on to that as sort of the end all, sort of that's the, that's the limited amount was never really the intention. I think we originally talked about it going up to seven and then in, and expanding to 10 potentially. So, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, uh, like releasing the, um, the amount or expanding that to a certain percentage makes more sense. If not, you still have these sort of coveted high value licenses, essentially. I don't know if, if staff wants to weigh in given the input that's been received by the council at this point. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any easy answer. Um, if there was, I would have given it to you. <laughs> and I think it is um, that you have it in a nutshell. We have, we have our, the values that Santa Cruz holds near and dear. Um, and then we have the retailers who are hurting now because of, um, you know, the high cost of doing business in this industry. I think in 10 years, it'll be a very different world. You know, the, the federal government is looking into allowing banking for the cannabis industry, and that is gonna make a vast difference. But um, we don't know if, if that's happening, we don't know when it ha is happening, and we don't know the details. Um, so what we do now may keep our local businesses <coughs> afloat until some of these bigger picture items um, get resolved. Um, but again, I, I don't. I don't want to open our local businesses up to the big corporations. But I 
want to help them make it through this time, and I don't have the perfect solution for that. I don't know if I, I saw him on the edge of his seat. I don't know. Hi, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And uh, just you had asked for uh, a response to this, and there was some information here. I think I'd also share that I think with um, if there is no prohibition on the transfer of cannabis retail licenses, then um, establishing that it's a women or minority owned or uh, local uh, proprietor um, would be challenging. There may be some way that we could look into <coughs> There isn't a prohibition on the transfer or, or regulations related to that. That could be a challenging component. And um, to your other point about um, the, the cap, there is a provision in the ordinance that was built in to allow uh, and really facilitate the increase in the number of licenses, and that's uh, allowing it to be done through resolution rather than through ordinance. It was, um, you know, there were there were different levels that were considered and. Uh, the council at the time said, let's make it easy if we want to do that in the future. So that would be an option for you to consider through resolution rather than through uh, a typical ordinance change. If I could just really quickly for a clarifying question. So you're suggesting though, if we re remove the prohibition on the transfer, then we're relinquishing our opportunity to have sort of any kind of control over the minority mm -hmm. or women or locally owned businesses. I, I see that, I mean, obviously we recognize that as a desire of the council and that is something that we could work towards, but if there isn't a prohibition on the transfer, um, then, you know, that annual audit process, if that is transferred to a non-local or to a, um, a, a person who's not a minority or woman owned, uh, or woman, then we could come back in the future and do that audit and say, are you still providing uh, organic products? Are you still meeting the green business uh, or green building and clean energy criteria? Are you still sourcing local products? But um, we wouldn't have that uh, ability necessarily to say, all right, is that going to um, a, a local or women or minority owned? So we could look at something like that. That's just my initial, uh, uh, re reaction to this as a potential concern if if it's important to the council to, to maintain those criteria, then we can look at that. Um, I just, I, I'm not immediately thinking of how we would do that if there isn't a uh, uh, regulation on who we, that transfers to. In terms of the motion four. Now, in terms of uh, option two on the PowerPoint, we could theoretically remove or expand the license limit, but still require the factors. Retain um, the same re retain process. The same process. Um, it just makes, it means somebody could come and get the license, maybe not have a location, and then be able to go and bid on a business. And so, um, that provides a little more certainty on both ends, but the reality is yes, it may increase the number of retailers in competition. And so I think really it's up to the council to decide, you know, where, where are your values? Um, and it, it's not an easy decision, right? It's do we really wanna stick to our guns about some of these factors, understanding that it's challenging right now for the industry, or do you want to maybe relinquish that a little bit and take a chance on potentially some of the big guys coming in for the win of potentially helping the retailers now? I mean, like Catherine said, there's no, there's no easy answer, but it really is about where the council kind of sits on those issues. I guess I have just one follow-up question and then we'll go ahead. Um, but if you were to increase the number, say for example, to 50 or so, then anybody could apply potentially and then be an eligible buyer or kind of be able to kind of be buy into the industry, right? Yeah, and I think here with the remove or expand the license limit, there's a couple of ways that the council could decide to do it. You could do it where you keep the factors you could do it where you remove the factors. Same with the cap of five. You could keep the cap of five where you keep the factors, and the challenge there is that the, the businesses then, when a seller comes in, there's no guarantee that that seller, or when a purchaser comes in, there's no guarantee that that purchaser is going to be able to meet those factors to purchase the business. And so really there's a lot more um, uncertainty and risk in terms of that. Um, or you could do it where you keep the cap of five and then remove the factors, and then anybody could come in, right? And just, you know, purchase the business and then transfer the license. So there's there's, 
areas of flux within each of these that the council could choose. Um, we just put forward the ones that we thought made the most sense. Okay. Okay, I, have, I saw Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember yeah. Matthews. I was just gonna mention that, you know, I think part of this is that um, what we really wanna see happen too is, you know, if we go the route of removing the prohibition on the transfers, that staff work to develop you know, this transfer process and incorporate, you know, a lot of the different factors that were taken into account. Um, my understanding is that, you know, we have these five licenses. Many of these businesses have just started, are just getting started and just getting on board and are really trying to um, use this as an opportunity to seek it out investors to help invest in their, um, their companies so that they can, you know, begin to grow and be stabilized. I don't really see many of these these businesses trying to just, um, you know, they just got their license, now they're gonna sell off the company. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I think what we're really trying to do is provide an opportunity for um, investment in these companies um, so that they're able to stay afloat. Um, I do share the concerns because I really wanna make sure that we are prioritizing women, minority-owned, locally-owned businesses, and I feel that, um, you know, by providing direction, um, you know, using the Capitola, using Capitola as an example, also working with our current criteria that, you know, maybe there's a way that we can come up with something that is, is acceptable by the entire council and, is, and, is, and reflects the values that we share. So I just wanted to um, put that comment, because I, I share the same concerns. I just want to make sure that that's clear. John and then Councilman. Well, Vice Mayor Cummings just made my comment, but I had a question uh, which was a follow-up to um, Director Butler's uh, point about the license transfer. And so I'm just, if, if I could ask the, you the question, because I kind of made it as a statement, but um, trying to just figure out an answer to the question. Um, it, is it possible to develop a license transfer program that, that lifts the, the prohibition, removes the prohibition, but places conditions upon that transfer, I'm, I'm asking, I, I, it doesn't seem impossible to do, so I'm asking you if, how that might work and um, why, why couldn't we just go that route to say you, you can transfer the license but you must meet X, Y, and Z conditions up front in order to get approval for the transfer and then have an audit process. So it's not simply a matter of going back after the fact and saying, oh, by the way, are you still doing this? It's doing what we would do with the business regardless of whether the, li the license is transferred. Can that be done? So we could potentially explore something like that. Mm -hmm. For example, um, you know, we could say, all right, if you came forward and you had a woman and minority owned business as part of your proposal, then you could say, well, it would still have to be uh, purchased by uh, a woman or a minority individual to, to meet those same criteria. Um, so, so that is one way that could potentially be looked at. And I, if I could add on to that, um, I think that's absolutely feasible. Um, instead of, so let's say, I'm just going to make up a scenario here. We have a retailer that wants to sell. Um, instead of taking that license and opening it back up to anybody who wants to apply for it, we could have a, I don't know if this is the right terminology, but you know, kind of a uh, right or first refusal for a buyer that they have brought in who would need to go and vet through that process. My only concern, and I'm not a business owner, but if I were, I think that would, for me, limit the pool of potential. I'd almost have to go find them, as opposed to them pre-qualifying and then coming and finding me, which would be option two. Now, if that's preferable for the industry, I don't, I mean, I, I, I think that's, it's doable. Um, and we would just, you know, have to set up the policy such that if a business owner came to us and said, we wanna sell, here's who would like to purchase it, have them go through that process. It just seems it just seems like maybe it would be it would give them less candidates. But what do I know? I mean, right, just a follow up question, sure, or clarification to my question. I'm not suggesting that it be that it must be a buyer who mirrors the exact mm -hmm. composition of, or you know the exact demographic um, of the previous owner, I'm suggesting within the set of priorities we have established, right? So that was clear, okay. Mm -hmm. And I think um, 
Yes, it might. I mean, I'm guessing it would um, potentially limit um, or, or put the onus more on um, business owners who wish to sell. Um, but it also provides, what I'm hearing from the industry is that what they're looking for not right, right now is not to just sell and walk away. They're looking to get investors at more than 19.9%, which is not a buyout, it's investment. So in that case, um, the ability to meet the criteria, I mean, that would be their responsibility, but it would give them the option, right? So I think I think what I'm hearing, um, and and I've got something that, that may uh, the council may want to consider. Um, I think what I'm hearing is is you're interested in having um, individuals or, or corporations be able to compete for a new license if they're meeting certain criteria or certain, excuse me, if they're uh, adhering to uh, the factors. Um, yet they're still concerned about the um, uh, taking care of the five retailers that we have. Um, so you know, one middle ground that the council may wanna consider could be allowing additional licenses to be issued, but not allowing more than five retailers. And so that would allow for that um, competition to take place and allow for a pool of uh, licenses, but would still only allow for um, those uh, a limit of five actual businesses on the ground, it would just basically create a pool of candidates to buy into those retail businesses. And as long as they're meeting certain factors, then they would be eligible to do that. So just something that came to mind as the debate uh, went uh, went through. But that's, that's sort of what I was gathering is you, you still want the ability for someone not to necessarily mirror those factors of the original applicant, but to be able to still um, have the, the same ability to, in effect, have a license, um, which would allow them to buy into any existing business um, or to purchase that business outright. And can I clarify, but um, I, I think I'm hearing a difference too between ownership interest and business license, mm -hmm. right? So the business license is separate from the ability to buy into a business and you don't have to have a business license to buy into the, the uh, and to buy equity into the business just right now our cap on that equity is that 19.9% or 20%, right? So uh, to me I'm hearing two different issues. It one is sh do we need to increase the ability for equity to be sold, which is something we had talked about in Mar in May. Um, and then there's the separate selling of the entire business and transferring that business license. So I just wanna, it's two different pieces. And I think at, in the May meeting, sorry, um, I just wanted to clarify, in the May meeting, um, and Catherine, you probably recall better than I do, but we did have a discussion about that and I think that the determination by council at that time was to take, to take it to 20%. Right. Um, but if, again, it's the will of the council to change that, then, you know, the time is now. No time like the present. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councilmember Myers and the Councilmember Cronin. I think that, um, well, I'll just comment. I, I think we're, um, we're trying to create a market that's, I mean, this is a brand new world. And so I think, um, I wanna thank the business owners here today. Um, <clears throat> It sounds like what we really need to get done is to stabilize your ability to bring more capital into your business. At, at least initially, that's one of the major obstacles, it sounds like, to stabilizing your businesses. So um, I kind of feel like we're trying to do a little too much um, with some of this in that um, I, I, I share the concern for local businesses and I share the concern for um, avoiding uh, investment from you know, folks outside of our immediate sphere of, of values and uh, benefits that we'd like to see from the company. But I also um, acknowledge the difficulty that um, not being able to go to the bank and get a loan uh, is, is having on these local businesses. So um, I guess I was kind of going where Council Member Brown was going um, in terms of trying to figure out um, and again, I don't wanna keep having the industry keep coming back because we're sort of piecemealing this as it goes. Um, 
So I, I'm moving, I, initially I was interested in, in looking at how do you, how could we broaden the license piece in this so that there is potentially more there in terms of getting people in a pipeline that would be able to help with either investment or purchase, for example, of other businesses. But um, I think what I'm hearing is that um, staying with, with who we have now um, and really working with those businesses to look at um, how these transfer processes may play out along with the audit and the ability to look at, at uh, new people coming in, maybe the kind of the in-between step potentially. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make those comments, um, but I am just curious how we, um, yeah, how we do this. Um, I don't have a proposal right now, but I, I think I'll just stop with those comments for now and, and continue to hear some of the some of the ideas around the dais right now. That's Thanks. Um, I was wondering from the city attorney we, uh, about a transfer tax, possibly uh, that keeping you know another another way of trying to keep it local for longer right. by having us you know a 10 percent or something transfer tax if you sell a significant part of the business what we have to do to bring that about most likely we would have to have that uh, approved by the voters by ballot measure my sense is from thinking about it briefly is that the tax probably wouldn't come into play very often given the number of businesses that we have right. and the likelihood of transfers um, I also wonder as to how that would deter an out of, say, out of the area uh, investor versus a, a local investor. So um, those are just my initial thoughts. And do, or do we have the, um, Catherine, do we have the same criteria for, would we for this outside invest or for an investor if we go beyond the 20% or do we go to, it sounds like we're going the whole 100%. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um, because somebody at the at the mic said 51%. Uh, would we have the same criteria? Could we have, make them a local resident for five years? And um, I I talked to Tony very briefly, um, and he s seems to think that we could. I there are a lot of um, steps in the process that are pretty opaque to me. So I don't wanna assure you that we can do that when I'm not absolutely sure that we can. But we could certainly look into having some process where if they wanted to um, bring on investors that the investors would have to um, comply, either comply with the factors that the original applicant had or um, be able to bring new factors in. Um, that the idea that um, somehow a business could sell <coughs> only 49% and then that would retain local control is in my mind a fallacy because as one of the speakers said, all of these businesses are corporations. So it's not a single person who owns the business and so would retain 51% control. It's a corporation with a number of people, and if you add one person to the board who has 49% and everybody else has, there's five other people who have 10%, that new person now has control. Um, so I think it, a more viable option would be to require any new investors to adhere to the same factors that the original application um, provided. Thanks. Um, and the, the five um, license limit, I think, was good policy at the time that the council did it because we wanted to see how this stuff was playing out and it, it seems to be going fairly well. Uh, and, and so I, I think that there is, you know, that potential to increase as well as to increase, you know, um, well, uh, to lower the tax, you know, on, on the cannabis, and I was just wondering about a transfer tax balancing somehow if we lowered the, um, you know, the, the current rate that we 
charge in tax to on the on the cannabis businesses now and i wonder if we could find some sweeter spot for the retailers another sort of consideration for the limited licensing and one of the issues that i have with kind of keeping it at the five is that although we had it in mind at the time which i think you're right was a good way to sort of slowly move <coughs> into it um was also just to bring legal businesses on on board but if we're sort of limiting it and kind of still also controlling it it also limits our ability to enforce illegal and to also increase more legal if possible so i think for me i think the the fact that we have the limited license is, I'm not sure if I, I, I would say that's probably the best route. Personally, I think having um, our land use designations in place with this uh, criteria and then sort of opening up those who are potentially wanting to come on board with their business or you know collaborate or, or invest in other businesses could be another solution um, and sort of more reflective as well as the enforcement piece of it. Because you know I, I think that's also a component for those that are operating in the black market, um, which are then impacting those who are, are legal businesses. So something to think about. Uh, Council Member Matthews, I believe. Yeah, I want to get some clarity. Um, the motion before us, which will in some way relate to the um, PowerPoint here, um, is to remove the prohibition on the transfer of cannabis retail licenses and develop a full license transfer process. And then it refers to Capitola. Um, I think, um, Sarah, maybe you brought up the difference between an ownership interest, which is equity, and the license. Am I understanding that correctly? And um, well, I, I guess I'll leave it there. Yes. Will you clarify that? Yes, and Catherine, please jump in at any point. But um, the business license is not tied to the amount of equity that is owned by the business itself. The license is the ability to operate that specific kind of business. And in order to get that license, you have to meet a, a certain number of factors or sh demonstrate that you meet at least, you know, some of them. There was, I wasn't here for that, um, the vetting process, but, you know, there, there was a ranking of applications right. that right. came in and those who were, did the best job of meeting the factors were the ones who were awarded the licenses. That's a different process than when the people who now have that uh, license and are operating that business want to bring in capital because they can't through traditional banking methods, they wanna bring on another partner. And um, previously before April, we had um, a certain threshold of, of how much, 10%. it was 10% um, that a cannabis business could sell or equity they could sell. And at that April meeting, it was increased to 20 by this council, 20%. Um, but again, that is something different than the procurement of the license. Right. I guess my thoughts here are, um, I, I favor the ability to bring in a, a greater degree of ownership um, investment. Um, I am, uh, to me, the kind of criteria that we have now um, don't honestly make a lot of sense. There's some criteria about being woman-owned, minority, and local, um, which are admirable and apparently gave a framework for analyzing the initial applications. Um, it's not clear in what I'm reading, do you need all of the above, some of the above, a preponderance of the above, which ones are most important, et cetera. You don't have to answer that, but anyway, it's confusing. Um, and I would think other issues that are important when looking for a partner would be, um, you know, their um, track record, their, anyway, other, I would just say business related factors in addition to those. But aside from <coughs> the criteria like gender, woman-owned, minority, et cetera, are um, the community benefits. And those are, those are referred to in the second part here somewhat, although vaguely, um, criteria centered around community health and safety. I mean, I think that's something that could be built into the operating um, conditions for any business um, that would have more flexibility. Um, and I know that you speak, but I'll just... <laughs> Just say one more thing. Um, um, shoot. Well, I, it'll have to come back to me. 
<laughs> you interrupted my train of thought. Sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll interrupt you. Okay, vice, vice coming. Uh, I just want this, you know, the, the second bullet point. One of the, the things that was brought up was that we have um, the cannabis retailers fill out these applications stating, you know, what are the benefits they're going to provide for our community, but there's no follow up, yeah. right? So you can state that when you first receive, you can state that in your application, receive your license, and then begin operating. But then if there's no follow up, there's no way for the city to know if you're actually complying with what you said you were intending to. And so that's kind of the um, purpose behind having this and de developing an audit process to make sure that businesses are actually, you know, paying living wages to their employees, they're actually providing some benefits to the community. And so um, that's kind of the, the essence behind the audit process. I am also, um, you know, thinking a little bit more about the 20% investment because um, it seems like that's like the biggest thing right now to getting the cannabis industry off the ground is allowing for people, more people to come in and invest. It doesn't appear to me that people at this moment in time want to sell their businesses and their business licenses. Now, maybe in 10 years from now, that could be the case. But it seems to me that what is most important is trying to help get the businesses off the ground and allow them to be competitive. So um, I'm happy to explore that if we don't want to go down the route of um, changing business licenses. Because it sounds like a lot of folks are concerned with um, developing this license transfer process. I think I think what if I and I I kind of I'll just I'll, maybe I'll just sort of share I think there's a lot of questions about what the best next step is with this in terms of reconciling I think some of the nuances of it I think you know knowing you don't have to be completely rigid on the factors but trying to ensure some kind of lens on how we're knowing who's in town and operating our businesses um, to the best of our ability and then how helping those that are currently um, here trying to increase their investors and what kind of areas we have around that. And then for me, I think just also uh, the artificial kind of um, market we've created by having these sort of high coveted five licenses and whether or not, for me, I, I'm not sure if that's the best method. If, if by land use, we could essentially meet the same <laughs> kind of intention around um, limited business um, sort of density and, and, and kind of overall kind of you know, market uh, control. Then, then I'm not sure if I understand why that needs to still be in place per se. Um, and, and how do you, you reconcile that if you're removing the transferring kind of thing with the limited licenses? So I think there's a lot of areas where I feel I'd like to know more. I don't know what the, con the capital license transfer process is. So for me, I, that doesn't, I don't know what that means. Um, um, and they, they came after ours. So I'd like to learn more about other ty types of transfer processes before I, I move forward with removing any kind of prohibition on transfer personally. Councilmember Matthews, did you remember, remember my what you were going to say? There you go. <laughs> and that was, I mean, we're going to an extraordinary length here to um, almost micromanage a fledgling industry that we would never do, for example, a bakery or a craft brewery or um, a startup tech or something like sure. that. I mean, we're just piling on all these expectations for businesses that are actually starting up. And so I would prefer to simplify and, you know, I'm just, just quickly looking down the five items that we have here. I'm going to just depart, you know, the consumption lounges. Well, it wasn't a priority for me, but that passed. It'll get put in the queue. Um, requested amendments to the license ordinance to allow the transfer of cannabis retail licenses. But that's not the same as the expanding ownership, which is the thing that's really, I think, most obviously before us. So that's really what needs to be added. Maybe it needs to be continued. Expanding the hours, sure, go for that. Uh, I'm not keen on cannabis events. We'll see where the vote goes on that. And yes, let's introduce the ordinance. So that's kind of where I fall down on that package of things. I think we're just way overthinking the details. Okay. So do you want to make a, a mo do you want to return to your original motion for this particular uh, component of the recommendation? Or do you want to make a motion in regards to some of the other areas where we might already have of council alignment. I'd be happy to make a motion on um, items, staff items three and five, which is expanding the hours from nine to 10. And then um, the ordinance revising requirements for a new cannabis retail license when there's a change in proprietor to exclude a change in manager. So if there's a change in manager, that doesn't mean that it has to, they have to have yeah, a change in license. That. Okay. Yeah. 
So do we want any further discussion on that component of it? Yeah, I just seeing the Reefside people are shaking their head no. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what their argument was. Do you do you get that one, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings? I, don't, I, don't I understand know. from reading the ordinances that um, the language that was in in um, this item was that uh, it would change it so that if you ch if you change managers, so if you have a turnover in managers, currently um, those are considered proprietors, right? And if you change a proprietor, you have to you have to amend your license. This would allow for a manager who's someone who owns, my understanding is 20% or less of the company to, if they change, if a manager decides to move on, then they can bring on or hire another manager and they don't have to change the license. That's my understanding when I read it, yeah. so. I think the issue that the Reefside people have is that they want that change to be significantly more substantial and it would tie in with the um, allowing investment. So um, in hearing the comments that came from the public, I think uh, a, a quick um, addition that we discussed was um, in addition to excluding the uh, manager, um, they could also include uh, an exception that um, a member of the board of director, directors of a nonprofit sure. with less than 20% ownership could also change as well as an officer or director of a cannabis retail business um, that is not or organized as a corporation with less than a 20% ownership interest could also be included in that exclusion to allow for board members on say WAM to move back and forth without that triggering uh, license transfer. So I think those two would um, both be uh, supportable by staff to help address uh, some of the concerns raised from the public. Okay, that makes sense to me. Councilmember Matthews. In which case I seconded your motion, but that would actually be bringing back a revision of this proposed Ordinance. change with. We could read the language in so that you understand specifically what it is so that that would still remain the first reading. The first reading. Okay. You agree? Yeah, okay. Okay, Okay. that sounds good. All those in favor on, um, do you want to rewrite it? I need a second. So the second was Councilmember Matthews. Motion by Vice Mayor Cummings to essentially move um, hours, with yeah. the hours to go up to 10 p.m. as well as to incorporate what our planning director um, described in terms of the ordinance language. Do you want to restate that or do you want to restate yours? Is it the introduce for publication an ordinance revising the requirement for a new cannabis retailer license, that part? Exclude a manager or right. a board member with less than 20% ownership. Exclude a change in manager. But right, so um, I can read it in. So in uh, 6.91.120, <coughs> license non-transferable, um, there is the change which says, however, uh, provided however, that the change of a non-member on-site manager with less than a 20% ownership interest in a cannabis retail business shall not be considered a change in proprietorship for the purposes of this prohibition, nor shall a change in a member of the board of directors of a nonprofit with less than a 20% ownership interest, nor shall an officer or director of a cannabis retail business that is organized as a corporation with less than a 20% ownership interest. So including all three of those in with the exclusions um, that are included in 6.91.120. A question or a comment like the, I just said a clarification my understanding from one of the speakers um, one of the public speakers was that this language isn't consistent with what the state definitions are can is that is that the language the language is consistent but the state's intent is different the state has no limit on the number of licenses so they're not When they look at transfers, they're not, they're, they're not, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the, the speakers, what the speaker was saying is that the state's intent with this definition was to look broadly at anybody who was involved in the business and that the city's intent or the city's use of it being that broad, um, doesn't make sense. So at the time that we changed it, 
we were uh, trying to be consistent with the state in their definition of proprietor, and it had a lot to do with increasing the uh, amount that could be transferred of 20% from the 10%. Um, but by opening up this to this broad definition, we got another kettle, another can of worms. <laughs> Yes, my understanding is the state, the, the intent of the state regulation is to ensure that the state identifies <coughs> who the proprietors are. And so a significant change in a member of the board of directors or an operator or manager is reported to the state so for purposes of identification, but it's not, but the state doesn't restrict the transferability and so therefore while the definitions are same, they're used in completely different ways in our ordinance versus in the state law. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we, okay thank you for that. Okay, are we clear on the motion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those components passed unanimously. So we still have the areas of? Temporary events. Temporary events. License transfer. And then the license transfer question. Okay, so where would we like to start? <laughs> I, I mean, I think I'm going to whatever clear. slide you'd like. <laughs> yeah, the license transfer thing to me, I just, you know, I, I think, you know, I guess I just, I'm hesitant with the five being these sort of coveted licenses that then you could transfer. That does feel like it could go into the business sort of sales thing without any kind of language around that that's very specific. So I don't have enough kind of, I don't feel comfortable with that this time. Um, I also, I also would just sort of say, like, I guess if we think in terms of the foresight, if we have, you know, a uh, contract, say, for example, with jump bikes, and we're expecting jump bikes, and then jump bikes gets bought out of Uber, by Uber, right? Now, we don't really have any control over that at this point, but I think we're at a place where we do have a little bit of control over the future in that way, and so that's sort of just the overall intention that I'm trying to express, given the kind of the newness of this industry, essentially. Um, so with that, uh, Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, well, I don't want to rehash the debate, but I, I it, um, Mayor Watkins, your your point leads me to just want to re-emphasize the point I was making. Yeah, we um, we didn't have control when Uber bought Jump, um, but we could have had we had um, something, you know, some provisions in a contract, right? So <coughs> I'm just suggesting that that is a way to address that concern. Um, and so, um, you know, that, I guess that's why I was trying to move towards the idea of having conditions on. And uh, I, I appreciate, you know, I'm actually, I, than, I like that idea. Okay. We can talk so, about that. So I just wanted yeah. to, to kind of reiterate that. Thing. Okay. So maybe, I mean, just if in the interest of trying to move this forward, maybe that's the direction to go that there's some, I don't know if you want to really restate that, but I, I see where you're coming from in that regard. Or propose so, that well, as a motion. I guess um, because I don't know what the capital license mm -hmm. pro transfer right. process is. If that, if what I'm saying is in that, in there, then no, I, no. Mm -mm. Okay, so um, maybe would the has the motion been made? I don't even know if the motion's been made. <laughs> um, it's gonna, um, uh, maybe before you make the motion, yeah. may I just offer a suggestion? Maybe it could be to have staff come back with a potential recommendation to incorporate mm -hmm. these considerations before right. we move with like some sort of yeah. specific thing. Okay, go right ahead. If that, if that, I mean, just to sort of preface it as not like we're gonna just move this direction, maybe have them come back with some further information given this is the direction we wanna go. So, well, I can make a motion give it a shot, which just, it's basic. So um, would the provider of the motion? That's you. I haven't made a motion. So. I know, but the provider of the motion that we're looking at here, um, if, if I could. Um, okay, so then I would make a motion to um, direct staff to return to the council um, with a recommendation to address the transfer of cannabis retail licenses, um, address um, and develop a full license transfer process, um, or recommendations for developing a license transfer process consist, I'm gonna say 
consistent with the Capitola license transfer process and um, other possible conditions for license transfer. Can I? And um, recommendations for um, the potential um, business ownership transfer or business investment and ownership transfer. So it's kind of broader than this, but it would give us an opportunity to sort through where we're at on those. I mean, we're, we're kind of talking about them all here rather than just saying, here, can you give us the options rather than coming up with them on the spot here in this space and then we can so. decide how we want to proceed to that, <coughs> the you know, addressing the challenge that we've heard. I think I kind of get the gist of what your motion is. I, th I think it would be helpful to clarify it. Um, so I'll make an effort to do that. Okay. Bearing in mind that when we talk about removing the prohibition on transfers, we're really, we're talking in, in two different ways on this in terms of bringing on investors and the way we've defined ownership or proprietorship in our code, the process of bringing on new investors um, can constitute a transfer of ownership as we've defined it. So I think in essence what the council is looking for is uh, um, a recommendation for an amendment to the ordinance to permit transferability of a business license uh, in which the transferee is evaluated based on the same criteria upon which the initial licensee was evaluated. Something along those lines. That was exactly what I was thinking. That was exactly yeah. what I was thinking yeah. and you just said it. <laughs> so, okay, did you second that? Yeah. Okay, so so I, I, I was thinking the exact same thing, that <coughs> instead of sort of having the Capitola information, it would just be consistent with our license application process, essentially, right? Because that sort of, that kind of covers that. It's independent right. of that. So then for purposes of the proprietor, you know, the existing businesses that are that are listening to the discussion, um, what they would essentially do is bring an investor to the city in an application for a license transfer plot process that lays out the new, um, the new structure of the organization to be evaluated in accordance with the same criteria in which the initial application was evaluated. Right. Okay, that makes that makes sense mm -hmm. to me. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Well, devil's in the details. There, is it all of the above, or yeah, sure. <laughs> sixty percent, or what? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's where our staff can do what they I, did. I, I hope it can get simpler. We all do. And the language <laughs> is very confusing because bringing in an investor, for <laughs> the casual listener, doesn't sound like a transfer of the license. So maybe there's some definition changes. I know it's not, but, and yet it is, you know, so mm -hmm. it sounds like some wholesale cleanup. Yeah. I think, and at a future time, I think maybe we could revisit the conversation around how we're designing it with the five only and kind of the industry and then the enforcement component. I don't know what that even looks like for our city to be quite honest with you. So maybe that's a future conversation. But for, for where we are now, I think we're at a place that I think we can hopefully move forward as a council. <laughs> Brown and then Council Member Matthews. If, if I Council could, Member. in the motion as stated by Tony, <laughs> Mr. Kandati, um, include. Uh, Which I remain strictly neutral on, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, that this come back to us by um, would it be possible to get this at our second meeting in October? I'm not Is sure. Information about it? It's. Mm. I think given the current workload, you, would the Council would need to pri reprioritize. Um, either the cash work or the um, downtown plan work. So hopefully some, and then, and then as soon as. Uh, my, asking, uh, my, my goal was to have it come back at the same time as the, as the other item from earlier. 
unless I end up with more resources on my team. I mean, we are um, potentially uh, going to be having some part-time help come on, um, but I, that's not confirmed yet. Um, obviously, if we do do that, I will do everything I can to expedite this, but I just want to be really candid about the resources. Um, potentially, it could, uh, we could do it early next year, but again, then we would have questions about um, the local coastal program, which is, and plan, which is also time sensitive and, um, finishing out the cash work, finishing out the downtown plan work. So um, I'm just trying to be very candid and transparent with you in terms of resources. I, um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, again, this is a question of how much, if we're, if the goal is clear, if how much work it will be. Not that it's, it's one more thing, but it's, it's one more thing that is, I mean, what percent, like how many hours of this one thing versus, I mean, the local coastal plan is a big sure. one thing, right? Yeah. So I guess I'm just trying to. Well, it, all, it does depend on the scope because it sounds to me from the motion that it really, um, we're talking about potentially kind of doing a lot of cleanup. And if we're going to be looking at best practices in other jurisdictions and coming up with an entire process that we're vetting with the business community, uh, it's it's time consuming. I mean, it's not something that could be turned around and what are, we're, I mean, staff, the staff report for the upcoming meeting was due yesterday, right? So, I mean. Two weeks. It, it's not enough time. Yeah, and so uh, to be very realistic, I just don't see anything coming back before the beginning of the new year. And that's with us really um, shuffling some of Catherine's time on some of these other things. I mean, the cash wants to meet once a week, the subcommittee. So, I mean, there, there's just a lot of, and again, I am. I, I, this is also very, very important. It's just about prioritization from council. Thank you for your, at, at Council Member Conan and Council Member Myers, and then maybe we can. Would you, would you take as a friendly amendment that we could explore um, a license transfer tax and, um, and, and, and what other cities are doing, if there's any other cities who have done this? And um, if we put it before the voters, could it, um, uh, could future city contracts be included, like that when Uber bought Jump and we didn't get anything out of that? I mean, can we look at other contracts as well? And could, if it went to a vote <laughs> of the, uh, to the voters, could a lot, could all city contracts like that be included that we make deals? Maybe that's something the revenue committee could. I, I was just going to say that I'm a little nervous about providing that broader direction to staff here because it's not agendized to do that. But I, I think. To, I would add, I mean, I'd be happy to add, uh, direct the revenue subcommittee to take up the potential for uh, license transfer tax, business license transfer tax. And, okay, does that, and we'll get, and that, and through that process, it'll, yeah. That sounds good to me. Okay. Council Member Myers, and then maybe we could take the vote on this. Yeah, I think there was, was there a second? Really? There was a second, uh, second Council Member Glover. Can Thank we, you. can can it get read again, the motion? <laughs> um, go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Mr. Condotti, will you read the motion? Oh, we got, we got Lee uh, standing up here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find it here. Um, yeah. An ordinance amendment to permit transferability in which the transferee is evaluated along the same <coughs> criteria through which the original licensee was evaluated. Yeah. And I just want to clarify, this is, are we talking 100% transfer? I know that's more of an ownership question, but just wanting to make sure. Not, not necessarily. It would be would, subject to the council's discretion. Okay. And would just you, to clarify, I understood it as business license transfer. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, can I make a cannabis correction license. here? It's a right. cannibal, cannabis retailer license. Right. It's not a business license. Right. But again, this is different than a transfer of ownership interest, right? right? It's the retail license. Yes, as opposed to 20%, 40%, 60% of the business being transferred. It's the transfer of the actual cannabis business license. Okay. The five, there's only right. five. Okay. Councilmember Thanks, and just in that re reiteration of the motion, I just wanted to make sure that the amendment that was just added was included in there with the um, directing of the Revenue Subcommittee to look at potential transfer taxes and all that kind of stuff, just to make sure it's in the record. Okay. 
I want to read. If I could, um, because I, so the, I guess the reason that I was trying to broaden the direction was related to the question of um, buying in. So now we're, we're kind of, I think we're reeling it back in and get, it sounds to me like um, the only goal is to give the opportunity for current business owners to relinquish their license. And that is not what I'm intending. Okay. Under our current ordinance, if you transfer if you take on a new partner of some sort who has more than 20% interest, then you need a new retailer license. So I believe that this would cover that because that would be included in the license transfer. Then the license transfer would um, apply to the new business structure, as, as Tony said. So that, so that taking on a new it's com it's combined. capital partner would be included as a license transfer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think we're there. Maybe. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? <coughs> okay. That passes you. But we're not done. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> one more. We have one more on this one, and that is the uh, temporary events conversation. Um. Will you move us back to what uh, that had? Here we are. City Clerk, we're ready for the, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Um, in terms of the temporary events, I guess, do we want, maybe we could just go through the questions. Okay, can we I think the that? question is, we've dumped a lot on their plate. Is this a priority? It's not for me. I mean, let's. I think, you know, I think we could, I mean, we can give direction. I don't know in terms of timeline. I mean, obviously, I mean, we have a lot on our planning department and we have big planning needs, and especially as it relates to housing and a lot of stuff that is really big. I, I, I mean, to, to your point, I, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Give them, we can kind of give them a sense of where we're at with this. And I guess to my mind, if it's not something that's fairly significant and we expect a reasonably Significant, uh, reasonably near-term report back. Let's just table it, for lack of a better term. Come back to it at another time. But um, you know, we're, if we just say we want you to work on this, but mm, could be two years, it's really not giving direction. It's just piling stuff on the work. <coughs> I think, from our perspective, to know if it's something that we should even have on our radar right. to potentially investigate would be helpful um, in terms of when that's done. Um, you know, if it's not a priority for council, we can table it. But to know, and I think probably some certainty for the industry if it's something that the council might even entertain would at least, at the very least, be helpful. Um, maybe not an action uh, item, but the understanding of if it's something of interest. I mean, I'll guess I'll just basically weigh in and then we can see where we want to go in terms of the prioritization. I mean, I don't have a problem with exploring what a cannabis event could look like here, but I do think we need to understand what those can, kind of considerations are, how they've looked in other jurisdictions. And if it's major and requires major kind of time, then, you know, clearly we have other things that we need to have you focusing on. Um, but if, if you do, are able to understand what that could look like in a limited sort of fashion, I guess I would say. I, I mean, I'm fine with having you explore that as step, potentially. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm happy to, I mean, because I think that, um, you know, we, this is a new industry, and even if it were, you know, a convention around cannabis that were to come to town, like, that will attract, you know, a lot of people. So if we think about from an economics perspective around our tourism industry, um, cannabis is something that is, you know, popping up now and attracts people. And so I think that, you know, it's, I think that it's something definitely worth exploring, especially if we want to think about how we're going to bring more people into our downtown and into um, our business community and how we can better embrace cannabis within our uh, cannabis industry currently kind of trying to get its feet, you know, into Santa Cruz. And so I'm happy to make a motion um, just kind of providing some suggestions around temporary events, um, if that's you know, just so, so we can provide some direction, then we can revisit the timeline around it as well, so. Uh, Councilmember Glover? Thank you, yeah, I think even if we don't take action on it, I can, with 
direct direction right now and more exploratory stuff, I think it is something that's important and should be, you know, uh, put somewhere up there because we have tequila and taco festivals and we have all these things where people go and they drink copious amounts in our public spaces and alcohol has been proven to be much more dangerous uh, when consumed than alcohol as well as uh, people exhibit much more violent tendencies when they consume alcohol as opposed to cannabis. Uh, and also that working to destigmatize cannabis in our community so that people can become more used to its existence and use uh, as it becomes more and more mainstream and legal. So. I, I share the vice mayor's perspective uh, with regards to figuring out a way that we can move forward on it, taking into consideration the other things that we have to work on, but at the same time uh, acknowledging that it's important that we start to address this in addition to the economic benefits, because I do believe that if we had a uh, an amazing expo here focused around cannabis to bring people into Santa Cruz, we, I mean, before it was legal, that's something that we were known for in the community, in the in the world anyway. So, uh, might as well use that to bring in tax dollars. Councilman Cohen, did anyone second the uh, motion? There was not a. Oh. There's not a motion. Oh, I, I thought it was okay. Sorry. Okay. Through the mayor, if I may. Um, I would ideally like to bring this back at the same time as we bring mm -hmm. the other things. That may be already as a part of your motion, but at least just a little kind of best practices, research, and recommendation, if that's what you end up proposing. That's, that's, uh, that was sort of the direction I would propose. So if somebody wants to make that into a motion. Okay, Vice Mayor. Um, I'll direct staff to bring back recommendations to amend the city's municipal code to allow for temporary events with cannabis sales and um, on-site consumption, identify locations for permitting events, and create a temporary event permit process for permits to only be issued to businesses that have a cannabis retail license in the city of Santa Cruz. Second. Okay, okay so that'll be built into them. Okay, and then the only, okay, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by um, Council Member Glover. The only thing I would think about is some of the, similar to the kind of the taco is some tequila, like some of the safety constraints and if it's on site consumption, what does that mean in terms of people getting in their cars and driving over 17 or something like that? Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. <coughs> and then I have um, the attention of uh, Council Member Myers for another component. That I think we lost one, one thread in, in this work. Um, and I guess my overall comment too is, I think each time we, we batch all of this, it, it's, it's really complicated. So I, I really hope that our planning department and the industry can really start to break these pieces apart. I appreciate everyone's you know, work on all sides, but it's incredibly difficult. And um, I know we're sort of making this as we go. So I appreciate your work and I appreciate um, the industry's patience as we sort of try to figure this out. But um, I think we lost one important part in all of this. So I would like to make a motion to direct our finance department and city manager to initiate the regional tax discussion with the county and local cities. Uh, I don't believe we, okay. I think we lost track of that. That was the motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by um, Councilmember Crone. That was, yeah, I think you're right. That was something that was lost, definitely something that we wanted and shared. So thank you for affirming that. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So I think maybe we'll have like a five minute break and then we'll go into the next one, which I know is our planning department also. <laughs> It was too much in one it's item. It's too much. I mean, if... I mean, we decided last night, so I would assume she said it too. Ready? <laughs> All right. So we're going to go ahead and come back to our uh, meeting. And um, I realize I'm a few minutes behind it this time, but um, we postponed a um, opportunity for us to have the mayor's proclamation um, discussed or read or presented to the community regarding um, the uh, support for global, global youth climate action strike. So I do have a uh, proclamation here that I'll just read a few of the whereases are, and then we'll move forward with um, sharing that with any students <coughs> who, want to, who want to take a peek at it. Um, but um, it's really obviously very timely and, and incredibly important. 
important. So whereas human created climate change is the largest single threat to the existence of Santa Cruz and the world as a whole has ever faced by humanity. And whereas the youth of today that will suffer disproportionately for the fossil fuel use that is taking place at the present time. And whereas when the young people of Santa Cruz do stand up and demand action, we appreciate them and we support their initiative. Now therefore I, Martine Watkins, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 20th through 27th, 2019 as Youth Global Climate Action Strike Days in the city of Santa Cruz. And I encourage all residents of all ages to support our youth in taking an action to stop global warning. So good luck, go forth and thank you. One student has been involved. There's a student that's been involved here. Would you like to receive this mayor's proclamation? I'd be happy to give it to you. Okay. So that brings us back to our next agenda item, and that is item number 16 on our general uh, meeting uh, business. And that is the <coughs> monthly update on the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort for the city's corridor. And we have Sarah back with us. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I figured I'd just give my presentation from here, if that's okay. Um, so at the... Um, August 27th City Council meeting, a motion carried uh, for the termination of the corridors plan and direction uh, for staff to move forward with uh, meeting with the community to um, discuss the former plan and to seek agreement on possible changes to the general plan and zoning ordinance. And um, so I wanted, and then also there was a request that we come back um, monthly and provide an update. So this is our monthly update for September. Um, so I wanted to let you know that uh, we have reviewed the City Council and Planning Commission meeting minutes from, from the past to identify individuals who had previously commented. Um, neither Sarah Noisy, who will be the project manager on this, Hi, <laughs> myself nor Lee were here for that part of the, for the, the corridors process originally. So we did need to do some due diligence and digging through the previous files and um, correspondence to identify who some of those individuals were. And um, based on that, we have set up a meeting for October 2nd and we have invited uh, representatives from the Corridor Advisory Committee. We've invited the chair and the vice chair. Um, we've asked Save Santa Cruz to send up to six individuals, um, Affordable Housing Now to send an individual, um, representatives from the development community. So we have invited an affordable housing developer as well as a market rate housing developer that, who had been invi involved in the process previously, as well as a representative from Santa Cruz, Yes in My Backyard or Yembe, and a representative from COPA, which is the, I have the acronym here, Communities Organized for Relational Power in Action. So as of now, um, that is the invite list uh, that said again since uh, none, none of the members of our team were here if there were any unintended omissions from that group we would love to hear from the council on that and would be happy to invite people or have a second meeting depending on how many uh, people there may or may not be so with that that is our update um, we are planning to come back on the 22nd uh, as requested in the motion with a further update on the outcome of that meeting as well as um, any state laws that may impact our ability to um, you know, move forward with this effort and we'll know more about that at that time. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions from the council, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I guess, in, uh, my, so thank you for the update. And in terms of the, the meeting on October 2nd, I guess I have a, a question about 
the kind of the format and, and structure for that meeting because looking at the list, um, which, you know, I, I understand the composition. I would add, if, if, depending on where other council members are at, uh, perhaps an invitation to the Branson 40 Action Committee. Um, there's some overlap there with Save Santa Cruz, but there may be, they may want to send somebody. Sure, so if I could respond to that. Um, we did some digging, and um, we were under, of the understanding that the BAC had been blended with Santa Cruz, uh, sure. Save Santa Cruz, and um, if that's not the case, uh, that that's great, and we would, are more than happy to have them come there. Um, I think the question is who that contact would be, because there's not a name on their website, and from the files that we've looked through, we haven't seen um, any names of anybody who's identified themselves with that group, um, and with us having not been here for that process, um, we would it would be very helpful if you could let us know who would be great to contact. I, I can send you an email contact and then you can just see if they're Fabulous. already covered through Safe Santa Cruz, I, which is totally possible. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure that they were aware. Great. Um, but the, so the question then that I had was about the um, kind of the format for the meeting, and what, your, what the plan is, um, just to get a sense of what, you know, what, the, what your goal is. I'm hoping that it kind of, is moving forward the goal stated in the original motion to yes. try to bring um, the general plan and zoning ordinance to alignment. Yes, so I believe, so we're still putting together the agenda now, um, but really I believe what we want the first meeting to be is really a lot of listening. We weren't here for that process, and so we really want to hear from the individuals invited what, how they feel the process went, where they feel the process is. Well, obviously we know through the motion, you know, where council has directed us to go, but in terms of what they'd like to see for next steps, what the good points were, what the bad points were, we really just wanna be able to listen and then go from there in terms of starting to move forward with the direction in the, in the motion with that reconciliation. But really I think listening is gonna be the most important thing uh, most initially for this meeting. Um, okay, so I guess I, if I could just make another uh, follow-up <coughs> comment. Um, so I w totally appreciate that uh, that goal, um, but I do I do hope that the um, the discussion there is some structure provided to help get move towards people's perspectives on how to best achieve the stated council objectives, um, which I think were pretty clear in the, um, the motion that was made, that I made, um, about um, res you know, resolving existing inconsistencies and um, the objectives being to preserve and protect neighborhood areas, existing city businesses, um, but also to encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities. That is my primary interest in um, being involved in um, this and other uh, council policy activities around housing is um, enhancing affordable housing opportunities. So I hope that <coughs> this, the meeting will be uh, structured in a way to get that, um, in, you know, get get the uh, participants talking about those objectives rather than bringing in what they like or didn't like about the corridors and kind of having a, uh, a rehash of that. Sure, so we can definitely make sure that we incorporate um, that conversation into the meeting. Um, I, we just want to make sure that our team is really clear on, on where everything came from in order to be able to start moving forward from a fresh spot. Um, so I think probably what would make the most sense is if we have maybe the first half of the meeting, a series of questions um, potentially about what had happened, and then the second half of the meeting, a series of conversation points about what that particular group thinks might be beneficial to move forward. Does that sound like something that would be uh, suitable in your uh, Well, I mean, I'll leave it to the participants in the conversation okay. to, to figure out how to steer that. But I just want to be clear that, um, particularly given the time constraints that uh, you are under and the, the, the workload, mm -hmm. that these meetings be productive in achieving the objective. I appreciate that, yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. All right. 
Councilmember uh, Clifford. Thank you, yeah. Um, so uh, there was some concern from community members that live in the east side that um, were unable to go to some different corridor meetings because of life or s open houses for school or the variety of things. Will this meeting be open to the public to attend and then provide their input for the group to take into consideration or is that planned into the steps sometime somewhere in the... I would say, so this meeting will not be open to the public. I think this initial conversation, it's. Um, makes more sense to, to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of candid ability to speak organically. Um, I think what I would recommend then is when we come back and let the council know how that meeting went, we would be looking for direction from council on next steps. And I very much expect this to be a very robust community conversation moving forward where there'll be plenty of opportunity for input from many, many different groups. And so while maybe this meeting um, isn't the best suited to be public, this is will be a very transparent process moving forward. Great. Um, there was something that Councilmember Brown that you mentioned um, about not wanting to go back and rehash the existing corridors plan, but uh, and, uh, so I'm kind of torn in that res respect because I know when we were here last time and we talked about it and we were hoping for a November 2020 kind of return or is that was the timeline that you were hoping and they said that that was unfeasible or you know um, impossible. I'm really interested in uh, expediting affordable housing development as quickly as possible. So the question then is, will it take longer if? Like, what was the drawback that you were seeing to spending time talking about the existing plan and what those that felt their voices, who, who felt their voices were not included, if they, if they take those considerations and work them into the plan, as opposed to starting over from scratch again, which could take a long time? Oh, yeah, I know, I, sorry, if I could. Um, yeah, ahead. just to clarify, I, I'm not suggesting um, the, that, the conversation not include, you know, what is to preclude that from happening. I'm just suggesting it, that rather than spending a lot of time debating and trying to persuade each other, yes, you know, to the old plan as it was, no. I mean, I just, I'd, I'd prefer to see that more productive conversation before it about well, how do we achieve these objectives um, that the council has given us. Councilmember Myers, Councilmember <coughs> Matthews, and then I have a question as well. Um, I just have a question you mentioned briefly about new state law. Um, and so I guess my question around that, uh, in terms of how, I mean, we're, we're operating in a different world than we were three years ago, basically. Um, there's been significant housing legislation that's come down in the last three years. So uh, will you be informing these groups of that so that that context is available. Um, I'm just curious, how do we, you know, I, kind of, how do you kind of see that conversation going? Yes, so um, depending on what we know um, about what the governor either has or hasn't signed or vetoed or where things are by the time we have this meeting, um, if there is solid information that we can share, we will absolutely do that. That said, um, I, I tend to be a little conservative when it comes to these things and wait till either the signature is on the paper or the deadline has passed for the signature to be on the paper, either for or against. Um, this year's legislative cycle has been extended till October 13th, oh, okay. where typically it's over at the end of September. Yeah. So we may or may not have an answer, particularly on SB 330. Um, at that time, it is on the governor's desk, so it has gone through all the processes, it's been engrossed and enrolled, and it is awaiting signature veto or nothing. So it, again, if we have that information, we'll absolutely share it with the group, um, if not, if you know, we, we can discuss the potential ramifications. I just don't know if at that point it makes most sense to spend our time having that conversation uh, if we don't have the facts, right? So, um, but we will know when we come back in October in terms of uh, where that bill sits and we'll absolutely, that will be a part of the conversation moving forward. Okay, yeah, I hadn't realized that the, uh, the signature period had been extended, so. Yes, I okay. don't know why, but it was yeah. this year. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Sure. Councilmember Matthews, and then I have a quick question. Then Councilmember, I'm going to work backwards. I want to play off that because that's really of interest to me. Um, <coughs> all the recent housing-related legislation, and um, I just throw it out. It might be worth a little bit of an extended um, information session at a general council meeting, just like everything that's new 
that's, you know, whether it's funding, but particularly just all the legislation, that would be a good mm -hmm. thing probably for us to hear collectively, mini study mm -hmm. session. I don't know how long it'll take, but. Okay. You know. Um, definitely as things, um, you will hear about them as we come forward with anything that impacts required changes. So as an example, mm -hmm. the ADU, um, there's several ADU bills that are yeah. in one or another place in the process. Um, so those will certainly have impacts when we come back on the ADU discussion. Uh, but we could maybe have a conversation with the city manager's office about, at the very least, maybe putting together an informative memo or something on that. Well, I, and I'm you know, just thinking out loud, and I won't take up too much time, but it might be something also of interest to co-sponsor with some other community. There's so many groups interested in housing. And, and it's one thing, oh, we got this little ADU cleanup. We got this little inclusionary, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's all the little things you get, but to get kind of the big picture of the changes and where it's going, and what authority we now have or opportunities we have, et cetera. So much has changed, I think might be good for us as a community to- Sure, and the California League of Cities um, after the legislative term every year has a presentation. So it may be the type of thing where we could pull that resource and do the presentation that way so that it's not pulling from the resources of the team to put something together. I'm trying to think of ways to yeah. maximize yeah, uh, existing idea. resources. And even yeah. have someone down and co-sponsor an evening program with some groups. Anyway, yeah. I would appreciate that kind of a bigger picture of the new landscape. Okay, um, I was actually around for the origin of all this, uh, which was the general plan that we currently operate under, which was developed over, uh, I think, a three-year period with extreme engagement of many sectors and a huge amount of the public. And the idea of increasing density along the transportation corridors was one of the many, many, many concepts that came out and was unanimously approved. And then the corridors project, I mean, I'm, telling you, you know this, no, please. <laughs> was um, uh, taken as a discrete um, project to pursue. I was a part of that. I have to say it was a pretty unsatisfying experience. Yeah, you know, it was. Um, and so much time has passed. I think the underpinnings of the, the theory are lost. People have moved on, et cetera. So um, it is basically being dealt with de novo now. Mm. The, the, the big picture and all um, have kind of vanished from people's consciousness. Uh, I did feel in the um, directing staff um, directions, A and B, they're a little bit contradictory um, to uh, protect the residential neighborhoods and existing businesses as the highest priority but also encourage new residential and mixed use development, including enhanced affordable housing at appropriate locations along the main transportation corridors. That seemed to me like that was the corridors plan. So good luck. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you. Um, it seems to me there's an inherent tension there. Um, it did look to me at um, looking at the participants, it seems pretty east side heavy. And of course, Safe Santa Cruz is pretty east side heavy. Um, just throw it out there, maybe include someone from Santa Cruz Neighbors, which tends to be more citywide, concerned with the neighborhoods, et cetera, and someone from one of the major business groups, which has a high priority on housing, all its many forms. So those are just suggestions, and those were groups that were pretty involved back in the day. Thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question and then we'll go to Council Member Crowd and then we'll open it up for public comment and then return back for any kind of action. Although this is simply an update I know with input. Um, one of the things that you mentioned at the first sort of, um, uh, at the first meeting that we discussed this was a lot of the things that weren't being done. And I'm wondering if you could provide us with any input on what some of the things that the, the planning department isn't working on. Sure. Terms, especially some of the ADU stuff or right. and what are the costs, opportunity costs is originally designed. Sure, so um, some of the things that we were planning to work on this fall um, included a analysis of the fees for ADUs, um, lowering, potentially standardizing those. Um, we have on our work plan um, development of ADU guidance materials to try to encourage them and make them easier to develop in the city and help people who are kind of novice developers be able to come in and relatively easily know what they need to do in order to be able to develop an ADU. Um, we also had on our work plan, or still 
do have um, the prioritization of our housing strategy to encourage a variety of housing types for a variety of different um, types of housing needs. So that could include development of junior ADU regulations, uh, update of our SRO and SOU ordinance, that single room occupancy and single ownership unit ordinances in order to encourage the development of those um, and standards to allow some of those things on the same lot, like a junior ADU and a regular ADU. Um, those are updates to the ordinance that require the requisite uh, outreach and um, planning commission hearing and uh, council hearings. Um, we also have uh, on our work plan to update parking standards throughout the city to facilitate more housing. Um, there is uh, revisions to the overall uh, standards and then uh, particularly re revisions to single family dwelling unit standards to facilitate ADU development. And then um, obviously I think at the last work plan meeting we talked about the need to update our zoning ordinance to promote legalization of unpermitted dwelling units. Um, that, that's a, a big one that um, has kind of been put on hold. And then we have a lot of general cleanup work that has been on hold for a while um, that um, really needs to be done. So updating our beekeeping ordinance, updating our slope, mod you know, modifying our slope requirements, substandard lot definition, um, where there's a center line setback issue in a particular area of the city. So there's just a lot of little kind of like core service general cleanup work that needs to be done. So I'd say that's probably the core set of most important things that have kind of been pushed back um, in the most immediate few, you know, time frame. Okay. Okay, so a lot of the, primarily, if I hear, I'm hearing you also, a lot of the work that we're moving forward with with the ADUs has been kind of. Yes, so there will be, will be as soon as we know what's going on with the state, um, we will be bringing forward a conversation on, okay, um, conversation, and Sarah can comment more on this because she's also the project manager on that. Um, but the um, state stuff will definitely be coming forward with most immediately, but um, some of the other stuff uh, that I mentioned, like the fees and the guidance materials, there's just not capacity for that right now. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilman Bergeron. Thank you. Um, what, what is, the, I see another thing, what is the CAC? Sure, that was the uh, quarters advisory committee that had been um, put together when in 2015 when this, the corridors process kind of kicked off. How, uh, where are those two people from? So um, they, we invited the chair and the vice chair. Where, which, where do they live? They live on the west side, east side? Well, I have no idea, I don't know. And I, I, our direction I thought at the meeting was about, was focused on community groups, how did the two members of the CAC get involved? Sure, so since they were so intricately involved in the process, um, we thought it would make sense to have them come, especially when we were thinking about framing this really as a listening session to kind of understand, given that none of us were here for that, we wanted to be able to hear from everybody involved in terms of, you know, kind of what happened, right? What happened and where are we? So that's why we uh, in invited them. Well, it would be great if you could um, address the council member um, Matthew's thing about nobody from the west side, it's east side heavy. If we remember, I believe 14 members of the original group were from the west side and zero from the east side, but yet 85% of the con contemplated development was gonna be on the east side. This is why we had a brush fire mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, occur. Great. So if you could maybe get back and let us know if that's, if there's, um, you know, there's six, I, I see 12 members on this, this group, the committee. I don't know where the other six are from. So there's six invited from uh, Safe Santa Cruz. No, no, I, I see that, but I don't oh, know oh, where, I see. where the residencies are because that became yeah. an issue. Yeah. I, I, okay, yeah, and I didn't even think to ask that that question because, again, not being here, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't about the east side, west side. It was about the concerns with just neighborhood protection overall. Yeah, so, and I, and I, I sent you four though. other groups, too, that um, I think are interested in being, um, mm -hmm. talking about it. Okay, well, I would be happy if you um, have. I, I give you contacts, yeah. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and pause for a moment and see if there's any members Great. of the community who want to address the council on this item. And if you are here, please step forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Okay. I'll set that there. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Kyle Kelly. I'm a father of three in Santa Cruz and a member of uh, Neighborly Santa Cruz. Um, this week is a global climate strike and I wanna see Santa Cruz play its part as a city. Um, I missed out on my ability to comment on the corridor plan uh, because of an open house at my school. 
Um, that's the same for other working families that, that also go to the same school, some of which are on the east side, some of which are on the west side. Um, and we'd love to be included in that, in that next meeting that, that's talking about it. Um, so my, my family lives not far from downtown in the wharf, and for us it's very walkable and very bikeable. Uh, my three kids are able to join in, communi in commuting with zero emissions <laughs> while enjoying our city. That's wonderful. And like we live right now at a medium density residential area. Um, and what prevents many people here from families to students to elderly uh, from getting the same experience as our current zoning. It falls flat because of a large amount of single family only zoning. Uh, people are practically required to have cars in the city. When people get groceries, do you expect that they drive, walk, or bike? Or, or take the bus. Uh, so when, when amenities are closer and more walkable, there are, more, there are fewer cars on the road. In order to facilitate that, we need dense housing and transit infrastructure. Um, when we prevent housing from being built here, we encourage sprawl elsewhere um, in untouched lands. Those people then have to commute to our city in order to work. Um, I know many people that live in Watsonville and drive to Santa Cruz for work. Uh, there are people driving over the hill too because higher paying jobs are there across all sectors and income levels. Um, and so you've got to consider how the city's current policies are encouraging this. Um, all of California has a suburban sprawl problem and it does, need, it does need to be solved in California at large, but also in Santa Cruz. And we have, we have to play our part. Um, so yeah, I, I know I'm running out of time. So we must prioritize transit and legalize denser housing by transit and jobs. I'd really like to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Is there any other member of the community who would like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back. I don't think you need any action from us. It's just to receive an update, is that correct? Okay, Councilmember Brown. So um, I do have, I have another question and uh, possible, I know this is not an action item, but I um, am prepared to, to take action if necessary. Um, the, um, I know that it wasn't included in the original motion, but I understand there is interest from planning commissioners to also receive updates about what's happening with this process. <laughs> and um, so I'm hoping that we could get this, uh, an update after the um, October 2nd meeting on the planning commission agenda as well for them to have be involved in the conversation. I mean, they were involved in the conversation around the corridors plan initially, um, the commission, and I think this is definitely in their purview. So I'm hoping that can happen and wondering what the thought is on that. So I have a question for you. Um, I, immediately I go to workload and capacity. That's right where my brain goes. Um, would it be suitable for us to bring the report that we bring to council at the next planning commission meeting, potentially let them know, here's the report that we gave, let us know if you have any input, and then when we do our next report, back to you, we can let you know what planning committee, right? And so we're not duplicating work and staff reports, but we're able to share the information between uh, both recommending and approving bodies. Absolutely, yeah, okay. no, I know I'm not asking that this be any extra, right. I mean, aside from having the having it on their agenda, which takes some, there's <coughs> time involved in that, you know, but however long it takes for that agenda item to occur, but yeah, that it would be the same information that we're receiving. Yeah. That is absolutely fine with me. Is that that's suitable by the council? Sure. Okay. And if that doesn't require action, that, that will happen like at their next meeting. Okay. It's over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Council McCrum. Will it, will it go to their um, October meeting? So what I would plan to do, and um, oh, actually, um, why don't yeah. <laughs> I would highly recommend that we do not bring it at the October meeting, and I say that because there are gonna be substantial issues that this council needs to debate following the, uh, the outcome of SB 330, and the direction that we receive from that um, debate that the council has is going to inform where we go with this process. And so I think having that policy direction from the council will be important to give uh, and to inform any uh, planning commission discussion, we may not know um, uh, before uh, the before the planning commission meetings whether um, 
what the fate of SB 330 is. And um, certainly I, I would say bringing it back following the October 22nd meeting is a great time to go because then we'll have uh, a full understanding of what we can and can't do. And we'll have specific direction hopefully from council in relation to the initial outreach as well as um, in relation to the applicable state bills. Uh, if I could add, that's why he's the director, because <laughs> he thinks of things like this. And um, secondly, um, I think maybe instead of bringing this conversation to that meeting, what we could do as a compromise is potentially send them this staff report with an update on the conversation to the planning commissioners, so then they're kept abreast, and then we can um, bring back a bigger conversation after we've we really know the outcome of SB 330 and are able to have kind of a informed conversation with them about what the what the state legislation is. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Kern. Um, just since, since you wrote up Senate Bill 330, um, is that something that the League of Cities is opposed to? Yes, they are um, opposed to it. Um, I, I was gonna say oppose unless amended, but it's way past that point. So yes, they are. Um, they were requesting a veto. Is it too late for cities to, um, <sighs> you know, for us to officially oppose it as well? It is on the governor's desk, and so, um, I, it, Yes and no. It. He could have already signed it during the course of this meeting. I really don't know. <laughs> that means at any point it could be signed. Um, and by the time council were to agendize that to be able to, you know, make a determination and draft a letter, you could, at, that is absolutely your, your prerogative if you'd like to do that, but it may be too late by the time that comes around for the next meeting. And individuals in the absence of that are always yeah, no, yeah, I'm called. Okay. Um, I just have one, one other thing I want to make a for record comment here just so it, it sticks because it's basically reiterating what our direction was last time um, that uh, the meeting on October 2nd should focus on how staff can best develop a proposal that will quote, this is from our, our the, what we passed, general plan and zoning ordinance changes as necessary to meet the following objectives. A, preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas existing and existing city businesses as city's highest level policy priority. And B, encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities at appropriate locations along the city's main transportation corridors. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. we'll go ahead and conclude that item and move on to item number 17 in our agenda. And um, I'll look to Mr. Condotti. I believe if that's accurate, you'll be presenting this item? Yes. This is the thank you, Mayor Watkins, the members of the City Council. The item before you this evening is an amendment or a, a resolution calling for a uh, measure to be added to the March 3rd, 2020 statewide primary ballot to repeal Article 16 of the city charter, which deals with the governance uh, of the Santa Cruz City School District and the constitution of its members, um, of its board of trustees. As you know, uh, late last year, the school district received a letter <coughs> alleging that it, uh, that its elections process uh, violated the California Voting Rights Act and demanding that the, the um, Board of Trustees establish uh, elections by district as opposed to the current system, which kind of has elections by district, but what it specifies is that <coughs> three members of the board shall be residents of the city of Santa Cruz, three members shall be residents outside of the city of Santa Cruz, and one shall be elected at large. And so um, in response to that, um, the school district entered into a settlement agreement early uh, this year that um, uh, put in place a process to establish by district elections for the school district. And that process has continued um, and, it, and the school district is now poised to begin by district elections at its November, um, 2020 election. Uh, what's standing in the way of that is uh, the city charter provision, which while it purports to govern 
the school district and board of trustees as a practical matter the city hasn't done that for decades so skill school district has requested that this item be approved by the city council to place uh, on the ballot for for the march 3rd primary um, a repeal of article 16 in its entirety and that's what's before you today okay thank you Unless there are any questions from the council, we'll go ahead and see if any member of the community wants to address us on this item. This is item number um, 17 in our agenda packet. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, return it back for council action and deliberation. Councilmember Myers. I'll go ahead and move the item. Second. Okay. A motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is item number 18, and we have this as a council member item. So I'll go ahead and ask if the council members want to introduce the item before we move forward at this time. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, this is an item brought forward by council member Myers and myself, and it relates to um, a review and update on the county's syringe services program, which has been operating for several years. Um, the SSP earlier this year um, presented a report to the Board of Supervisors and um, uh, <coughs> in that process reached out to the, uh, con considering the possibility of a number of um, uh, changes in their uh, syringe policies and practices. They reached out to the city um, asking us to explore the option of installing some county service and maintain syringe disposal kiosks in the city. And uh, we have that letter in our agenda packet here. Um, and uh, I wanna say in reference to that, um, there's long been a, a request and, and fortunately some um, movement in the, the city's interest in having the county take greater um, uh, ownership and involvement with the city on uh, syringe related issues. So um, I want to um, thank them for opening this issue and um, giving us the opportunity to comment. So the recommendation that we brought forward is that we ask the mayor to write a letter to the county um, expressing our openness as a city to four additional syringe di disposal kiosks with locations to be determined by the city manager's office. And this is what's important with all costs and labor for the placement and maintenance of the kiosk to be covered by the county and their contractors in perpetuity. I will just say parenthetically that as this issue has come up and requests from the public to put kiosks, uh, uh, sharps containers around the city, it's always been who's going to maintain them. And so here we have um, a proposal by the county to take this responsibility, which is appropriately theirs. And then the re recommendation also says a number of smaller secure syringe disposal bins may also be appropriate in certain locations um, to be installed at the county expense. So um, that's the specific um, message from us back to the county is we are open to this um, uh, at uh, designated locations um, to be determined by the <coughs> city manager's office. But also um, in this motion would be directing the mayor to advise the county that um, uh, there be no safe injection sites in the city of Santa Cruz that there be no additional syringe exchange sites without prior city council approval, that we do not support secondary syringe exchange, and we ask the county to establish a 24 seven needle litter response program. So that's the entirety of the item that's coming before us. And after we hear from council members and the public, I'd like to make that motion. Um, is there any questions for the council members um, who brought this item forward? And if not, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment and then return back for action and deliberation. Questions, council member? Um, yeah, uh, thank you. So I guess the, uh, you know, the county board of supervisors is actually hearing this item today or an item related to the syringe exchange program. And they have, they are working on, uh, kind of programming around kind of community engagement and evaluation of their findings and recommendations, which is going back to the Board of Supervisors in December. And so I, I get, and I feel like this is not a real opportunity for the city to um, be um, 
uh, to partner with the county, to cooperate with the county on its efforts and kind of work in conjunction with what they're doing. So I guess I'm wondering why this is coming. I mean, the kiosk piece I get, it's in response mm -hmm. to the letter, but the rest of it um, seems um, a bit preemptive if we want to work with the county on, on their efforts at you know, community outreach discussion. It seems like you know, we'd, we'd want to express that to them and kind of see where they're headed so we can um, support that. I think, um, for my mind, one of the reasons to put this on now is to say, as you're moving forward with, with all your plans, please don't include all these other things without even telling us, uh, because we have, we have issues with them. And, you know, they will continue with their discussions, and <coughs> the conversations will continue, and I think um, we can certainly include, in the language of the motion, our appreciation for the county's willingness to work with us our interest in working with them. But I think this is saying, this motion says, this is what we're willing to do now. We're not interested in the following. Okay, any other questions? Question? Thank you, yeah. So, um, wonderful to see the uh, kiosk thing. I think that's long overdue. Um, just curious about the, uh, the statement of no safe injection sites in Santa Cruz should be established. Is, where, what are you working, uh, can you explain that a little bit more, uh, the logic behind that and why? The logic from my point of view is that uh, I don't think that's a program that the city of Santa Cruz with our high concentration of um, uh, uh, injection uh, uh, users, um, can handle, I, I believe it will become an attractant, and I think we have more than our fair share of uh, uh, substance abusers using needles um, uh, already. That's, I, I know that other communities have done this. Uh, I don't see that it's um, something that's transferable to our community, um, and it has not been without uh, severe problems in those communities as well. I was just asking because I was just wondering if there was any data associated with the concern that you just shared or yeah, uh, what lots the... of studies. I'm, I'm, this is something I've brought forward. I think for our community, it's, it's not an appropriate um, program to institute. I just, I, maybe I missed it. Did you include that data or those studies that you're citing in the agenda packet? No. So um, I would just counter that and uh, just because looking at the data and studies that I've found and reviewed, it says that safe injection sites have a way of preventing communicable diseases and reducing in overdoses. So um, I, I, I think a uh, data-driven approach towards this kind of thing is important, and I was really sad not to see anything in the uh, agenda packet. <laughs> I'll say generally, and, and then if we can just open it to the public, I, uh, I think around all these other items that are listed, additional comments um, to send to the county, I understand that from a harm reduction point of view from, for individuals, there's a role and it's measurable. But I also think um, that we have to look at harm reduction for our entire community. And we have such a, um, <coughs> uh, such a huge amount of um, uh, drug use impact in our community, which includes needles and a whole lot of other things. Um, that I'm looking kind of at the harm reduction picture for the whole community. And I don't think we can add this to it without, um, without an impact that we're not ready to handle. So I know Councilmember Myers had something she wanted to add, but I think we'll go ahead and do that after the public comments. Okay. So we'll have public comment, but before we go to um, any, uh, any of the individuals, I had a request from Serge Cagno to uh, have a group presentation on behalf of his group. Um, so you're welcome to come forward. And then is there any, is Denise Ellerick, I don't see Denise Ellerick here. So you'll be the only presentation, then we'll have it open up to everybody else. Hey, um, so my name's Serge and I made a resource directory and it's got all the services and it's got the syringe services program on there and we'll get back to that on how many hours that thing's actually open during the week. I'll leave you to guess that for a little while. Um, I was a drug and alcohol counselor in Oregon, certified, um, like the CADC that they have in California. Um, and I absolutely support placement of four syringe kiosks and smaller disposal bins. Um, 
because the only place to put, put them right now is, well, people drop them or people put them in trash cans, which is a little worse for the guy who has to clean the trash cans. So absolutely supporting the kiosks and the disposal bins. Um, I would suggest the placement of the kiosks and the bins be included in the catch work because part of what we're working on on sleep ordinances and where people might be and stuff absolutely relates to where you're gonna put these things sort of solidly into the ground at times. Um, we have, and I would add, and there's the possibility that we may bring re recommendations as early as next month. So we could try to get the kiosk and bin locations back to you at the second meeting in October. We may have some recommendations on hygiene, sleep, and winter shelter set up and stuff too. Um, and I am not a spokesman for the catch. I'm just saying that out there. Um, the, in his letter that was included, Supervisor Coonerty uh, mentioned the conversation they had help, had with health services, and he recommend and he said that they were talking about the recommendations. He didn't mention the recommendations. The recommendations actually were for secondary uh, syringe exchanges and stuff. The supervisors didn't accept that. So that is best practice, and is spouted very clearly by Mimi Hall, who talked about health in all pro policies. Very clearly, the more clean needles the more people are using clean needles. The less clean needles, the more people are using dirty needles. Less clean needles does not lessen drug use. Less clean needles does not le lessen needle litter either. There is no, and on the county's website, and there's studies on this too, in communities that have lessened secondary needle distribution, there's been no lessening of needle litter. It's not connected. In places that don't even, that stopped giving any needles, they still have needle litter. It has no effect on drug usage. The other ways of dealing with it is having a kiosk or having a place or communicating with people and connecting with them and trying to work it in other ways. But limiting the supply of needles does not stop drug use at all. <laughs> um, the, Board of Supervisors, they want to put little names on the little thing. County say you got this from the county and stuff to prove it came from some place or whatever. People use. They're addicted. That's what they do. They, I'm sorry, but it's a bias to say that people come from out of the county to use our services or if we had clean, like injection sites, people would come. These are addicted people with a whole lot of challenges going on. They're not moving to other cities just because it's legal in one program, in one little place, in a very managed with nurses and stuff, not an open field and everybody using. That's not what those kind of programs are about. Okay, so on Emmeline, if you wanna get syringes, nine and a half hours during the week, uh, Monday mornings, Tuesday in the evening for a little bit, Friday mornings. Wednesday, <coughs> five hours per week are the only times that you can get clean needles. How many people don't want to go to a county building to show that they're addicted to needle, <coughs> addicted to drugs, and don't want to go there get needles, and they're having trouble with other ways? Which is what secondary exchange is about, and people who are also trying to connect them with services. There's nothing to say that somebody that goes to the county is more likely to sign up for Janus than somebody who's talking to the harm reduction people. So, just an assumption. Okay, that's it. Thanks. You'll have up to two minutes. Thank you, my name's Sharon, and I wanna thank um, Cynthia and Donna for bringing this forward. And um, I was part of a group that was invited to the county uh, last week, or it was in, earlier in September, in regards to the syringe litter. I was really touched that I was invited there, and I left feeling really positive, like I feel like finally we're in some solution. Um, and I, I do support 100% more kiosks, and I love the idea of a 24-hour service to address the syringe litter um, and the county being financially responsible for that. And I feel that this proposal, as it's written, um, addresses the common welfare of the community. And um, for what it's worth, I'm a recovering drug addict. I started using when I was 11. I got clean when I was 28. I've been clean for over 27 years. Um, and when I was in the throes of my addiction, I, what that looked like for me is I had zero respect for me, zero respect for you, and zero respect for my surroundings. So to make an amends kind of to the planet, a couple of years ago I started cleaning with the clean team, I started cleaning with the Levelies, and I myself picked up over 300 syringes um, and 
collectively with our groups, we picked up thousands. And now we have the downtown streets team that is doing that. And when I was at that county meeting the other week, they said that they picked up 6,000 needles. Um, the last 27 years of my life have been a blessing and I'm surrounded by clean and not clean addicts every single day. And it's who I choose to be around, something I, have frequently, I frequently have to ask myself, am I helping the addict or am I helping the addiction? And I strongly suggest that if you're not asking yourselves that, you do. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. The goal of any SSP, as I understand it, should be to get people exposed to services, treat their wounds in the meantime, and just repeatedly offer them help. That doesn't happen in a secondary exchange in a, with medical, trained medical professionals. This is a complex issue. It's a health crisis. We don't treat that with just folks off the street. We treat it with trained professionals. Now, the secondary exchange claims that they refer people to services. And if the primary goal of a SSP is to get people in there so they can talk to them, I'm looking at numbers here of primary visits to the SSP. They go back to 2016. Primary visits, that's going for yourself, not others. We're averaging a little upwards of 150 a month prior to the HRC's inception in April 8, 2018. When they started, the numbers started dropping. When we opened Ross Camp, for lack of a better word, the numbers plummeted. An example would be March of 2018, 142 primary visits to the SSP. In 2019, the height of the Ross camp was 44. Uh, you can double check these numbers if you want. They're all on the internet. Secondary exchange, if their goal is to refer people to services, they're actually having the adverse effect. They're poaching customers from the SSP and they're treating them in the dirt. We gotta get these people help or they're never gonna get well and they're gonna continue to die. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm a data-driven medical professional as well and I wanna throw some numbers at you for the people that are data-driven as well. So the current SSP report from July 2019, which is the most current numbers we have, is 54,530 needles were handed out in the month of July 2019 alone. So this kind of assertion that we don't hand out enough clean needles, I would ask the question, how many clean needles is enough? So over 91 clients received over 200 needles per visit. This is the county's report. You can verify it yourself, it's online. Out of those clients, 86 are homeless. So to act that these homeless people have no interest in showing up at a county building to maybe take care of themselves, maybe interact with a nurse, is a falsity. These people, we need to bring them into the healthcare system. We need to wrap around services so that when they are ready, to deal with their addiction, we can actually take them straight to a physician who is ready to prescribe them that treatment, to a nurse who is ready to treat their wound on site. Secondary exchange doesn't do that. That's basically like saying, here, meet me in the dirt where you're at, because yeah, that's great. We don't care about you. We want to change the perception locally. We want our addicts to know that we care the most and we want them to get services. And to be able to do that, that's why this proposal addresses that. A safe injection site is run by medical professionals, not a harm reduction coalition, not volunteers who aren't trained. And I would argue that if you're allowing secondary exchange to happen in the city, where are the records? Where is the data? Where is their data of how many clients they've referred who actually have gotten treatment for hepatitis and HIV, are actually being seen by medical people? There is none. Council members, Mayor, afternoon maybe. Uh, there's my data. That's 80, 
87 so far this year since January, and it's been a slow year because I've been really busy, haven't been able to walk around much. Uh, my name is Damon Bruder. I'm a concerned citizen and a recovering <coughs> addict. Uh, I've said it many times on the other side of the river at the Board of Supervisors, we need accountability for our syringe services program. Handing out 10 needles and then weighing a black box that comes back and hoping that it's needles in there isn't one for one. I know you guys don't control that. I, I know you don't. Um, we need the accountability. We need accountability from the county for cleaning up the messes. That gentleman back there, he shouldn't have to come and pick up a needle from in front of my house because my nine-year-old nine -year grandson almost stepped on it. The county needs to take that over. Your motion that, that you're putting forth, I agree with 100%. We need more kiosks. When I was having, when I was using, I needed a place to put my needles. I always went back to the needle exchange, which was right over there where the AA fellowship is now. I can still get what I need, same building. I needed a place to put them instead of flipping them in the bushes. I put it there. If we have kiosks, people, some people will use them. The more availability there is, and like Serge said, where they are will help. No safe injection sites. Don't give me a place to kill myself. The secondary exchange, mm, not the way it's being run. If it's run properly with a medical, a medical supervision, um, and it's not just a, let's bring your drugs, your needles, and everything you need in a pamphlet how to shoot up to where you're living in the woods, maybe the secondary exchange could help. Harm reduction is important to all of us, but only if it's run properly. We need harm reduction for our entire community. We need harm reduction for the PTSD of the parents of the child that stepped on or found a needle on the beach when they came to visit. We need harm reduction for the addict and their friends. Please vote yes on this. Thank you. Speaker. Hi, my name is Jane. I'm speaking here in my capacity as a public health professional. <clears throat> in particular, I speak from my experience as the chief of preventive services of the State Office of AIDS. And finally, I speak in the spirit of health and all policies adopted by the city council, which I'm really proud of. Public health as a field exists to serve the public. The goal of public health is to improve the situation of any part of the community experiencing problems that can affect their health. That, for example, is why the Dientes Dental Clinic was established. Poor dental health, including lack of services, was a major community problem. The positions taken against having any safe injection sites, additional syringe exchanges, including mobile, or secondary syringe exchange in, in Santa Cruz City are criminal. By these positions, the proposers are saying, despite well-known data-driven best practices, we don't want the county to provide specific services within our city, even though they would definitely improve the health and safety of the population, as well as the health and safety of individuals. Rather, than relying on well-documented successful programs noted on the county's website. The drafters are relying on anecdotal experiences of those who have their ear. People who assume almost all needle users are homeless and hope the problem of needles will be solved by getting rid of the homeless. This is shameful. I encourage you to vote against these. I'm not an expert on the specifics of syringe management, but I accept the research of many dedicated individuals who show that needle exchange and secondary needle exchange will reduce, reduce the litter of dirty syringes and spread of needle-borne diseases. As a secondary effect is already mentioned by linking these programs to other public health initiatives, such as mental health services and low-cost housing, there will be a net reduction of syringe use, Thank period. You. You're, you're coming up and speaking on behalf of the Harm Reduction Coalition. You're about, you still can have your four minutes. Yeah, sorry, Denise wanted to be here to do the presentation, but... Oh, good, yeah. We would have had a lot more people here, but it's hard to tell when these general business before the break are gonna be. Glad I made it.
Hi there, um, I'm Danny Drysdale. I'm a representative of the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. We uh, are the ones who do the secondary exchange work that is being referenced today, as well as a lot of other harm reduction services in the community. Um, and also I wanna point out we're far from the only people doing secondary exchange work. It's a really common practice at syringe exchanges to have people exchange for other people. So I'm gonna go through this presentation uh, really quickly. I think the person before me covered a lot of the data that's actually really important. Before her, I heard a lot of falsehoods being thrown around. I'm not gonna go through and refute each one. Um, first, just wanted to lay out examples of harm reduction in all kinds of areas so we know what we're talking about. Things like sunscreen, seat belts, speed limits, so on and so forth. Um, we are interested in harm reduction for the whole community, not just around drug use. And things like syringe exchanges, safe injection sites actually uh, promote harm reduction for the whole community. So this is um, a, a document made by our uh, local county health services, and this is them comparing the current practices of the county with evidence-based practice. You know, we heard the word data-driven. Literally all of the public health data points to the left-hand column being the best set of practices. What we do on the right-hand column, as you can see, is quite different. Um, I'm not gonna dig deep into that, because that's not what we're talking about today, but wanted to make sure we flag that while doing this presentation. Um, here, is, this is a screenshot from a fact sheet that I sent in via email, it's public record. Y'all can go find that in the emails. Um, this fact sheet references several studies that show that syringe exchanges actually reduce the amount of needle litter in the community. So if we're here talking about reducing needle litter, strong, peer-based, which is what, uh, which, what we call our secondary services, peer-based syringe services actually will reduce needle litter. Um, not gonna go deep into any of these because I wanna move on, but this is a heat map of overdoses in the city that we left in here to point out how badly the city of Santa Cruz does need these services, not just the county as a whole. And this is also showing that the majority of deaths in the county in 2018, 15 overdose deaths were in the city itself. And so obviously there's a crisis that we need to address. <laughs> Moving on, I wanna say that as someone who spent seven years of my life heavily addicted to drugs in this county, it's deeply frustrating to watch the lives of people struggling with addiction be used as political chess pieces again and again. Um, and speaking as a representative of the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County, I wanna express our clear, our organizational opposition to the following proposals from this agenda item. We oppose a ban on overdose prevention sites, even though no one's been talking about them before this proposal, we do oppose a ban on them. Uh, we oppose a requirement for the council to approve new syringe exchange locations, and we oppose the, state, the, the statement of opposition to secondary exchanging, as it is a critical link in the chain of harm reduction in our community. Um, I would say that we have waited very long for the regressive policies of previous city councils to be reversed on these issues, but given the current political climate, it seems we'll have to wait even longer. In the meantime though, we as a coalition support the strongest possible programs based on the increasingly clear public health research on these subjects. Uh, furthermore, it is our belief that syringe litter is a symptom of the housing crisis as well as a symptom of the prevalence of drug use in the community. Housed people do contribute to syringe litter, but the lack of adequate shelter combined with the heavy restrictions on our county SSP means that many homeless people do not have access to the proper ways to dispose of their syringes even when they badly need to. By framing the issue of harm reduction as an issue of needle litter, the county has already made this debate one that centers on and targets the homeless. Instead of talking about the housing crisis or the spread of infectious diseases or overdoses, we are here debating the low-hanging fruit of needle litter. So our ask from the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County is that the council will respond to the county with a simple letter stating we would welcome new kiosks within the city limits, and then we ask all the other proposals be taken out of that letter and not be included in it, and be sent over to the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness so they can work with us directly to dive deeply into these and bring them back to you for recommendations. Bye. Thank you. I believe you'll, one more speaker, you'll be our last. No, you, I'm sorry, you're, you're next and then our last. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, I'm Brett Garrett. Um, I claim no expertise aside from a quick Google search, but uh, I, my Google search matched up with what Council Member Glover was saying about needing more data before taking an opinion, a position against safe injection sites and the like. Um, so I'm gonna agree with the previous speaker. Um, my quick Google search included an NPR link that uh, referred to research from Peter Davidson at UC San Diego. <laughs> and uh, some of the things that the article talks about are the benefits of safe injection sites, 
especially in preventing deaths among the society's most vulnerable. No death has been reported at an injection site. A 2014 review of 75 studies concluded that such places promote safer injection conditions, reduce overdoses, and increase access to health services. Supervisor, supervised injection sites were associated with less outdoor drug use, and they did not appear to have any negative impacts on crime or drug use. And the article goes on to talk about a specific program in Canada called Insight. Um, and it says they recruited, um, that, that the facility has supervised more than 3.6 million injections and responded to 6,000 overdoses. No one has ever died there. Uh, the, the research found no signs of a so-called honeypot effect at Insight, meaning it did not increase or encourage drug use. So we probably need more data, but it appears to me that safe injection sites provide a very valuable service that benefits the community, and I would oppose a position saying don't do it here. Um, I think we should at least be open to the possibility it might help us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I'd like to preface my comments with, I am not in favor of uh, illicit drug use. My real reason for talking on this issue is that during the AIDS epidemic, I lost two very close friends to AIDS. And harm reduction is gonna keep that from coming back, because it would come back. If, if people don't have clean needles and condoms, we're gonna end up having AIDS and other diseases come back in a rampant way. Um, I've submitted this uh, from the Office of AIDS, California Office of AIDS, and it, in here it says that um, secondary exchanges actually help they help reduce uh, needle litter, and they also help people be able to inject with clean needles each time instead of reusing needles or sharing needles, but they are able to use a clean needle each time they inject, which is very important. Um, myself, I would say, yeah, let's, uh, Get, get the uh, containers at the, the kiosk. Um, the first three bullet points, I say we need to have more data. We can't just have a knee-jerk reaction that's going to paint us in a corner where we can't take these actions in the future. We need data to prove that either these things work or they don't work. Um, I do support the county should establish a 24-7 needle litter response program based on what's going on in San Francisco where they have a, a, a group of people going out and picking up needles on a daily basis. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and return it back now to the council. Councilmember Matthews and then I don't know if Councilmember Myers. <coughs> okay. Um, thank you. And, and I, again, I want to reiterate, you know, most of my career spent in public health, and I, I do understand the, the concept and um, the concept of harm reduction. Um, in this case, I am gonna move forward with the recommendation as stated, um, uh, changing the words slightly. Uh, the first part of the recommendation um, that we direct the mayor to write a letter to the County of Santa Cruz expressing openness to four additional syringe disposal kiosks with locations to be determined by the city manager's office and with all costs and labor for the placement and maintenance of these kiosks to be covered by the county and their contractors in perpetuity. A number of smaller secure syringe disposal bins may also be appropriate in certain locations installed and serviced at the county expense. Then, for the time being, as the county revisits its needle uh, and syringe policies and programs, uh, gathers additional data uh, on the feasibility and effectiveness of other programs, we express the following, that there be no safe injection sites within the city of Santa Cruz, no additional syringe exchange sites without prior city council approval. We do not support secondary syringe exchange. Uh, in the city, and we asked the county to establish a 24-7 needle litter response program. 
I'll second that. So a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Meyer. And what I tried to explain in that motion and, and uh, uh, verbalize was that we realize the county is revisiting its programs and some of the shortcomings that we currently see, we hope the county takes greater responsibility and invests more in that. And the um, uh, impression we get is that they are interested in doing so. And so I, I added the words that for the time being, as the county revisits its program and gathers data on the feasibility and effectiveness of programs, for the time being, these are our statements. Councilmember Myers? Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, and I, I, I fully support the, the new language. Um, I think that we, this is an opportunity for the city of Santa Cruz to begin a relationship with, most importantly, the new uh, health services um, director and we fully, I fully um, believe that health professionals, medical professionals and our county health department needs to be our partner and our guide in figuring out how we, how we plan for those in our community who need these services. Now, whether those are within our actual jurisdiction or whether the, those folks are living within our, within our city. Um, we need to go slow, we can't go fast, and we will fail if we keep pushing. And so I think what our intent with this really is to recognize and, and actually thank the county for taking the time to reach out to us and, and, and to build this boat together. Um, we, we can't make any more mistakes, our entire community is having issues with the needle uh, needles that are being found in everywhere throughout the city, and um, and most importantly, the people who are suffering from addiction. We need a comprehensive program that's going to provide success. We need pathways for these people to become well healthy, and we're failing at that. And um, so this is about a partnership. This letter is not meant to be punitive or say we want this or that in our community right now. This letter is meant to express to the county, let's start working together. Um, it has limitations in it right now because as, as I uh, signed on to the thing, I believe those limitations are important to express right now. But with, um, with the added language of clarity, I think um, this sets, a, sets, sets us on course for a productive uh, relationship moving forward with the county. Thank you, Councilmember Brown, and then I have a few comments. Uh, yeah, uh, so, well, I do have, yes, I have some comments, and then I have a question for the makers of the motion. Um, so I absolutely understand the kind of intention behind bringing this in this way. I totally support the uh, direction to, to uh, respond to the county's request and, um, about the implement, about the installation, excuse me, of uh, kiosks. I, since I've been on the council, have just not been able to figure out why we don't have them. I understand there's a history there, but I think it's time that we change course on that. I don't think it's been uh, done anyone uh, any good to not have Sharps kiosks. And I appreciate that the county is stepping up and wanting to do this and wanting to um, provide the resources for it. Um, so I absolutely support that piece. I um, I do have concerns, though, about the um, the rest of the language in, in this proposal because, um, well, for a variety of reasons. But um, I'll start with the um, the kind of relationship with the county, and I agree completely with Councilmember Myers that this is an opportunity for us to partner with the county, and that the county needs to be both our partner and our guide. And so I feel like um, try, including language which addresses um, the potential hypothetical establishment of programs um, and locations that aren't even on the radar, as far as I can tell, um, is really a you know a reaction to uh, social anxieties and which we rightfully have in our community. We have a serious problem, um, but I would prefer to wait until the county um, completes this process that they are um, they are I believe talking about. Who knows if it's maybe it's already done. Um, 
today related to recommendations on a plan for syringe disposal, um, addressing secondary exchange and monitoring referrals of SSP to the MAP program. Um, they are planning to do that in December 2019. I would prefer to include in a letter that we look forward to working with them and partnering with them in those efforts around community engagement. They're doing surveys, they're having community meetings. Um, I think those are opportunities for this conversation to be had with our broader community. And um, so that would be my preference. And um, so I guess it, with, I'll leave it there for now. Um, but my question is if um, we could di perhaps divide the the motion for the letter regarding kiosks and 24 7 and 24 7 needle litter response and then the, the others as a separate mm -hmm. um in the interest of sort of moving that along yeah. do you want to go ahead and make that motion to or make that i'm happy to divide it okay let's yeah. divide the question should we I go ahead and maybe that. let's go ahead and maybe take that vote and then we can move forward with some of the other issues that are still outstanding after that okay so the motion has been divided to address the um to support essentially the first uh, uh, recommendation to have the mayor write a letter to the county of Santa Cruz expressing the openness to the four additional syringe disposal kiosks, et cetera, as well as to include um, that that letter also um, include a recommendation that the county establish a 24 seven needle litter response program. Is that correct? Yes, and we can include language um, appreciating um, their attention to this issue and our desire to continue a um, an active <coughs> partnership. Perfect. So also including our intention around collaborating and their, um, our appreciation of their um, seeking our input as we move forward in this way. Okay. Is there any further discussion on that component of the motion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. So then in regards to the outstanding areas of kind of position, I, um, I'll just maybe take a moment to sort of share sort of my thoughts on it. I appreciate it. I appreciate the added language on it. Um, I think at this time, we want to know more before we say yes. And we, we don't do um, social services. We don't have a health division or department and we need our county partners to help us. And as Councilmember Myers is suggesting to guide us, um, I'm 100% supportive of um, harm reduction and needle exchange. I do think that um, we need to do that well and right and we want to have it to the best caliber we can have it at. And that requires us being able to work with our um, partners. And so, especially those who are experts in the field, the county partners. So for me, um, having that language around needing to have the county weigh in, needing to have the city council approve, I think that could also be applied to the city does not support the secondary needle exchange, unless it's sort of as a partnership or out kind of are spurred through the county and has our council approval. I think we just need to know. I think that's part of the, the challenge is if we don't do uh, um, uh, human services and it's happening in our community and we're unaware and it's not going through the county, then I think we want it to go through them. So that is sort of implied in the, in the um, direction around no additional syringe exchange sites, including mobile exchange in the city without us having approval. I think that could similarly be applied to the following bullet around the secondary syringe exchange. And I would just suggest that go through the county as there are health and human services entity here. <coughs> I do also just wanna um, kind of share what Councilmember Myers was saying. I hope what we can do is move forward in a way that's gonna bring healing to those who are in need, that's gonna bring the best medical attention and direction, and ultimately allows us to move into a place of prevention at a certain place where we can stop folks from uh, getting hooked on these drugs to begin with. So I will support it. I would make the um, suggestion that we can change the language maybe to that third um, bullet to have some um, elements around collaboration with the county and with council approval. Yeah, sure. Okay. And then that second end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other c comments? Oh, do we need clarity by? Yeah, if I could just get Council Member Matthews to read what the motion. part of the motion. <laughs> Okay, that, that's great. Could you please restate that? Yeah, so for the time being, as the county revisits its needle exchange and harm reduction program, um, gathers data on fe feasibility and um, impact, um, the city expresses, um, advises the county that um, we um, do not uh, support safe injection sites within the city 
established without prior, <coughs> I'm gonna put without prior city council approval on all of these things. No additional syringe exchange sites in the city of Santa Cruz should be established without prior city council approval. And the city does not support secondary syringe exchange without prior uh, city council approval. If I could, maybe the only thing I would add is that it, without our council approval, but also without the county's information yes, approval, yeah, yeah. as our countywide health and services. And um, uh, in all cases involving um, consultation and involvement of the county health services. Yeah. Which makes sense to me. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on this item at this time? Councilmember Brown? Yeah, I just have a quick follow-up comment. Um, again, I, um, I have concerns about making these kinds of statements to the county when we are approaching them uh, in the spirit of partnership and cooperation to say, um, except for not in our city. It just doesn't feel right to me. Um, I also have concerns about making sweeping statements about um, programs that, you know, I'm not entirely clear about the, um, the consequences and you know the benefits and the the challenges. I understand what I know is we have a serious problem in our community. We have um, we have so many needles um, that are being found. You know that and I and I and I am convinced that this is a, an issue that we have to address. But I'm not convinced that saying no safe injection sites is going to do anything to if I mean if anything it, that could help us. So in tr with our needle litter issue, which is the ostensible purpose for this agenda item. So I guess I, I'm just not comfortable doing that. I would prefer that we refer these um, matters to um, the catch. It sounds like um, at least one representative of the catch is interested in, in looking at these, um, giving, uh, advising us. Um, so I'd really prefer that we do that before we make sweeping statements. I would also just conclude by saying we can't stop any of the, <laughs> I mean, we, you know, the city only has so much power to um, to regulate. We, they're at least in in this way saying, you know, we don't support it, is a statement of that we don't support it. But um, we're going to have to take it very seriously if and when an actual proposal were to come our way, because that is where I think um, this, the city's going to have to weigh in about the conditions under which we would ever approve that. But for now to just say, no, we don't support it, does not it just doesn't seem like um, there's really any um, reason need to do that at this time. So I, I, I can't support that. I'd prefer that we, um, if we wanna have this conversation that we um, get, we refer it to some people who really would, would be willing to spend some time wrestling with it and get more information and come back to us. We have Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Glover, Myers, and then Matthews. Thank you, and I just want to say that I agree um, with a lot of what Councilmember Brown just had to say because I think that what's important is that we're not shutting the doors of the community on opportunities for people to receive, um, you know, alternative forms of of care when it comes to um, the use of needles and um, their ability to get access to resources. Um, I think that. Um, you know, we need to, if the county's working on this and the county is trying to gather data and get an understanding of what is appropriate for the city and the county, that we, we keep our options open and that we try to see what the county is gonna recommend and then engage in a meaningful dialogue with them if some of these, um, if some of these options were to come forward. And to say no immediately sends a message that they shouldn't consider these at all um, when they're trying to do community engagement. And so I feel that um, what's really important is that we leave our options open and we really try to see what the community wants, um, what the community is in need of, what the county feels that they can help us support, and then based on those kinds of recommendations and engagement with the community, we begin to move forward with how we're gonna address some of these issues. And I also agree that if, I think that this would be something that um, if there's members of the catch who'd be interested in taking this on, that we send it to them because they could form a subcommittee and a big part of their role 
um, when we form that group is that they're doing community outreach. So I feel that they could actually help us in this effort to try to get a sense of how the community, how the Santa Cruz city members feel about these different types of programs um, and, and provide that information to the city council and also our county partners. I'm gonna just, I, I know I, I, we have our, our police, our, our chief of police there in the back, and I, I don't know if there's any input that you wanna provide in this, in this context, uh, Chief Mills, but I know that <coughs> this is something that impacts uh, your work as well and the work of your force, um, maybe before we move on to some of the other council members. Well, Mayor, thank you. <laughs> And council members, uh, you know, this certainly is an important topic for all of us. And there's not a person here that doesn't want what's best for the health of this community. And as you, we get hundreds of emails and complaints about people finding needle litter. So uh, the way you have it structured uh, in terms of add, add, adding additional kiosk, I think makes sense uh, to reduce the harm. And uh, we would be happy to continue the research portion of uh, harm reduction uh, to make sure that you know we at least are headed the, sa the right way as a police department to make you know and and as safe injection sites, um, you know uh, it, that's a pretty tough tough issue from the standpoint that you are uh, encouraging <coughs> uh, encouraging is not the right word that uh, we are allowing people to knowingly violate the law in our city in terms of possession of narcotics. And, um, and so, um, you know, if there's another way to do it, then we certainly maybe wanna, wanna think about that. But until the state legislature and the federal government strikes down um, possession of methamphetamine and heroin as a law, um, I don't know that how we, the police department, could support uh, people being in possession of a controlled substance. So that's our input. Okay, I appreciate that. Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the need for sort of a qualifier, I, I think, um, in terms of, so I, I'm looking at the, the health service agency report, um, that was also provided in our packet and posted, um, with the agenda. Um, and so in this report, there's there's a recommendation for expanding SSP hours as well as incorporating <coughs> the SSP into the homeless uh, person's health project clinical field services as well. So I mean, I think I think we're on a continu continuum right now, and I think that our statement is meant to express we have services in the city of Santa Cruz right now, and we want to make sure that those are working the best that they can and that they're not causing impact to the community at large. Um, and so when I, when, when we, when I looked at the language and we looked at the language together, council member Matthews and I, um, we have these support services currently within our jurisdiction. And so I think, um, you know, we can continue to nuance a little bit on the qualifier, but I do think that, um, this is really a shared countywide need. Um, and so that, I think that's part of where I'm coming from is that I think it's been shown that the burden of services, service location in many ways does correlate to our jurisdiction. So we have, you know, data from our, from our police department that we're, we do spend a lot of resource, um, and our parks department and others. So, um, I understand and absolutely support, this is a partnership absolutely all the way along until we can get to some um, very um, well-documented needs of why a, a facility would be placed and the types of facilities that would be placed in the city. But I do think it's important for the city to, to ex establish right now at this point in time Expansion, you know, is not something, or these services being located here. I, I just feel like we need, we need to sort of put that stake in the ground with a qualifier. Um, I also just worry that with the cash, which is our homeless advisory committee, I'm worried about sending leader, you know, needle. Um, I'm worried about sending public health topics to our cash. Our cash is not comprised of public health experts. It's not a public health committee. And I think, I think we, you know, we, again, we always need to be pivoting back to the county, back to the county, back to the county. 
that's where our problem solving brain trust is and we need to just engage with them in a positive way and keep this relationship positive. I'm happy with the qualifiers, but I do think it's appropriate to try to put a bit of, of a flag in the ground at this point. I see a staff person interested in poised to <laughs> share something and then we'll go to Councilmember Glover and Matthews and the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Myers, Susie O'Hara, Assistant to the City Manager. I did wanna have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the catch and the potential of moving this consideration to the, that committee. There is a hygiene related subcommittee that has been formed and there is an infectious disease physician on that committee. I will say it would be very helpful in these types of deliber <coughs> deliberations to for the council to ask the catch whether they would want to, mm -hmm. as a committee, take this on rather than providing that directive. Um, because they do really need to think about the resources that they have, um, their collective interest in actually taking up these issues and also their ability to do that in an effective way. So as you move forward with pivoting policy over to the catch, I would just make that recommendation for them to be able to consider it and then either punt it back to you or uh, you know, incorporate it into their work plan. Councilmember Glover. Matthews and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Brown. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanna echo the statements of Councilmember Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, especially with the regard to this idea of partnership, because it's hard to imagine, you know, we just heard um, wanting to maintain a positive partnership, but to enter into a partnership with already clear cut lines as to what you can do, especially after seeing the slide from the harm reduction coalition on the hot spots of overdoses in Santa Cruz that we're dealing with in the city right now. Uh, I just think it's inappropriate to uh, set these stipulations and not enter into the partnership with an open mind since we know the relationship between the city and the county and collaborating around these issues has been tumultuous at best. So ideally we'll be able to move forward openly with uh, an open eye mind to things that we might implement here and then when that time comes, uh, reassess and figure out what's going on instead of setting up barriers ahead of time. Vice Mayor Cummings, I'm sorry, Council Member Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings. Then yeah, I'll, I just wanna reiterate, I thought the qualifiers I added uh, were uh, dealt to the objections that people raised. This was, um, as the county is in the process of revisiting its harm reduction programs with the expectation, I'm quite sure, of expanding them for the time being. These are our desires. Um, and um, we wait for them to come forward with their, um, their data and their, particularly their recommendations on feasibility and effectiveness. Um, and we wanna work with them in the future. That to me is a, um, a partnership statement there. And I will say, um, I believe in turning to professionals, the county health people are our, our local professionals. Um, and I'm not, um, I don't really think this issue should be sent to cash because um, not all injection drug users are homeless. Uh, and they got their plate full of plenty of things. So it may be that uh, we ask their opinion on suggestions, but that's not a, a deep assignment. I, I think it's appropriate that <coughs> those recommendations could come to the city manager's office where the, the um, jurisdiction is directed. And certainly I think a combination of PD and parks department are gonna kind of know the hotspots, frankly. So um, that's how I would suggest handling the um, involvement in cash at a relatively, um, um, I would say cursory uh, suggestion involves them, but doesn't put the whole burden on them. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. And just for clarification, the reason why I was, you know, wanting to involve the cash and think that you know it's a good place for this to potentially go is because I mean there is interactions with secondary syringe exchange with people who are experiencing homelessness. And the other piece of it is that, um, you know, last year there were a lot of items brought forward by the city council related to homelessness and there wasn't a lot of community engagement prior to those um, items coming forward in a broad sense of the community. There were, there were members who got to weigh in, but there were a lot of people who came here and felt like they were left out of the conversation. And um, the whole reason why we put that body together was so that they can engage with the community and get the community's input. So it's not to say that, you know, um, we don't want to have the, 
the county weigh in because I think that everybody here wants to make sure that the county is engaged in this conversation. But I think we also need to, you know, see what, what the community thinks about, you know, these different um, options of safe injection sites, mobile exchange sites, and secondary syringe exchange. And it's, uh, you know, with that group's, you know, directive to be to engage with the community, and they have health professionals on there. For me, it seemed like a, an appropriate place to send this, and then if they had a subcommittee, which it sounds like they have a, a committee dealing with hygiene, that this could fall under that umbrella for more for more community um, input to us. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I would just echo the vice mayor's comments uh, related to roll to the catch, and I also want to uh, thank uh, Ms. O'Hara for raising the. Um, Point about the kind of direction that we provide to that committee. I think um, that doesn't have to be um, a specific direction that they must do this and they must explore all of these different areas. My point was just to say if there are members of the CATS who are working on it, they want to work on it, my preference would be that if they want to do that and that hygiene committee has some things to say, that they bring us that and we that as an opportunity to learn more. So um, that was kind of my, that was my my motivation. I think that that was it. And then I guess just in response to the um, the direction. I mean, I, again, I appreciate the the point about um, where we're at right now. But you know, the the qualifying language <coughs> that you added, Councilmember Matthews. However. Given that we are in September and the county will be, I, I mean, I, I'm just having a hard time believing that we're going to end up with a new uh, safe injection site in Santa Cruz between now and December if we don't make this statement right now. So, um, I'm ha again, um, my preference would be to send, deliver an open-ended message of desire for cooperation with the county and have those conversations in their process. Um, I'll maybe make a quick comment if I could and then I'll go I'm, to you. I'm happy to add some more language too, so. One thing I think that maybe that just needs to be, I think potentially explained more thoroughly is that we just want to have a role and a voice yeah, in it, and we yeah. want to have um, an opportunity for our community to have a role and a voice in it. <coughs> and we also want to have an opportunity for our experts in, in the county to weigh in on it. And that's, I think, what for me feels good about this. It's not saying, not at all, you know, ultimately it's it's basically saying until we have that, um, this is our, this is where we, this is sort of where we're at. So for me with the language is how it's been modified. I, I that's the sort of the sentiment I hope that is across in there. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that is really challenging is if, if, if things are happening in relationship to our city and, and impacts on our residents and our community, um, and we don't really know about it, nor do we know if the county knows about it, that I feel is, is a bit of a disconnect on how we're best serving our community and best aiming to, to meet the goals that we aspire to have met in terms of the harm reduction efforts. So I think this is, I'm hopeful that this is more so of uh, an opportunity for us to kind of move together in a direction that's gonna have us um, collaboratively and transparently um, hit on these different topics. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember So Brown. I'm happy to add to my motion that we intend to engage with the county actively in their process as they move forward and that we refer these items to the cash for their consideration. Okay. Does, it doesn't mean it's their primary assignment. It's consideration. It's for their consideration. Okay. I'm fine with that. And Councilmember Myers is fine with that. Okay, Councilmember Brown, and then maybe we can go ahead and take the vote. Well, I guess I'm, you know, and again, I'm sorry to belabor this. I don't mean to, but I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of the actual objective, meeting the, the goals that we have, um, that I think we agree upon, um, how is saying no safe injection sites, no syringe exchange sites, and no, no secondary syringe exchange going to give us information about um, ha that happening? I mean, I, um, Mayor Watkins, I hear you when you say that um, these things happening without us knowing is a problem, but I'm not sure how this, these statements are going to give us any information about 
them happen. So maybe you can if, help me understand uh, that. Well, Councilmember Matthews, yeah, Vice Mayor. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of people here, but these are the back-to-back -back letters we got, emails we got from the public, and they are overwhelmingly in favor of us taking this action. And I think what this says is these are high-profile programs, and the county has said they want to engage with the public, and that's what we're saying. We need to be engaged before these get launched in our city. And I think what we have from all these letters we've received from the community is they're concerned. They know there's, <coughs> there's drug problems, there's injection problems, there's needle problems, there's addiction problems. They want to help find solutions, but they want to be engaged, and they're looking to us to, to say that that will happen. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member. I would just say that the second half of that motion, I think, is kind of where I feel like probably the whole council might be on board with just this idea that we want to work with the county, we want to work with community members, we want to send these ideas, these concepts to the catch of safe injection sites, syringe exchange, and secondary syringe exchange, and for to learn more about their consideration. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't the proposal of a safe injection site in Santa Cruz has not come up at all in, you know, at least since I've been on the city council. And I don't think that we were really planning on bringing that forward. So, I mean, I could see why people are concerned, but, you know, the concerns I think are because this came forward as an agenda item and people maybe didn't, you know, they might have been concerned as to whether or not we were considering doing this, which we're not. Um, but, you know, as I stated before, I think that just kind of having these no declarations when we, when I think what's more positive is that we, you know, work with the county and community on these different topics so that, you know, we demonstrate to the community we're taking in your input, we're working with the county before we make any decisions uh, on how we're going to move ahead. I think that, in my opinion, would be the most appropriate way to move forward. I think, I think honestly, that's exactly what this is doing, is it's basically saying we um, want to work with the county, we want to work with the community, and that's why we're saying until we do that and have that process in place, then we, we don't support it kind of being done without that engagement. So I think it's sort of saying the same thing that you're hoping it's aspiring to reach that based on the qualifiers intention. that's yeah. been mentioned. Okay. Okay. Unless there's any further discussion, um, we'll go ahead and take the vote. What, what's the motion again? I, I, I'm about okay. Oh, I think you were transcribing it. I could come pretty close uh, for the time being as the county revisits its needle exchange and harm reduction programs, gathers data on uh, feasibility and effectiveness. The city um, advises the county that there be no safe injection sites within the city of Santa Cruz without prior city approval. There be no additional syringe exchange sites of all the other language without city approval. We do not support a secondary syringe exchange program without uh, uh, prior city council approval. Um, we intend to engage uh, actively with the county in their process as they move forward and be active partners. And we refer these items to the cash for their consideration. Okay. And does that reflect the second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We'll go. Why Council don't we just Khan? refer to the cash? And well, I I, have it come I made back. it very clear. I don't want this to become a primary focus for the cash. It's not exclusively a homeless problem, and I think where the main emphasis has to come is from the county health department. I think it's entirely appropriate to engage the cash in it, but not not uh, have the um, core recommendations for um, intensive controversial, bigger picture public health programs come uniquely from them. Engage them, but not have the responsibility rest. City Manager Martin Bernal, this is also, is, is this your understanding that the county is hearing this item in October? Is that right? Is that also? I'm sorry, uh, that they're what? The county is hearing this item, or they're gonna be addressing this item. Is this happening in October, do you know? There was an interest in hearing back from the county. Tuesday. I can give, October. I have they the may have agenda item here. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's October. They're, they're having community meetings, surveying, et cetera, completing the analysis um, in November, and we're bringing it to, in December. Perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then maybe we'll go ahead and take the vote. 
I'd just like to see if we, if there's any way we can separate the motion for the three bullet points from kind of the recommendations about how we'll engage with the county, community members, the catch, because I think that's really the big area of, of um, disconnect right now. I think that everybody here is really wanting to see us partner and work with the county and work with community members, work with the uh, harm reduction folks, work with the catch. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the, you know, these affirmative declarations of no to um, the different types of harm reduction is where we have the biggest um, disconnect. And so if we can just separate the motion from those bullet points from our intention to work with the county, I think we could probably get to some level of consensus. So you're just saying drop out all the bullet points. <laughs> yeah. You can't move yeah, meeting motion, but yeah. I, I guess, um, uh, you know, my I was in response to a comment that was made uh, multiple comments ago um, that the goal here is to say um, we want to be involved in the conversation um, and decision making before any of these things happen. That I can support, but we are saying um, we want to be involved in the conversation and no, 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 no to these. Okay. Um, and so to me, that just isn't a conversation starter to say yeah. no to everything, you know? Yeah. Let me rephrase a motion and then maybe we can vote it, on. I think because that's ultimately where you're at yeah. with it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, uh, as the county revisits its um, harm reduction programs, um, conducts community outreach and gathers data on feasibility and effectiveness of various programs. We intend to engage with the process uh, and um, um, let me see. Um, how do I want to phrase that? I want to engage in the process um, before. before consideration of safe injection syringe exchange sites or secondary syringe exchanges are considered and in any event would expect to have prior city approval for such programs. Yeah, that do it? Councilman, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to respond to the statement that was made about holding up the packet of emails. Uh, in going through the packet uh, that was provided with our agenda, yes, there are uh, letters that are opposed to or that are in support of this agenda item, but then there are also a, a litany of them that are not in support of this agenda item. Yeah. And in addition, the ones that are in support of this agenda item are littered with fallacies and poor data, uh, specifically encouraging us to go to a one-to-one -one system or for no needle distribution at all in Santa Cruz. So it's really problematic to see the reference to those emails being used to support <laughs> this motion uh, when we are supposed to be working off of data and uh, making informed decisions that will in fact benefit the health of the entire community because these emails are promoting things that will be detrimental to the public health of our community. So it's really important for us to be conscious, not just how many numbers of emails there are, but the context of those emails, the understanding of the people that are writing those emails, and then how that correlates to data and proven uh, examples of public health and safety around the issues of needle litter. Okay, so we have the motion revised with similar uh, intent. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, that, um, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time now until 7 p.m., which we'll have oral communications before our uh, evening item at 7.30 p.m. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cumming? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. It appears that we have space, but in the event that we do not, um, there will be extra seating available at the Tony Hill room this evening um, as well. So before we have our uh, regular agenda item um, for the evening session at 7.30, we will hear oral communications for the first half hour. And oral communications is an opportunity for the community um, to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. If I could get a sense of how many members are here that are wanting to speak to the council on an item that is not on today's agenda. 
Okay, if you can go ahead and line up to my left and you'll have up to two minutes and we will at attempt to conclude oral communications at 7.30 um, and hope to be able to hear everybody who wants to speak to us at this time. Please. <laughs> Council members, good evening. My name is Sue Powell. I am here to ask for your help in protecting the historic church at 111 Errant Circle from being torn down. One way that you can do this is to add an item to your next agenda to consider directing the Historic Preservation Commission to review the DPR 523 historic report for the property during a public meeting. The Circle Church is one of many historic buildings that is not included on the city's historic building index. Historic building surveys were published by the City of Santa Cruz in 1976, 1989, and 2013. While the history of the Circle Church goes back 130 years, the current church was built in 1958 and was eligible for historic consideration in 2013. However, the Circle Church was overlooked by the city's historic designation process. Younger churches in more affluent neighborhoods were included on the historic building index, but the Circle Church has been ignored. Because the Circle Church is not listed on the Historic Building Index, staff will not allow the Historic Preservation Commission to review the historic report submitted by the developers. The Historic Preservation Commission is very concerned about unlisted historic structures over 50 years old that are threatened with demolition. They have created a subcommittee to revise their bylaws so that they can be allowed to review submitted historic reports. They have seen that developers pay consultants to produce negligent and erroneous historic reports that do not support <coughs> preservation of our city's history and culture. Neighbors and friends um, of the Circle Church believe that the historic report and demolition permit application um, for the Circle Church should be reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission as an exception while the commission revises the current policy. The Circle Church is an iconic landmark like no other on the west coast of California. Please help us in our efforts to protect our heritage and culture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, I am Brett Garrett and um, there's something happening here in Santa Cruz that many of us consider to be very undemocratic. People are being paid at least $6 per signature and probably more to collect signatures for a recall petition. Do you know this would likely be illegal in Oregon, Arizona, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and even Florida? I'll admit I didn't look specifically whether all of these bans include um, recalls, but all of those states have some kind of ban on payment per signature for initiatives and the like. That's because payment per signature is undemocratic and it leads to problems, including police being called right here in Santa Cruz due to the belligerent behavior of some probably small number of people trying to get those valuable signatures. But there is hope for California. Assembly member Evelyn Lowe has a bill, AB 1451, that would illegalize paper signature in California. And this does include um, a ban that would apply to recall elections. AB 1451 has been approved by 72.5% of the assembly and 60% of the California Senate. In other words, the state legislature overwhelmingly agrees that payment per signature is undemocratic. This legislation now awaits Governor Newsom's signature, and I think we should all support it. And maybe, just maybe, this city council could quickly establish a maximum dollar amount for payment per signature in Santa Cruz. Because although we may all have different ideas about what what is excessive, I think all of us, most of us can agree that excessive payment per signature is undemocratic. And some of us feel the very concept of payment per signature is undemocratic. Please support AB 1451, thank you. I read from the Rose Report, recommendations page we'll go ahead and 88. Talk. I'm gonna go ahead and interrupt you for a moment. This is for items not on tonight's agenda. We will have an opportunity to address any of the contents of related to your comments in the report. Is the Rose Report listed on the agenda? It's a component as a recommendations in the second item on the, our evenings of business. Okay, then I will read from the respectful work co workplace conduct document 2-1B. Two two, that too is on um, this, this evening's agenda, so you'll have an opportunity to address the, the council at that time. Okay, next speaker, please. 
And this, just a reminder for those who are in the audience, this is an opportunity to address the council on any items not on today's agenda. Please. Yeah, hello City Council, Bruce Thomas, do four neighbors, I've been here before. I wanna just give you a quick update of what's going on to resolve the year long problems at the, on Dufour Street that were come about when the Blaze Pizza and the Starbucks opened. Uh, there's actually some positive news. Uh, we're getting some um, help from the transportation department and they're gonna come up with some recommendations that they will publish this Wednesday. Well, this thing keeps going in and out. I don't know what's up with that. But um, so anyways, I, I'm hopeful that we can reach some consensus among the neighbors and the businesses. They're, they're reaching out to all the stakeholders and they really do, I wanna commend the tra transportation department for really putting a lot of effort. And yeah, um, you guys have, two of the council members have seen the situation. So hopefully we'll address the, uh, load, the lack of a loading zone. The talk is putting it down further towards the residents so it will lead to a public process some notifications and um, it'll need consensus or it might actually end up as an appeal if it's appeal that could come back to the city council to really resolve fully all the problems with traffic flow and the loading zone. And um, yeah, I, and I really wanna reiterate, this all came about because of lapses in the planning process. This should not happen again. Plan new businesses should have de loading zones designated and I invite the public to go to hearings and make sure anything in their neighborhood does have a specified loading zone so they can not have to face what we've had to face on Dufour Street. Thank you. Good day, Councilman. My name's Brian Peoples. I'm the Executive Director of Trail Now. We're a local organization active in promoting effective transportation solutions. I'm here today to talk about you know, basically every day our community continues to be stuck in a traffic nightmare. Um, our transportation system is virtually shut down. Families try to travel to the store, travel to school. They, they can't do it, they're all suffering. So we're here asking our community leaders to begin looking at opening up the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail, not a decade from now, but today. And Trail Now has actually have proposed to have an interim trail without removing the tracks. Uh, Progressive Rail supports our proposed plan and we're bringing in the money, to, the funding to do it. So we're asking the political leadership to support opening up the corridor today. That, if you think about it, we're hearing about all this uh, climate change and the young demanding change. Well, you have a great opportunity. You have a phenomenal opportunity to take advantage of opening up the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. And one of the things that we don't really understand the value is the key transportation connections or the connectors that it does. It, and I guess the best example would be I live a half a mile from Valencia Elementary School. My wife's an elementary school teacher there. When the road closed, she had to go five miles around through the highway to get to the school. That's a transportation connection. And so that's what the world-class, world-class Santa Cruz Coastal Trail will be. So please, support Trail Now's proposal. We're trying to open it up. We're not asking for public money. Thank you very much. Hello, Gary Phillip. Uh, I object to, to uh, some of the words that were said earlier today about that cannabis uh, thing where there was uh, talk about uh, how women and people of color need to be uh, enabled to buy these places or something. And I didn't really hear the word opportunity. I'll check tape on that. But it kind of sounded like uh, at best, it was uh, assuming there's some reason why women and people of color can't buy a marijuana dispensary, uh, it, but you didn't really say what that is, and it was sort of uh, mysterious to me. Uh, I mean, to be sarcastic, it's not that leftist thing about how especially white men are f fascist, uh, you know, Nazi, racist, homophobic, sexist, uh, greedy capitalist pigs, not, not that, is it? I don't know, but, and, and at worst, you, it, you kind of imply a quota system which is as racist as anything there, and sexist as anything there is. Anyway, uh, think about that while I read as much as I can of this. 
which is not much. There's a damaging civil war of narratives in our country where leftists want to demean, divide, degrade, and replace American achievement with a shame blame. Ignoring the achievement of our moral evolution, ancient people are judged by modern standards. People of the past moralities are now either martyrs or oppressors and used as an indictment of the present as if today is the past. According to them, the country was founded only to destroy it, the Constitution written to validate slavery, and wealth is only produced by exploiting the poor. America is judged as a bad country by them. It is not 1961 or 1691. Surprise, it's 2019. Was America a country built by slavery or a country that overcame and abolished slavery at a cost of 600,000 lives? Is the U.S. a country of rampant discrimination or one of continually accepting more diverse people and cultures, if any? We have... Yeah. All right, next speaker. You're not in line? Okay, the speaker who's next then, please come forward. Good evening, Council. My name is Elise Casby. I'm a local community activist. I'm here tonight to make sure that the public and council members are aware. Um, the library apparently has been, uh, at least the downtown library, I'm not sure about the other branches, but I think it's a countywide situation, has been gathering data on patrons. And unfortunately, the patrons do not know this. Um, when you log into a computer at the library, it asks you a question about, do you mind um, that do cookies and you can say yes or no and you can read the privacy policy but uh, I want the council and the public to know that um, the staff became extremely concerned about the gathering of personal data through the computer system in our libraries and so they initiated a uh, grand jury investigation and report it has been on the county website it's listed as under the years 2018 and 2019, and the director of the library, Susan Nimitz, was required to respond to the report by September 23rd. So I don't know what, what her response was. I do want people to know that an extensive investigation was conducted, and if you're a techie, I hope you'll look into it because I'm not a techie, and most of it is pretty much Greek to me, I just scanned it. But the real reason that I'm also talking about this is because I happen to have inside information that hundreds of library books per month are being dumpstered. Most of the books that are being dumpstered, the public that are donating the books don't know this. A good many of the books are being dumpstered for a good reason, they're old, some of them are not the kind of books that should be kept. But most of the books are intellectual history and things that be cumulatively would make up our cultural history. Members of the community and council members, um, Huff has watched, that's Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, has watched the old guards cavalcade of distraction for the last nine months as the unhoused population has swelled on the streets. The council minority and the staff have ignored the most basic shelter and health needs of those outside, choosing instead to find failed, costly, and face-saving measures to harass and disperse homeless people who gather for safety and community. The city manager and his staff have lied to the community, disgraced us all before the courts, and betrayed the homeless population with endless, broken promises. I'm looking at Susie O'Hare in the audience, not as a personal matter, but because she is a staff member responsible for a lot of these lies. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the time. I'm just gonna remind you, you're welcome to address the council. I the am addressing you, and I'm addressing okay. you about Susie O'Hara and the staff, okay? Because okay? I think she has to be held accountable for the statement she's made and that this council has followed. I would remind Council Member Cummings that he was going to hold her accountable four months ago, and I still haven't seen that accountability come up. False narratives such as the recall narrative, the $18,000 investigation narrative, the civility narrative, and the homeless menace narrative, these divert attention from real issues while renters are being forced out and homeless are freezing outside. 
The progressives and their supporters have gone along with this toxic narrative diversion by not demanding that Watkins restore items to the council agenda and insist on procedural and substantial changes. Glover's supporters have urged Glover to trim his sails, speak softly, and walk on eggshells. This is a losing strategy. It betrays both the voters who put them in office, him in office, and his colleague, and those who are counting on their strength, not their submissiveness. My name is Alicia Cole, president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to let everyone know in the community that um, recently our lawsuit was dismissed regarding the Ross camp. But at our last court date, the judge advised both the city and the plaintiffs to meet and confer regarding settlement. And I wanted everyone to know that we provided a letter signed by all the plaintiffs giving us the right to negotiate settlement, Anthony Prince and myself, and it was completely ignored um, twice by the city. And so an offer to meet and settle was never, it was a choice basically not to discuss that with us. And so unfortunately, that decision is likely going to lead to further litigation. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's where we're at right now. Um, and I also wanted everyone to know that there are still no showers at the city sanctioned 1220 River Camp. That's where the people that were uh, displaced from the Ross Camp were intended to go, at least 60 of the 200, and they still haven't gotten any showers. And that is the camp that the city is is responsible for along with the Salvation Army. And I think that we can do better. So please, I'm asking you to pay attention to that and do better. And meanwhile, you have everyone else that was not uh, placed anywhere and they could use motel vouchers, some laundry vouchers and things of that nature. Thank you. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. I'm wearing this uh, flower sticker that's passed out tonight because I'm told that it merely calls for civility and I'm all for that. It does not promote any other agenda beyond civility. That's why I'm wearing this. Um, where do I start? We've got, uh, <laughs> I can always count on somebody to bail out when I come up to speak because they don't want to hear what I'm going to say. Although, of course, they have to go wee wee. I typically will introduce a very tab, probably, possibly the most taboo subject of all, and that is the undue influence that the Israel lobby has on all of us, both domestically and uh, in our foreign policy. Uh, for years now, the Democrats have been going after uh, Trump, who I'm no fan of, incidentally, because of his alleged collusion with the Russians, well, the Israel lobby has orders of magnitude more influence on both uh, Trump and the Democrats. Nancy Pelosi actually said that even if our capital crumbled into ruins, she, her top priority would still be aid, and she says, I don't even call it that, our cooperation with Israel. Can you imagine that's, ab that's outright treason? Who called her on it? No one, no one, but she said that. Everything I say up here is the absolute truth to my best ability to say it. Garrett uh, Hardin took a cheap shot at me recently and I responded by saying, show me where I'm wrong. Just simply, if you don't like what I say, I'll be glad to discuss it with you. Show me where I'm wrong. Because the fact is, uh, each Israeli gets 7,000 times per capita more foreign aid than the average inhabitant of the world. That Next is a speaker, fact. Your time is Jim Jensen, uh, Mission Hill, and that's a tough clown show to follow. Um, I'd like to comment on a project on North Pacific that go I- Go ahead and pause the time. But I'm gonna go ahead and remind the community that this is an opportunity to listen to 
the person who has the microphone for two minutes, we may not always agree with each other, often we don't, but we will respectfully listen and hear to them. Go right ahead. Thank you. Well, I found out in the uh, Sentinel earlier this week that there is a new development proposed on North Pacific Avenue. And as a resident of the Mission Hill neighborhood, we were not noticed on said development. Um, it's very close to us. It's a, a easy underhand throw for my house. And the um, people that are uh, maintain the hill who that the, in the article said the hill would have to be made, uh, modified they found out about it in the paper as well. So what I'd like to do is ask that when the planning department notices about the North Pacific project, that Mission Hill gets noticed as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Charles Vasky, uh, <coughs> a longtime Santa Cruz resident. Uh, during this week of climate action, and as we see younger folks hold our leaders to account, we also see inaction at the national level. And though we, we must resist nationally, we can and must act locally. Transportation is our largest source of emissions. Both Santa Cruz's Climate Action Plan and the California Air Resources Board agree we must reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. Only systematic action can change this. Local governments plan where people can live and work and what modes of transport are allowed. And only you, our local government, can change this. Every day we go without dense housing in Santa Cruz, we force more of our workers to live further away from town. Every day we disallow dense low carbon living, we build more housing on green fields where nobody files sequel lawsuits. We cannot claim to be environmentalists and also deny dense infill housing. Future councils or future generations look to this city council to ask why it has not been done already. I urge you to please take speedy action on our land use, um, not eventually, not next year, but this year. Thank you. Hi, my name is Will Mullen. I'm the uh, City of Santa Cruz Junior Lifeguard Lieutenant. Um, so I know what it's like to represent the city um, and to represent the community and to be a voice for not only the kids, but um, just a voice for the city and to represent it well for everybody that uh, comes in and out of here. Um, I didn't really prepare anything to say, um, but I know what I'm going to talk about and I feel like there's a narrative um, with homeless people and homeless issues and it's become a very uh, personal thing for me because there's a lot of people in this room that want to speak about things like that and they haven't ever been homeless. I have been in situations like that and I feel like we've become very detached from what that all means and what we need to do to help those people because those people are people just like you, just like me. Um, because I was one of those people I'm not, I'm not trying to get emotional about it, but it is an emotional thing. And I think everybody should look deep down inside their own hearts to realize that this is personal for all of us and the homeless people in our community are us. It's not an us versus them kind of thing. And it's become this, oh, well, they're all, they're this and they're that and they're that. Well, even if they were, which a lot of them aren't even, um, they're still us, they're still you, they're still me. Um, homelessness can cause drug abuse, which can cause mental health issues. Mental health can cause homelessness, which causes drug abuse. And that like three-headed beast, the cookie can crumble anyway, um, just from there. So those, these people are just like you and I, they're just oftentimes a lot less fortunate. So I think with whatever decisions we make regarding that, um, we need to keep that in our hearts and in our minds instead of making it uh, about we're deciding for these other people that really have the same rights as we do and should have a voice just like we do. So that's all I wanted to say. I realize I am going to speak because it's not on the agenda tonight. Um, my name is Olivia Boyce Abel, and I'm here to talk to you about the recall petition. And it's just come to my attention in the last hour and a half that there are actually people who are coming from San Jose being paid eight to nine hundred dollars to come table and then leave. And they're trying to break apart our diverse community. And I love the representation that we have right now. I really appreciate each one of you. And I want to say that piece so that you have that piece of information. And I really support my friends. Yeah. 
Good evening. My name is Aide Guerrero. I am the program associate at Santa Cruz Community Ventures. Our work focuses on creating compassionate and equitable local economies that contribute to the well-being of our communities. Um, in 2018, Santa Cruz Community Ventures and UC Santa Cruz Blum's Center explored local Latina mothers' experiences with traditional and alternative financial services. Our study examined mothers' experiences with financial providers and mapped the location of alternative and traditional financial services, showing the disproportionate concentration of predatory lenders in Watsonville, California, compared to Santa Cruz, California. Some key findings included mothers used alternative financial services to pay for necessities, deal with emergencies, and to build credit. Alternative lenders were often perceived as easier to access than mainstream banks due to fewer requirements for legal documents and a social security number. Mothers without a social security number reported difficulty opening a bank account or obtaining a bank loan, even if they had an individual taxpayer identification number. Hidden, confusing, and unexpected fees were identified as significant obstacles to using mainstream banking services. Watsonville has over twice as many alternative, alternative lenders as the city of Santa Cruz. Mothers have a working knowledge of budgeting and, save, and saving and share this knowledge with each other. If you would like to learn more, more, learn more about our study, visit our website at secvonline.org or please contact the SECV team member. In addition, Santa Cruz Community Ventures would like to invite you to a conversation about predatory lenders in the city of Watsonville. The conversations will take place on October 15th at the Civic Community Plaza starting at 9 a.m. and invitations will be sent out soon. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, members of the council. Um, I know many of you from my work uh, as a council member in Capitola, but tonight I'm here before you in my role as the Senior Associate of Government Relations for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. I'm here to invite you to join us for our 15th annual Applied Materials Silicon Valley Turkey Trot, which was founded and directed by our Silicon Valley Leadership Group Foundation. This year's goal is mission one million. As you all know, there's tremendous need in our region and our goal is to donate $1 million from this year's race alone to five regional nonprofits that help families in need. One of those five is the Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Cruz County. To put our ambitious goal in perspective, for the last five years, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group Foundation has donated annually between $905,000 and $936,000 to, to these nonprofits. This year, we'd like to close the gap and make it a million. One of the ways that we can accomplish this goal is with you. Through our Sand Hill Property Company, Mayor's Cup Community Challenge. Our Mayor's Cup rewards mayors, council members, and city managers who register for our race either in person or through our remote runners category. So if you can't be there on Thanksgiving Day, you have other commitments, you can still sign up as a remote runner, take a jog around your block after your, uh, your meal, uh, should you celebrate that day, and it still counts. We've heard from numerous council members that we should also include points for outreach from you and your city. So your points will be awarded for turkey tot trot related outreach posts and newsletters, e-newsletters, e and social media. Uh, if you would like to champion these efforts on behalf of your council, I'm leaving behind point scoring sheets, posters, and flyers for your use, use here at City Hall. And together we believe that we can achieve this goal of $1 million going to nonprofits to serve those most in need in our region. I thank you all for your service to our community and we hope that you will support us in our turkey trot this year. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Darius Mosening. Before you get started, I just want to go ahead and we are going to come towards the end. I will go till 735 with oral communications. If we don't get to everybody, I apologize. If there's those that are still here at the end of the night, we could revisit that potentially. But um, you're always welcome to get your information. But we'll go to 735 this evening before we start our evening item. Go right ahead. Oh, excellent segue. I'm just here to ask the mayor and the future mayor to be to um, we, the public, a city of 60, over 62,000 people, over 32, whatever, thousand registered voters, we have precious 60 minutes per month to address you directly when you're in session. I would just implore you, ask you, I don't think it's a violation of a Brown Act uh, or any other perhaps public um, meeting acts to have people focus on city business when they go to public comment. Already we've run out of time. And items like 
creeping fascism in America, 9-11 conspiracy theories. Save that for Alex Jones. But if we could just maybe use the sure. powers accorded to you as a mayor to maybe quash on this discussion for truly city business so we can get through this long line of folks. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker. I make a motion to dissolve this council for ineffective government. I make a motion to appoint Councilman Glover mayor of Santa Cruz. <laughs> Councilman, Glover, Councilman Glover, we know you're our leader and you be putting in good work. Councilman Glover, as our mayor, won't be worse than what we have here now. If there are things people don't like about Santa Cruz, these are the humans on why those negative things are happening in Santa Cruz. And that's why I say we should get rid of them somehow. Um, Councilman Glover, I hope you'll be our mayor real soon. Councilman Glover will do the research, he'll find the funding, and he'll make Santa Cruz a better place for everybody. <laughs> Can you feel my yearning for good government? Councilman Glover, save us. <laughs> well, you're all duly elected officials, um, Councilman Crone, Councilman Glover included, and there, I want you to know that there are residents in the fluent areas of town that are appalled at the public shaming that you intend to follow through with tonight of these two individuals. But go ahead and pause your comments. I think I'm it's not go ahead. quite this my turn not, yet. This is, my, no, no, I'm gonna okay, go ahead and pause so your comments. You'll have an opportunity to address At the, the end of the evening, yeah. in order to stop me from saying what so many people you can, feel. You can, okay. You, you could you, have waited for the buzzer, but you wanted to stop me No, 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 you'll have an opportunity it. to address the council At the end of the topic, evening. At public comment as it relates to that item. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's for oral communication. I, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and ask that those in the audience to please be quiet. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's oral communications. This is for items not on today's agenda. And so this is an item that's on tonight's agenda, which you'll have during public comment to address the council. So if you don't have any other comments, we'll go ahead that's and invite you up then. That's the subject. Okay. We'll go ahead and have uh, maybe the last two uh, here as our final and go ahead and come forward for oral communications. Items not on today's agenda. Go right ahead. Is about the record that's here or not? No, this is not. Well, okay, this is, this, if you wanted to address the recall, which is not on today's agenda, you're welcome to do that. The censure item is coming up next. Okay. Go right ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Beverly Deschaux. Um, I wanted to say I get it about if somebody speaks to you in a way that you find not okay and that you wouldn't be okay to meet with them in private because it might continue. And um, because I've been in that situation among many people who claim to be feminists and who claim to be nonviolent communicators and all of that, and they still do that. But anyway, so uh, I'm glad that there's a process in place now. But what's happened, so, I appreciate also, Mayor, that you came around and listened to various groups on health and all. And I didn't say this at the time, but in a room of 14 people, there were three others who did say it, and I wanted, because I wanted to say more, and I didn't want to call you out in public, but right now, um, what's happening with the recall, it's like a runaway train. It has taken on a whole life of its own, having nothing to do with the original 
uh, complaint. And um, I think that we who feel victimized by something need to do better and be really powerful and just take it on. And I think that if you were to come out, and I don't know if you've been advised that it might be political suicide, but to come out and say, I renounce what's going on with this crazy recall. I know you didn't make it, but somebody, people are making it. I have been personally harassed unbelievably just trying to go to the grocery store, and they are going around and telling big fat lies so they can get paid. So I ask for you to publicly renounce it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close oral communication. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end oral communications. Oral com communications has been concluded. We are going to now move on to our evening item. And uh, Councilmember Glover. Um, I, I, I'm curious to see how many more people came for oral communications. Well, we have an evening item at 7.30, so as um, sort of my duty to ensure that we're moving our agenda forward and we allocate generally 30 minutes, we've gone over a bit for oral communications. I'm going to go ahead and close oral communications at this time. So just seeing that there were um, people on the TV may not be able to see, but there were three hands. So I would move that we extend public comment for an additional six minutes. I'll second that. <laughs> There's a motion by Council Member Crone. Second. Second by Council Member uh, Crone. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 Okay, for how much longer? Six minutes. Okay, you get, we'll have six additional minute, uh, minutes. Before you get started, who are the additional two? Tyler and Okay, you'll have, we'll have six minutes, go ahead. Okay. First of all, I wanna to apologize to the to the mayor for last time that I spoke when I called your name. Um, what happened was I was I was planning on saying three adjectives and they weren't nearly as bad. <laughs> and when I got cut off mid-sentence, I got flustered and I tried to combine the three adjectives into one word. I am sorry that word flew out of my mouth, so I wanna let you know that. I wanna speak about um, your report on your, your sp on homelessness <laughs> regarding preventing homelessness. And I'm confused because you didn't vote for rent control and rent control has caused a lot of people to go. If, you, if we had voted for rent control, there would be a lot less people being homeless. Also, you wanted to send out a letter to oppose a bill that prevents your car being towed for unpaid tickets or lapse registration. And that also was a way to end um, some of, to prevent homelessness. I watched a person over 60 and his girlfriend who was waiting for hip replacement get stopped and for expired, um, expired uh, registration. And I pled with um, Chief Mills to please, please do not tow their car. And his response was maybe they can go to the county. Now they're homeless on the streets. And if you can imagine what it's like to have bone on bone and you're outside. Um, also, let's talk about affordable housing. Affordable housing is not affordable for the working class. So that well also would prevent homelessness. So I could go on and on, but I'm gonna be cut off any second. So I'd like to know the actual plans you have to prevent homelessness. Okay, next speaker. Hello. Okay, I guess that's the start for me. Hello everyone, um, my name's Tyler, and I wanted to just come up and really quickly paint a, uh, a picture of um, 15 years from now, so let's call that 2035. Uh, the United States has recently entered a recession because of a failing confidence in the American ability to pay debt because America's economy is no longer able to run because everything has dropped out the bottom line. 
The bottom line being the fact that there is no more environment actually to live upon. Downtown has been flooded because sea levels have risen so that way we can't even meet here in this city hall room anymore. In fact, we had to move up, possibly to Scotts Valley. Uh, there are refugees coming from the houses that used to be here. There are refugees coming from North County fires, fires in Scotts Valley, fires in, I don't know, Ben Lomond, basically. Where are they gonna go? Of course, they're gonna go in the city center where the resources are. And then there are also droughts happening for small farmers out in Watsonville. And of course, without any water to actually grow your crops, you end up becoming something like a refugee in Santa Cruz. When that happens, we have a new idea of what democracy is. Democracy doesn't look like people coming to the city council chambers to complain about, I don't know, personalities or something that doesn't really matter a whole lot. Democracy looks like people throwing bricks through windows and stomping down on cars because there's absolutely no answers in what looks like democracy today. So I would encourage everyone to start thinking about what does it really look like to talk about solutions and not really just people. Um, and I would also encourage everyone to start to think of how we might be able to actually organize in different ways so that the massive amount of resources that are in Santa Cruz can actually be utilized in the way that is possible. One possible start would be to come to the democracy teaching tomorrow at five, from five to nine uh, in Loudon Nelson. And another way is probably not to engage in something like a recall, thank you. Hi, my name is James Ewing. I live in the Live Oak neighborhood. Um, about the last five weeks, I've really been making an observation of how much cleaner the city of Santa Cruz is. And I know there's still a lot of messes to clean up, but I know everyone in this room, in front of me and behind me, is for everything getting kind of cleaned up. Just what I want to say. Thank you. Okay. Right. I think that's our last speaker. So before we start this evening's um, item, I have a brief announcement. Next week on October 8th, our meeting um, for oral communications will take place at 6 p.m. to end at 6.30 p.m. in observance of Yon Kipper per council policy 14.6. So just a, a note. Um, we're gonna have maybe a few minutes of transition before, maybe we'll take a two minute um, transition time. We, it has been brought to my attention that we are at capacity in this room and um, those who are here for oral communications who want to um, take this transition moment to um, leave are free to do so at this time. If you're interested in staying, then we're going to need to clear some of the chambers and ask some of the folks to either step outside where we have our speakers on or to uh, make their way over to the Tony Hill room, which is also available. And then we'll return back for our evening item as soon as we're able to get into um, adherence with our uh, fire marshals uh, uh, directive at this point. So uh, we'll go ahead and break for a transition for the next few minutes and uh, make sure we're in compliance. Go ahead. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and call uh, our meeting back into session. If I could get your attention. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Councilmember Crone. Just make um, sure she's okay. Sure. It's a gavel. I know. I was about to say, yeah, exactly. True. Just every once in a while. I'm going to ask for your attention. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting back into session. Okay. Coffee. All right, we're gonna go ahead, if I can get your attention. Thank you, I appreciate, I appreciate your attention. So it's my understanding that we're, we're good to go at this, at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind the community that this evening's item, as with many items, can often feel divisive and there's gonna be areas and times where you don't necessarily agree with the person who's speaking. I want to respectfully request that even if you disagree with somebody, that you are able to listen to them, and I will do my best to ensure decorum so that nobody feels intimidated to come forward and speak to our council, regardless of what they have to say, without threat and, and intimidation. If I do see an individual um, <coughs> disrupting tonight's proceedings, I will uh, give you a verbal warning. 
if I have to um, ask you again, I will ask you to leave. Um, it's my responsibility as the presiding officer um, to ensure that our process is um, fair, is uh, safe, and we are able to adhere to the decorum. And I will do the best, that to the best of my ability this evening. Um, I want to um, go ahead and announce that item and then I'll go ahead and turn it over to Councilmember Myers to introduce it. So we have two items on tonight's uh, evening. The first item was brought forward uh, by two council members and it is in regards to the censure of Councilmember Chris Crone and Councilmember Drew Glover. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Councilmember Myers to introduce the item. Uh, thank you, Mayor Watkins. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to introduce this item. Uh, Council Member Matthews and I have brought this item with two components. The first is a censure of Council Member Chris Crone and Council Member Drew Glover for violation of one of the most important policies governing our city, that of a respectful workplace environment. And secondly, direction to staff to review and revise that policy in the light of this recent experience. I will note that our direction concerning the policy review is specifically <coughs> regarding council members and commissioners, and this differs from the direction in item 18 later on in our agenda. Councils have censured council members twice in recent times, and we believe this is an appropriate action we have brought before the council tonight. We ask our colleagues to consider this censure carefully as it represents a statement that we as a body acknowledge that our colleagues have violated our respectful workplace conduct policy, which is consistent with state law. Also importantly, this censure acknowledges that five complainants were involved in filing 13 different complaints. None of the complaints were found to be false and two were found to be in violation. All of the complainants were women. For background for our community, the city's respectful workplace conduct policy was adopted in 2017 in accordance with state law. Accompanying it is an administrative procedure order that establishes behavioral and workplace standards to support a culture of collaboration, inclusion, and productivity within the city. These standards apply to all city council members as well. On January 16, 2019, as part of the League of California Cities Conference in Sacramento for new council members, myself, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Council Member Glover all attended a training in work respectful workplace policy, specifically in regards to Assembly Bill 202053. That training was delivered by a set of attorneys with expertise in both harassment, harassment and workplace, respectful workplace policy. At the same conference, I spoke with Council Member Glover over dinner about his use of derogatory remarks to members of the council. I explained at that evening with him my discomfort in beginning our professional relationship with such negative language. The city's respectful workplace policy provides definitions, responsibilities, and examples of disrespectful behavior including repeated use of derogatory remarks or insults, berating, insulting, and being disruptive. The policy importantly states that all persons are required to behave respectfully and to refrain from disrespectful behaviors, and most importantly, to not condone or ignore disrespectful conduct to employees, volunteers, council members, commissioners, customers, contractors, and visitors to our city. <coughs> Have a time okay, I'm going to go ahead and What pause. our vote will say tonight to our community will set a standard on how we view treatment of our colleagues, our staff, community members, business owners, and government partners. I hope our entire council will take the step tonight that recognizes these violations are serious and merit formal censure. Indeed, the city manager was very clear that we as the city council are the only body that can formally say no to this behavior. Council Member Crohn's and Glover's behavior was duly investigated. Each of them was found to have clearly violated the policy, and none of the 13 complaints were found to be false. No one who works at or with the city of Santa Cruz should be worried about interacting with a council member. I will tell my colleagues tonight that this body is 
very damaged at this point in the eyes of our community. I've had many community members, parents, families, and individuals tell me that they will not come to a city council meeting for fear of how they will be treated. Our democracy is at risk in this very chamber when our community, our staff, parents, families, and our business and government partners do not feel safe engaging in our democratic process. I believe strongly that this item deserves an up or down vote, um, that this item deserves public comment, and we have, had, we have many members of the public here to speak on this island item. Uh, if there are any efforts to table the item or postpone it, not only would that be improper misuse or misuse of procedure, but would be a cynical effort to squash debate and silence women in our community. Uh, that's all I've got to say to open the item. Uh, Council Member Matthews, if you'd like to add any comments. I'd like to add just a few words. And I'm, I'm really speaking from the heart tonight. So, I'm gonna go ahead and- Oh, really? Just, I'm no, gonna go ahead please. and wait just a moment. <laughs> Council Member Matthews, if you could just for a second. I again wanna re just remind the community that we will have an opportunity to hear from you. This is an opportunity for the two council members to bring this item forward and they can present their item. I am going to immediately open up public comment after that, so we'll hear from you and then we'll go ahead and return back for action, okay? So we will hear and we'll have an opportunity to hear and we'll listen to you respectfully and we'll ask that you listen Listen to others respectfully. Again, if I see somebody disrupting the proceedings, I will ask you to stop and I will give you a warning. And if it continues to happen, I will ask you to leave. Everybody has an opportunity to speak, including the council members who are um, sharing their item at this time. Go right ahead. Thank you. I wanted to start by saying that uh, many people in the community, people here tonight, have uh, made a direct correlation between this item on our agenda and the recall process. And I want to say for me personally, these are absolutely different things. <laughs> I have to say that's discouraging. I'm going to go on. For me, they are two different things. I would say I. I, I look out, I know a lot of you out there, and I have worked with a lot of you on a lot of different issues. And I respect you, and I treasure the fact that I have been able to work with so many people on so many issues over the year and do good things for our community. Tonight, what we're dealing with is a separate matter. To me, this represents completion and closure of the city's process of accepting investigating, reporting on, and responding to violations of city policy. In this case, there were multiple complaints filed by several women alleging violation of the city's respectful workplace policy. As is appropriate, these complaints were investigated, in this case by an independent third party, <coughs> and two of the complaints were upheld. If these complaints had been upheld against a city employee, there would have been an appropriate level of recourse uh, internally from a reprimand to firing, depending on the severity and the circumstances. But in this case, the complaints were not against staff, they were against counsel. In this case, because the complaints were upheld against elected council members, the remedy lies with us in the hands of the council. As has been mentioned, this is not the first time the council has censured one of its members. It's happened at least twice, to my knowledge, for different reasons. I personally think it's important that we lead by example in our conduct towards one another and towards our staff. A workplace where harassment, disrespect, and bullying take place cannot function at its full potential. In fact, this very point was made in the most recent issue of Western City. This is the monthly magazine of the League of California Cities. The featured article is entitled, It Starts With Civility, Elected Officials' Role in Attracting and Retaining Employees. And it goes on to talk about the importance of elected's um, behavior in gaining the confidence of the public. That's why we have this policy, and that's why the state law as well has codified the principles of a respectful workplace. Now I would like to respond in these comments. The, the complaints that have been filed that we're dealing with tonight were all filed by women. In this case, 
that was the pattern. But a respectful workforce policy is important across the board. When you think about it, if we observe bullying, disrespectful behavior, or similar action against someone on the basis of race, sexual orientation, national origin, citizenship status, we immediately think that's not right. We would readily agree that such behavior should be reported, investigated, and have consequences. I would say that's the case regardless of any individual characteristics. It's a good general principle to have to behave in a respectful manner. Some people have maintained in the course of this conversation that civility is a false ideal, that passionately, uh, passionately fighting for a cause trumps civility or a respectful interaction. That may be true in some cases. But here, we share a common workplace, and we live together in a community. We run into each other in the course <coughs> of daily life, at the grocery store, walking along West Cliff Drive, at our kids' soccer games. I believe it's important to maintain the social connection that keeps our community together in the face of the vitriolic example set at the national level. These are my reasons for co-signing and supporting the measure before us. In my mind, this brings to closure a very unhappy period in our council's relations. I fervently hope and I will work to forge respectful, productive relations between council and staff and help restore the public's confidence in our ability to do our job. The time now is to move forward. Thank you. I'd like so to make a motion to table this so I that we can move on. I didn't acknowledge you. Yeah, I had a feeling you. that so would happen. I, I'd like to make that officer, motion, though. Second. I didn't um, acknowledge you. So as the presiding officer... I'd like officer, to make an appeal, then. I'm going to go ahead... Uh, you, I'm going to go ahead and ask... I, I, I'm sorry, but I have consulted um, with the city attorney, and city I attorney can make Kandani, an appeal to that. I will go ahead and ask uh, for your advice on this. Um, my understanding is it takes the presiding officer to acknowledge uh, a council member to speak. If the presiding officer does not acknowledge that person, then, then they can make an appeal to the council to override the presiding officer. Um, at that time, then we can go ahead and take a motion or potentially hear what the uh, motion before us will be. Um, but it takes uh, the presiding officer to rule on a point of order, and uh, there was not a violation of rules, nor did I acknowledge Councilmember Brown on this item. I'll quote directly from the rule. The presiding officer shall preserve strict order and decorum at all meetings of the council, announce the council's decision on all subjects and decide all questions of order <clears throat> in accordance with the procedural rules for motions and debate and announce the council's vote on all actions or direct city administrator to do so. If there is an appeal to a decision of the presiding officer, the council as a whole shall decide the question by majority vote. Okay. Any council member with the exception of the presiding officer may move to appeal a decision of the presiding officer. If the appeal motion is seconded by another council member, the council shall vote on the appeal. Okay. So my, my I will go ahead and um, respond as the presiding officer. I did not acknowledge council member Brown um, and I feel that the community has been wanting to address this on this item. And it's my interest to hear from the community and have a public comment on this item and to not use the parliamentary process to um, just delay that potential discussion and ability of the community to speak to us on this item. I'm, my, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that um, my colleagues respect me. You can appeal my decision if you do, do so choose. You're welcome to do that. But I have the opportunity to um, rule on this and to explain my logic on this. So I respectfully ask that you adhere to the processes in that way. I will um, go ahead and um, not move forward with acknowledging Councilmember Brown. She is welcome to appeal. I would like to hear public comment on this item. And if there is uh, interest in this majority of council in overriding my decision and not allowing the community to speak to us or to have us hear this item, then that's the majority's decision. So that's my ruling. I move to appeal. Second. Okay, there's a motion to appeal the ruling that I just made on the point of order. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, um, Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilmember Brown. Okay, so Councilmember Brown. That was an appeal of the of, of the ruling of the of the um, mayor's decision not to recognize the council member. Um, so there has been a motion made. I presume the motion would be motion to table. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. 
Okay, that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown. I'm gonna ask for order. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead and have, all right, go ahead and, I'm gonna go ahead and ask everybody to, okay, if we could all just, why don't we all just take a moment, please, thank you. We still have another item on tonight's agenda that we're, we will be moving forward with at this time. Um, this is the second item on tonight's agenda. It's brought forward to us by the staff. I'm gonna go ahead and ask those who are no, not interested in uh, staying for the second item to feel free to exit the chambers. Those that are interested in staying in um, the chambers tonight for the second item, you're welcome to stay. I will ask that you adhere to our rules of decorum. Item. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you adhere to the rules of decorum and not shout out. Um, Ms. Hockman, please. We uh, will begin the second item, and I will announce the title of the item when the, when the transition has taken place, okay? Okay, so the second, on, uh, the second item on tonight's agenda is the City Council's um, uh, City Council Investigation Recommendation Implementation, and this is brought forward by uh, City Manager Martin Bernal and um, HR Director uh, Lisa Murphy, who will be presenting on the item. The order of this will go that we'll have a presentation from staff, we'll have questions from the council, we'll open it up to public comment, and we'll return back for action and deliberation. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to staff at this time. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I was gonna do a brief introduction and then turn it over to uh, our Human Resources Director, Lisa Murphy, to go over the actual recommendations. Um, I simply wanted to do a, a brief uh, uh, presentation on, focused really on, on moving forward. Um, I ask that you please you know, not take uh, what I'm presenting as uh, accusatory or blaming in any way. Uh, my intent is to present what uh, we can all do to improve our ability to govern, and, and that's, that'll be my focus. So, I mean, clearly the, the report, the investigative report clearly shows a need to improve our environment amongst council members and between council members and staff. And, you know, it has had an impact. Uh, there's no doubt that it, that it has the environment on staff morale in particular, which is of concern to me and our ability to attract and retain employees. And uh, so it's important that we sort of move forward. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, HR director represents some recommendations regarding that to improve uh, our, our circumstances and situation here. Um, but again, I'd like to focus on how we can govern effectively. <laughs> and there are, you know, attributes of uh, exceptional city councils that we can all follow and we can do, we can, we can all do better in, in this regard. Uh, and I just wanted to just focus a little bit on those because I think that would be helpful, again, if we focus on how we can improve ourselves to govern more effectively. So there, are, and I'm going by, you know, uh, some of the, the League of California Cities and uh, other organizations that put together these attributes that I think are important, I think, for all of us to recognize. Um, and we do well in some of these areas and not so well in some of these areas. Uh, and I'll go over them really quickly. And, and these are the six, and I'm just gonna go through each one uh, individually. So the first is uh, teamwork. And, and really there it's for each other, each other to really work uh, together as a team uh, and, and to further a common purpose. And that really is not just council amongst each other, but also uh, staff and the council and the community to the extent possible. Um, and working in a coordinating collaborate manner is, is, is more effective than doing the opposite in general. Uh, and for that, you need a high degree of respect, trust, and openness. And that's the way you can really do that. Um, and, and if you don't have that, then you're not gonna be able to have teamwork and, and, and be able to work collaboratively in particular. Um, but it also takes having some, obviously some tolerance. You know, we have to have, we have to value diversity, differences of styles, different perspectives. Uh, and for that, you have to have, uh, you know, you have to be respectful, but also we have to think about uh, and act strategically, uh, really, as far as serving the city's mission and goals, you know, thinking about the big picture, because that's why we're here, uh, to really govern and to be strategic and to try to achieve goals and mission and the mission of our city. So teamwork is just really critical, really, to any functioning organization and to be able to be productive. Uh, 
The other is having clear roles and responsibilities. Um, and, and there are different roles that we each have. You know, as policymakers, you have a role to represent the values, the beliefs, and the priorities of the community, and I know you know that. Uh, while serving in the community's best interest, but that means listening and having trade-offs, you set the policy and uh, the vision for the city, and uh, it's best to avoid micromanagement. Uh, because the, the city manager's responsibility is to do the day-to-day -day operations, and, and that's really critical to the functioning of, of our local government, um, and to hold me accountable, quite frankly. So, and also it's important to recognize you know, the subject matter expertise of staff and to utilize their knowledge and experience to guide and inform our decision-making. Um, it's, it's part of the decision-making process. Uh, you don't always have to uh, go with it, that's okay, but I think it's important to at least recognize it and support it. Um, and, and recognize that they're here to help you and to help the community uh, and to be professional in that regard. To honor the relationship with staff and each other. Um, again, that's critically important uh, to be able to have good working relationships uh, between each other uh, and with the staff and yourselves individually and as a group. Um, and to really respect each other with, with uh, dignity and, and, and respect. Um, and act in a, with civility and a high level of professional decorum is important uh, uh, in order to be able to do that um, and to listen and to, to really listen uh, and to allow people to, to express their opinions and uh, to contemplate and, and analyze and, and before jumping ahead and making decisions or judgments. Uh, that's, that's really critical. Um, and I think, you know, council members, it's important, you know, that uh, you build trust by not playing the gotcha game and, and to strive to not have secrets or surprises, you know, at our meetings here. We want to be transparent. We want, the idea here is to be able to make good decisions by working together and having that trust, uh, not by uh, trying to s s scheme or somehow figure out a way to sort of make each other look bad or to make a point uh, for some al alternative reason. That's just not... It's just not good overall. Obviously, that doesn't help to build trust, right, uh, moving forward. Uh, and again, uh, here too, I, I mentioned this before, but respecting different styles and perspectives is, is, is just really critical and important, and to being open to new ideas. Uh, again, that means, again, listening. Effective meetings, I know this is something that uh, you were probably not very well known for. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's hard in the public sector to do this, to have effective meetings in this kind of environment, in this kind of form. It's just, um, just basically, it's, it's kind of, it's just hard uh, in, in, in a setting like this when you have to do everything in public. But it is important nonetheless to adhere to meeting protocols and processes, and, and we're all working to do that, and to, to plan and to organize agendas and to develop you know, more focused meetings to the extent that we can, uh, because then it allows us to really focus on the business of the community and to allocate your time more appropriately for the things that you really have to prioritize, um, which is our goals and responsibilities and priorities. And of course, that, that has to be balanced with honoring public participation and engagement. That's, that's important too, and we work to do that all the time. Obviously, being prepared in advance and focusing on really our goals and objectives is, is, is super critical to having effective meetings and being able to uh, feel like you've accomplished, uh, made accomplishments and are moving forward. Um, and again, demonstrating respect and civility with each other and staff is also important with the, in, 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 the, in the meeting setting as well. And holding each other accountable. You know, we need to operate in an open, ethically, uh, and, and work to engage the community. Um, and to really think about short-term and long-term strategic directions and goals. Again, that's, again, it's, it's, it's a common theme here in, in all of these, that being strategic and thinking about our goals and objectives is important. And holding, you know, each other and yourselves accountable for your own behavior and the behavior and effectiveness of the whole entire council is, is important. Um, and adhering to operating pro protocols and, co and codes of conduct, uh, and establishing clear priorities and goals, and, and like I mentioned before, holding the city manager accountable for results. And then finally, uh, you know, it's always good to uh, really try to continue to improve ourselves, uh, and, and that means staying informed on key issues, and there's a variety of ways to do that, obviously, and the resources that are available to you, obviously speaking and engaging with the community, uh, and gaining insights and knowledge on all aspects of governing, because it's ever-changing, and not everything is, is uh, black and white, and there's always more to story whenever you talk to somebody, so uh, doing what you can to improve and to learn and to engage is, is critically important. 
Um, and listening, to listen is many times more important than learning to give a speech. I think a lot of times we, we forget that, and particularly in these public settings, because there's sometimes a desire to sort of just speak and say what you want, but it's, it's probably more important to actually listen uh, than it is to, to speak. So those are just the, the six, I think, things that are, I think, are recommended is uh, sort of traits. When you look at what are the traits and attributes of an effective city council, they, they do these things well, they consider these things well. And I uh, just wanted to just point that out because I think it's important for all of us to recognize that in the community as well. Um, and with that, I pass it over to our human resources director, Lisa Murphy, to go over the specific recommendations that the investigator made. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Lisa Murphy, Human Resources Director. Uh, tonight I'm gonna to go over the City Council investigation recommendations and implementation. Just a brief background, uh, as you all are aware, investigation was conducted by an independent investigator into the violations of city policies by members of the City Council. The investigation was concluded in July. The investigator made a series of recommendations I myself have made a, several recommendations, and this report requests that the council approve those recommendations. These are all also listed on your, um, in your agenda. The first recommendation, and uh, what I plan to do is go through each one, and then what we can do is maybe come back to them and, and address them individually if we wanna make any alterations or clarifications. The first one is appoint a subcommittee of two council members to work with the staff to develop a code of ethics and conduct policy for elected and appointed officials. This isn't unusual. This is actually very common uh, throughout many of the ICMA recognized um, cities that the councils do adopt these types of um, uh, policies. And uh, I think it would be best if we had the two, two council members participate and staff can help support create that. Mm -hmm. I've also listed in your staff report um, mm -hmm. timelines of which to be able to prepare these items. And I believe in this particular one, uh, I've said that we could do it within the next two months. <coughs> The second recommendation uh, was that all council members agree to attend a mediation conducted by a qualified conflict resolution professional. We have sub two uh, proposals that have come to us. This isn't by all means the, the ones we have to go with, um, but what I'm looking for you tonight to do is to agree to pursue this avenue, uh, look into the training and uh, participate in a mediation voluntarily uh, and utilize one of the two consultants that have proposed on this project. The third recommendation that all new council members attend a live training session of the sexual harassment, discrimination, and workplace conduct policies within the first 60 days of taking office and attend every two years thereafter as required by the state of California. Although this may seem um, not, not new, what is new to this is uh, the first 60 days. Uh, right now, the city offers those trainings throughout the year. You are required at some point during the year to take that training, and you can also take it online, which sometimes may not be the most effective. Uh, so with this requirement from the first 60 days, and you would be able to have that attended by uh, January. Uh, the League of California Cities offers it when you're first elected, and also the City of Santa Cruz offers that training live in January as well. Recommendation number four, that staff will review and revise, if necessary, Administrative Procedure Order Section 2, A, Discrimination, Harassment, Retaliation Policy, Implementation Complaint Procedure, and Administrative Procedure Order Section 2, 1B, respectful workplace conduct policy. These are administrative policies that are developed by the administration uh, with the work of our Equal Employment Opportunity Commission helped us as well on the workplace conduct. And what I'm proposing is to <coughs> utilize the EEOC again, as well as uh, staff who would like to, of, of the city who would like to participate 
we have definitely learned uh, going through this process that we can improve upon this process. Uh, there are uh, opportunities that we can be more successful when we hopefully never have to proceed down this path uh, again. So I have also put down the recommendation to uh, bring this back to the council hopefully sometime uh, in early January. I think we'll be able to meet the with the EEOC during that timeline as well because they also participate in those policies. Now, depending on that outcome, then we would bring back to you for recommendation number five, which is the council review and revise if necessary, council policy 25.2, discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and respectful workplace conduct policy based on the outcome of the previous recommendation. That's because those two policies Actually, this policy, the council policy, is sort of the umbrella policy of those two that you do have direct um, uh, approval over. So what I'd like to have is that the staff and employees work on um, the, the two policies, revisions if necessary, and then we'll bring it back to you and have those two policies mirror each other. Uh, and finally, the last recommendation was number six, which is to direct the staff to prepare a formal onboarding process for new city council members that incorporates these policies uh, within, again, the first couple of months of your um, of individuals becoming elected and coming on board. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. Uh, and if we have a more formalized policy that would delineate uh, important Council policies, your handbooks, our APOs, important projects, the budget, uh, and any number of things, whether in labor negotiations or whatever it might be, uh, and land use issues that might be pressing before you, uh, that would be part of the onboarding process that would take place uh, with the intention um, within the first 60 to 90 days of being elected. So with that, that concludes the, the six recommendations. And so I would like to turn it back over to you to discuss each one and hear what you have to say and, and have um, uh, uh, any advice on to updates and so on and so forth. So this would generally be the time if there's any council members who want to ask questions of staff. Um, I think this is going to require a number of uh, kind of conversations and discussions. If it's um, okay with my colleagues, I would just prefer that we go ahead and open it up to public comment, then we can return back for questions, action, deliberation. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. I had two requests for groups that want to speak to address the council on this item. Um, the first is a city employee who is um, interested in speaking on behalf of herself and other city employees who didn't feel comfortable coming forward. I'll go ahead and invite up that city employee now, and you'll have up to four minutes. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, City Council members. I'm Susie O'Hara, Assistant to the City Manager. I stand this evening before you with my family by my side and my community behind me to share that I am city employee number four. And I speak for women here at the city too afraid to speak for themselves. A few members of our city and community are here to stand in solidarity with us victims. I ask others in chamber, chambers who would like to join them to feel to please feel free to raise your hands. I'm honored and humbled to have you all here with me. I am city employee number four, but I am not a faceless number. I'm a mother of three young daughters, a wife to my husband, a devoted public servant, servant who has withstood months of abuse, an abuse that continues through council members Glover's persistent victim blaming and zero recognition of the harm that he has caused. I share these experiences to, to be an example of courage for those too afraid to report abuse, for victim blaming keeps from people from speaking out and fear keeps people from telling their stories. I'm here to tell my story in spite of that fear because you need to hear me and you need to understand. The impact this experience has had on me is surely not news to any of you. It certainly was captured by the investigative report as I cried through most of my testimony. In fact, I've cried to each and every one of you, except for council members Glover and Crone over the last several months, right here at City Hall. No one should feel this way at work. Even though the investigator <clears throat> uh, couldn't prove my claims to violate a city policy, he proved th those events happened. Months of interrogation from the dais happened. Using my image to depict the violent ways city employees interface with Ross Camp happened. 
sending interns to stand physically over me alongside activists as they slung hateful speech to me happened. Recording me while mimicking those same activists' abusive questions at Camp Ross happened. All these things happened and they hurt me. They hurt my family. This process has been devastating and many things need to change to protect city employees from ever having to experience this kind of trauma in the future. First and foremost, the council members must stop this abuse of conduct towards staff. Their behavior has put a stain on our city and it hurts its employees. The respectful workplace conduct policy must be rewritten, rewritten to standardize the investigation, investigation process and protect complainants to the maximum extent possible. The policy should recognize victim blaming as a form of abusive conduct. <laughs> Councilmember Glover calling me and Councilmember Myers racist or unconsciously biased um, and suggesting that we are responsible for his behavior by virtue of us not speaking to him first is abusive. Ironically, it should be noted that I've spoken to Councilmember Glover no less than four times about his conduct. Four times and his behavior did not stop. Further, if the policy continues to include council members, it should define disrespectful behavior from the dais. Quietly snapping in approval or laughing, smirking or nodding one's head while a member of the public berates staff is demoralizing, abusive and wrong. We see you even when the camera doesn't and it hurts, it hurts us. And lastly, council members Brown and Cummings, your decision tonight is no less than heartbreaking for me. You have told me that my voice does not matter. You have told me that I do not matter. These processes must incorporate a, some element of restorative justice. This, victims must be given an opportunity to share their experience with their abuser and those that can hold them accountable. You just took that away from me. And what I can tell you is that while I may be one woman, one mother, one trusted city colleague, I represent many more city staff and community members that have been impacted by this abusive conduct. Abusive conduct that has shaken the city to its core and left us completely demoralized. One sentence. You must take that into consideration during your deliberations tonight. Thank you, Susie. I gotta stop you. I, I, I thank you very he can, much. He can finish it. We'll have you no. go next. We'll have you go next after we have one more presentation and that is um, for former and current members of Seat Club. Hi, I'm Leila Kramer, Vice Chair for CPVAW. Sorry, there's a little bit upsetting. Susie, sorry. <clears throat> Good evening, Council Members. I'm speaking on behalf of current and former commissioners for the City of Santa Cruz Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, or CEPVA, to affirm our commitment to the women complainants who have come forward with regard to the abusive and disrespectful conduct of Council Members Crone and Glover. As a commission, we start by believing, start by believing those who have the courage to come forward and share their stories of harassment and abuse. <clears throat> Today, we are here in particular to support of Susie O'Hara, who served as a staff coordinator for CEPVA during then Commissioner Glover Glover's tenure. We believe that the entire commission and Ms. O'Hara witnessed and experienced disrespectful conduct by then Commissioner Glover as defined by the city's current administrative procedure order, which applies to employees, volunteers, council members, commissioners, customers, contractors, and visitors of the city of Santa Cruz. Two commissioners who served during council member Glover's tenure on CEPVA were asked to participate in this investigation as witnesses to this conduct. Both provided testimony that illustrated this pattern of disrespectful conduct by then Commissioner Glover. We believe that this has been a pattern of disrespectful behavior from the seat VA to now on city council. And we urge the city council to take action tonight to put an end to what Ms. O'Hara, city staff, council members, and others are experiencing in their workplace. Additionally, the commission will be meeting tomorrow night and our hope is to be able to provide resources, recommendations, and guidelines to the council that will help you as you craft as you craft your plan to address disrespectful conduct, harassment, and ethics in the workplace. <coughs> we hope to be able to share our recommendations with council shortly so that we can prevent this from happening to others in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Go ahead.
ahead and now open it up to public comment. We'll go ahead and have uh, folks who want to address the council on this item, please line up to my left and you'll have up to two minutes. My name is Alain de Souche. First, I want to acknowledge each council member here for your dedication to public service and for the sacrifice that this service entails in your personal lives. Each one of you comes into this service with your own priorities and passionate commitment to the people you represent. And given the complexity of the issues you are grappling with, it's not surprising that conflict may arise. And we should be thankful for your willingness to work through this conflict. The Rose Report details for each council members Crone and Grover, one allegation that was substantiated, while the others were unsubstantiated. And the key recommendations are for council members to avoid making public accusation of misconduct against one another and city staff without first addressing it in private and attempting conflict resolution. Other recommendation is for all members of the City Council and selected staff members to attend and participate in professional mediation. In view of these positive recommendations, the censure is contrary to the spirit of improvement in city governance promoted in the report. By including in the censure complaints that were not substantiated, it violates our justice principle of being innocent until proven guilty. And by voting on such a censure prior to implementing the report recommendations, the censure puts emphasis on punishment rather than remediation. The censure conflicts with the recommendation of the report and would achieve an effect opposite. Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you. I had some prepared remarks, but events that occurred here today make me want to preface them. I read from the Administrative Procedure Order, Section 2, Number 1B of the Respectful Workplace document. Examples of disrespected <coughs> behavior. Number two, intentionally ignoring someone. We just saw the mayor intentionally ignore Council Member Brown's attempt to follow with Robert's Rules of Order. I would like everybody to understand that in section five, under records, it says that there are three ways that things can be resolved. Substantiated, unsubstantiated, or not withdrawn not guilty as hell or throw it out. Those are the three that are in the book. I'm glad we have a book to follow. Disrespectful conduct <laughs> examples. A single act, this is in the book, quote, a single act shall not constitute disrespectful conduct unless it is especially severe or egregious, like a laugh that isn't there. The responsibilities of council members to use conflict man management skills to effectively manage disagreements. The mayor has totally failed on this one. Address, if possible, and appropriate behavior directly with a person engaging in such conduct in professional and non-confrontatory way, like council member Meyer did, or like the mayor's perception speech. Yeah, next speaker. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Matt O'Hara, finishing for Susie O'Hara, just a little bit. You must take that into consideration during your deliberations tonight and try to rebuild this organization for the sake of the future of this city. Thank you. This is an abridged statement. I'm submitting my full statement to the council. Now I'll take just a few seconds uh, to speak as Matt O'Hara. And when Susie said this has had a big impact on her family, it certainly has. Um, my sense is that many people in the audience who were laughing when Council Member Myers mentioned that many of the claims um, were not found to be false, and in fact they're unsubstantiated, laughed, and they consider this sort of theater. Um, but what I'll say is that I watched this report happen in real time. 
Um, and what my wife had to go through wasn't right, and it shouldn't be experienced by other city employees. And I hope that we can move beyond this and that you can all work to, to get us there. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening, City Council. And good, in, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayo Banjo. Uh, I am the uh, former student body president at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, serving and representing about over 18,000 students, um, also one third of the population of Santa Cruz. Um, and I'd like to take this moment here to talk about uh, the reflection and the representation that both council members uh, Crone and Glover represent as the student body president, as the former president. Um, they are here to represent our voices and to fight for our causes and uh, to really be supportive. So I wanna say thank you for, uh, to both of you for your service and for everything that you've committed to this, uh, to this uh, town. Um, you know, as president, I had to fight throughout my uh, sophomore year uh, of, of my university. I've had to fight to raise about half a million dollars for homeless students. Um, and it's unfortunate that the students <coughs> on campus are sometimes having to do the jobs of city council by fighting for homeless students because certain uh, meetings and agendas are uh, derailed by um, unsubstantiated claims. And um, it's unfortunate to see um, sometimes how local government can sometimes get the toxicity that the national government currently has, and it's obstruction um, that we're looking at right now. So I would ask that you, um, all city council members, reflect um, the beliefs and the values as we just saw presented here today um, by all the people here. Please raise your hand if you are in support for uh, Councilman Gover and Chris Cohn. Thank you. That sounds like a majority to me, which is a democracy. So please respect um, the values and the voices of um, all of us and the student body, which is again, one third of the population. Um, this is really unfortunate and I will be here to make more remarks as we go forward. But the only way to establish a community to be someplace, a place where people feel like they belong, people like me who is a, the first black male at, student body president at UCSC, even though it's, uh, Santa Cruz is less than 1% black, is by being able to have these voices reflected. So I think. <laughs> Daryl Darling, uh, the rose here uh, for me means hope. Uh, I, it's a matter of public record that I was one of the interviewees, one of the participants in the first uh, investigation or discovery of whether or not the community would be able to come together after the election and after the defeat of the uh, uh, rent control ballot measure. <clears throat> and I identified as was reported in the report that uh, yes, I had hope. My, the final conclusion was that the council's dysfunctional and that the community is sufficiently divided that there's very little trust. My statement was I concurred that it's iffy at best. But I'm here to say that uh, the path that you are on, uh, I agree with our city manager. Uh, I agree with the, uh, with the people who have said, reconcile, listen to each other. What you want, what you want in your heart to happen for our city is what you will be able to do and we will do it with you. This community here, <coughs> wow, may I have another th 10 seconds? This community elected you seven people to get along enough that you can decide about different positions on various issues, but you seven, live here because we elected you. Your time is up, thank you. To make okay. Your a time difference is up, Mr. for Darling. us. Thank you very much. I just finished one sentence. Oh yeah, thank you, we have the next speaker. We'll have up to two minutes.
Hello, uh, my name is Vicki Winters. First of all, I'd like to extend my really, my heartfelt sympathy to you, Susie. I was there at Ross Camp uh, during the, when you were there, what you were doing, the working conditions you had to endure, that was impossible and it was all put on you. And I hold the city manager responsible for ahead. that. You, go, you can go ahead. No one should have had to go shoulder that alone. You. If you can, please address the council. Um, and then I just want to say it's also unfortunate that this whole issue with Susie had to occur in a very contentious political environment. The threat of recall was deployed even before the first city council meeting to influence a vote on just cause eviction. That came out. Then Mayor Watkins made her accusations at the February 12th council meeting, which made any collegial relations between the council virtually impossible. So I think that you should shoulder some responsibility for the dysfunction here. Um, and then I'd like to address the laugh that no one else heard except one person. Other people heard a snort or a grunt. Other people heard nothing here on this dais. Uh, that was the only accusation against Council Member Crone that was substantiated. I've listened to the tape multiple times. I've extracted the audio and like looked at the levels and everything. There's a cough clearly heard from Chris's mic seconds before the city employee says, in my professional opinion, and then there's nothing. Um, he may have cleared his throat. He may have made some other sound. We heard here where there was a very loud sound during someone's public testimony that was inadvertent. If we were all suspicious of each other and conspiratorial, we could have thought, oh, he did that deliberately to disrupt. But if you just, if you have the faith and um, good faith to go to someone and ask, it seemed like you laughed at me. I uh, think she could have reconsidered that. that. Next speaker. <laughs> Hello, Mayor Watkins and City Council. Civility is a tool for marginalizing, for silencing marginalized voices. Historically, it's been used to justify the genocide and enslavement of indigenous black and other non-white people. Imposing civility makes it impossible to respect the diversity of styles and perspectives of others that were outlined tonight. I recommend a training for city employees, including city council members, that addresses the impact of institutional racism. Santa Cruz County, such as what Santa Cruz County Community Coalition for Overcoming Racism offers. Attempts at keeping things civil so far has prolonged this process and worsened the conditions of this city. The issues at hand require passionate discourse and challenging of the status quo if there's going to be any effective change this is how progress is made and the proof is in our history. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paula Leroy. It seems a little strange that somebody could bring accusations publicly where the person is not able to um, talk about them themselves. You know what I mean? There's sort of like a one-way thing and so I think that's, um, something unfortunate. Um, what I wanted to say is I see a lot of rulemaking in the recommendations, but I didn't see as much mediation, although you talked about that in the beginning. And I'd like to see, because um, lots that I heard today, tonight, especially from the two people that spoke about censure, <laughs> from them I heard derogatory remarks, berating. I've seen a lot of bullying. I am worried about the working of this body. I see democracy at risk when people that we have elected are being shut down. Um, and disenfranchising an election. I feel there could be leading by example. I don't see a lot of kindness or inclusion from the two leaders. It is an unhappy period and I wonder really who all is responsible. I am not diminishing any you know, investigation or issues. I mean, and there's lots of ways those things happen in workplaces that leadership especially <laughs> I think could help those people who have different backgrounds, styles, ideas, work together, work things out, come to some kind of healing. And I really think that's what leadership is supposed to be doing. Um, and like, 
I think if there's mediation, and I hope there will be, that everybody holds themselves accountable. Am I bullying? Am I not hearing other councilmen? Am I working as a team member? Am I making an agenda? with all the other team members, or am I just deciding the agenda on my, myself? And so it has been an unhappy period. I hope the recommendations will be followed. I hope the wonderful thing that you were talking about goes through. And I have um, worked with Chris and Drew for many years, known them very many years. They are amazing people and we need them. We need them, we need you all. Thank you. Thank you. I want to address you this evening as a professional mediator. I've been doing that for 25 years. What I've seen often happens is there's what's called a spiral of conflict and someone perceives a hostile intent. They have a perception of that and then they do defensive counterattack. It's really important for this council and all of the staff to have training in conflict resolution and communication skills, not just mediation, because you want to know how to say to somebody, wow, did you just roll your eyes at me and they can say, no, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, I didn't feed the parking meter. You never know what it's going to be. But when you actually check in with somebody, something totally different than what you're making an assumption about is happening usually. And if it isn't, great to call somebody on their behavior. And I really encourage you to do work on race, class, gender, and power issues. I've been in that work for over 15 years. And there are these subtle things that we perceive by somebody that don't have anything to do with their race, their class, their gender, or their power, or they may. And they may need to be called on it. They may need to be aware of it. So not just doing mediation, it's great that you're gonna you know, have those conversations, but you've got an incredible resource here, here the Conflict <laughs> Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County has been teaching these skills on active listening. How do you listen to somebody in a conscious and present state? How do you not you know, make a comment because you don't agree with them? You know, it's disrespectful when someone is speaking not to listen to them. And we don't know how to listen. We're not taught how to do that. We're taught how to ride a bicycle, maybe balance our checkbook, but not how to actively listen and take away everything that's distracting you and say, what's really going on for you here in this moment? You know, and we have people who are overworked, we have stress, we have all kinds of things. So I really urge you to make another recommendation, which is for conflict resolution, communication skills, and for race, class, gender, and power training, so that you can see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, this is pretty emotional for me. Um, as you all know, I'm a long time woman, 81 years old. I'm also a long time, 40 years active feminist. I was the editor of Matrix Magazine. I'm a lesbian. I get as angry as the next person, certainly as upset as Susie and as Donna. I trust your feelings, but I know as a woman, an angry woman, a still angry woman about the way women are still treated after all these years, ever since Susan B. Anthony was out there, and it's still not, somebody is being abused right now, somebody is being killed right now, a woman. Why we can't carry that over and understand that that is also true of people who have suffered race discrimination for all these years. You know, this is really, we me, don't ride the Me Too thing and forget about Black Lives Matter in this town. This is a really important thing. Um, I've known Drew and Chris for many, many years personally. I don't know Drew as well. I've known Chris well. I've been in so many meetings with Chris, so many places. They are such good people. We need them. We, to, to achieve democracy, to balance, you know, the people who are representing, I'm afraid it's true, Cynthia and Martin and Donna, uh, it's, you represent the people who are established, the moneyed interests in this town. I know that's not your whole agenda, but you're supported by them. We are not. We have to have, we finally have a voice on this council. And I am so glad we do, and I don't want to lose it.
Hello, Council. My name is Satya Ryan. I don't want to blame or judge anyone. I see all of you here in a very difficult position. It's hard. Personal interactions are hard. Conflict is hard. I think when things fall apart, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, what I see in my own personal life is whatever shows up on my path is my path. So what I hope for you and what I've been, what's been coming to me is I, I went to the library the other day and I took some CDs of Marshall Rosenberg, NBC, Nonviolent Communication. And he was talking about his mediation work with, with um, gangs and with uh, warring tribes in northern Nigeria. And he helped them. It took a while, but he helped them find a way to uh, understand and find empathy for each other. And I, my feeling is if that's possible in a situation that difficult, it should be possible here too. And I, I think that you know, I get triggered in my own life. We all get triggered. We get into our own pain. I see a pain, people feeling hurt and upset, and I get that happen in my own life too. But if, unless we're willing um, to look at ourselves, everyone, I don't exclude anyone here, all of us, the whole community, whatever you do with mediation, I hope you will consider nonviolent communication mediation. If there's room to bring in another, um, uh, someone that wants to help, I hope you will consider that. And that whatever you do to heal yourselves will heal the community as well. You will give us all benefit and it's a gift. Look at this as a gift, not as a problem. I hope you will, thank you. Good evening. My name is Shabra Kalantari Johnson and I care deeply about this community that's been my home for over 25 years. And in particular, because my family escaped, literally escaped an oppressive, war-torn country. To come to a country and a community where there is respect and there is civility, and I understand the word civility differently than what was brought up earlier tonight. And I have to say that I am heartbroken and disappointed by what I've experienced tonight. Um, we are more than this. We are not about divisiveness. We are not about explicit and implicit disrespect. We as a community aren't this. This isn't who we are. We are a cohesive community that can address very complex issues. What I've dedicated my professional life to is bringing in resources. Some of the work I do as a grant writer, I bring in resources for homelessness to address disproportionate minority confinement, um, structural racism, uh, substance use. This is what I've dedicated my life to. And what we have seen and experienced tonight, what I have, is keeping us from addressing these very complex issues that need to be addressed. And I will say, coming up here, I've spoken in front of Council or Board of Supervisor many times, but I'm shaking because this doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like someone with my perspective and point of view can come up here and speak. And as a woman of color, that feels horrible. So I want to ask all of you at council and all of the community members behind me and anyone else who's watching to please help us shift this culture of divisiveness and disrespect to one of cohesion and respect. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm, I'm really encouraged that you're about to embark on a mediation and I wish you well in that. And I'm hopeful that um, that, that will become just part of the culture of, of working for the city of Santa Cruz. I want safe workplace, emotionally safe workplace for Susie and for, for everybody who works for the city. And you've got a, a leader who exemplifies that. Um, Martine Bernard and I have differed over whether to put a parking garage in downtown Santa Cruz, but I cannot imagine him ever saying my ideas are idiotic or irresponsible. I had heard, I have heard that from, from a council member. Um,
what I think the city struggles with is what to do to make this workplace safe. And I think that that punishment paradigm where, you know, here's the, here's the code, right? And, you know, you get training in the code and then you, if you violate it, you know, somebody complains and somebody investigates and then you punish, you know? We know it doesn't work with our children. I have two kids fighting with each other, our, our kids, and, and we wanna stop the behavior. So we punish one of them. It may force it underground, but they're still gonna be at each other's throats, you know? So let's move beyond the punishment paradigm. Let's all see what kind of responsibility we can take for making this a, a better community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Byers. The first thing you're not supposed to do is apologize. And I actually want to apologize first, mainly to Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Matthews, and to Mayor Watkins, because I wish I was speaking on behalf, I wish I was speaking to my friends. And I feel like we're not friends. And that, that sucks because I feel like there's more openness when we're speaking uh, to our friends. Drew and Chris are definitely friends, but they didn't even start out that way. It was totally random how I even got involved with these two, but they are amazing people. And the word respect has been thrown around a lot. And I thought that I would just take whatever time I have left to define Oxford Dictionary respect. A feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. That seems really <laughs> intense. So the second one is due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. Due regard. That to me seems key and it seems like it's appropriate. So what does due regard mean? It's in the making decisions and in its day-to-day -day activities, a body subject to the duty must consciously consider the need to do the things set out in the general quality, general equality duty. Eliminate discrimination, advance equality of opportunity, and foster good relations. I'm basically, basically just gonna stress on the foster good relations aspect. I really hope that there could be an opportunity to foster good relations in the due regard, in that definition of respect. I really want that to be expressed in, in its time. fullest. Thank you. I don't know um, that whoever that lady is who put this recommendation stuff up, I agree with all that stuff she was saying. That's a very good idea. It's very good work and stuff. She want to be on the board. Um, <laughs> These two gentlemen here, I have had contact with them. I can read people, I can see, I know what's in them. You can't associate. These two are good people. I cannot see them intentionally trying to harm nobody verbally, mentally, none of that. They are too good for that. They are bigger than that. Now this lady right here, um, Myers, um, I've seen the disgust in her when Councilman Glover is speaking, just disgust, won't hear nothing he got to say. And she got the, the gall to be talking about whatever she was saying. I've been at a meeting where I'll say the mayor started the meeting talking about civility. And at that same meeting, minutes later, tried to cut down Councilman Glover and what he was trying to say. What's civility in that? Stopped us from when we wanted to speak, democracy, I know this lady over here is a good lady too. I see what's in people, humans. These are good people, there's no way. I don't know how somebody can hold Councilman Glover responsible for something that happened at Ross Camp. Those are many people over there. Councilman Glover is the only one I saw over there because he's concerned. He's an activist and he's doing things for our community. So I don't get the logic in. Well, well something happened over there and it's his fault. I don't get that. It's something else, but I get so riled up when I come here. Oh my goodness. Anyhow, whoever that lady is that put this up, um, 
Is there a seat open? Can we put her on the board? That's not what I wanted to say, but it's something. Your time I, is up. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Steve Schnarr. I think that it's a great idea for the council members to have some mediation. Um, obviously, the current situation is dysfunctional and untenable, uh, which is evidenced by the fact that all of the community and yourselves and staff are, are wasting an entire evening uh, talking about this instead of actual city policies that we elected you to, um, to work on. Um, apart from that, um, I just wanted to say that it seems very um, self-interested and transparent um, the way that certain council members are trying to frame uh, this dysfunction as just blamed on two individual people. Uh, and, and some of the same things that have been uh, thrown at them, which for, by the way, uh, Ms. Myers, the not substantiated doesn't mean that, it, that yeah. That was ridiculous to try to imply that these things actually happened when they were found, when it was investigated and not substantiated. But um, Council Member Matthews, I've been in a meeting when after dozens of people testified to an opinion you did not agree with, you described it as idiotic. Um, and former Council Member Comstock gave the middle finger to the crowd. Um, former Council Member Noran at a public meeting uh, that she was attending of the Coastal Commission was like shouting out of turn and had to be told to, to stop shouting. So I'm not saying that they should have been censured or kicked off the council. It's, I'm just saying politics is tough. People have strong emotions. Not everybody likes everybody. That's the way that the world is. And it's, it's very, um, it's disgusting, frankly. It, it's the reason why people are disgusted with politicians in Washington, and it's, and it's disgusting here to see you transparently use the same behaviors that you and your comrades will use uh, as an excuse to go after other people because you happen to disagree with their politics, and you're, and you're sorry that you lost power that you had for so many years. Good evening, members of the City Council. I'm Chris Nunez. I've been here since 1993. You and I have had encounters, Councilman. I want you to know that I'm five feet two in the morning when I wake up. I'm five feet tall by noon. As I saw Councilman Glover walk across the back, he reached almost to the top where it says conduct. That's pretty big. I used to be um, the administrative analyst for the Commission on the Status of Women in Santa Clara County way back in 1978 when we were all still all over the Bay Area trying to understand and define and describe harassment. We still didn't have any definitions. We knew what it looked like. We knew what it felt like. It wasn't until much later on in the 80s when I left to do other things in vocational training that uh, some of the sisters and uh, the brothers in law schools, students and professors <coughs> finally started to mint some you know, good legislation. What I'm seeing here after 40 years Looks very promising to me, but it looks like a beginning. There are two things going on here. One is the institutional stuff, and this is good. This is good as a beginning, and I hope to see it develop more fully. The other thing that is going on is obviously political. And what I heard earlier, even before this session started, was I heard a lynch mob in the making. And they weren't going over to take Councilman Glover or Chris Crone. They were looking for someone else. And we've actually had a woman lynched in California. And I want you to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have letters from 52 people that I'm speaking on behalf of tonight. <clears throat> Hello, Santa Cruz City Council members and Santa Cruz community. My name is Robert Endicott Keller, and I represent a group of gentlemen who have had a history with homelessness, addiction, poverty, and recidivism. 
We have participated in and benefited from programs and services provided by the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Rehabilitation and Reentry Facility in Watsonville. When we decided we needed to hold up our end of the bargain and what we felt that would look like, we started putting together a plan. Our conversations led to a transitional restorative justice program for people like us, by people like us, called Give Back to Santa Cruz. But we needed help. We wrote over 30 letters to people and groups in the community looking for guidance and support, but we only received one person's response, <coughs> Santa Cruz City Council Member Drew Glover. He recognized our value when no one else did. He encouraged us to write down and organize our ideas, then to send them to him. He answered our phone calls, listened and asked questions. Council Member Drew Glover was concerned with how we were feeling and what we were thinking. He spent his personal time on his weekends on multiple occasions to come out to the program facility at Roundtree to validate us as worthwhile human beings with worthwhile ideas. Council Member Glover was willing to look past our faults to see who we really are. He has faith in our potential and ability to turn our lives around. Council Member Glover is willing to do with us what most people don't have the stomach to do, which is really listen and believe in our intent. We support Council Member Drew Glover because Council Member Drew Glover supports us. And if you really want to solve these issues in our community, you should take a page from his book and listen to the people you're trying to help. And if you don't want to or you can't, please don't take the one person that does, Santa Cruz City Council Member Drew Glover. Please don't take away our voice. We can do better. We will do better. Thank you for your time and thank you, Drew. My name is Elise Casby and I'm a survivor of psychological, financial, and emotional abuse. My father was one of the highest lawyers in the United States of America. He was Assistant Attorney General of the State of Oregon. I went through 20 years of harm by all kinds of professional people in this world and I have learned to identify abusers. Abusers often feel that they are being abused. I am very concerned tonight about some of the dynamics in this room. So I'm gonna say a couple of things very quickly, okay? Number one, I stood up and supported Susie O'Hara after the Ross camp because I felt she had been completely overloaded with work. I was there, I witnessed what happened. But I am very concerned about Susie's presentation Two weeks ago when I pit, went to pick up a city agenda, there were two people in the room. The receptionist, I was in a corner of the room and I had a view to the hallway. Susie was there and there was another person there, an incoherent homeless person. He was totally incoherent. The receptionist wanted to go on her lunch break and I didn't want to talk to the gentleman because he was too incoherent. He didn't seem to be drunk. He was just completely understandable. I mean, not understandable. I saw Susie, she was in the hallway making a face of disgust and grimacing as she stood there. And I just wanna say, n nobody was there to support what I saw, so you don't know if I'm telling the truth, but I'm telling you, I'm telling the truth. We need score training racial diversity in this mix of mediation. That's very important that this council take on understanding racial diversity and white privilege. I have had to study abuse. I recommend the Nasty People Abuse, um, excuse me, the Na Nasty People book. Also the Verbal Abuse, Patricia Evans book on verbal um, abuse. The abuser, Santa Cruz Together had a strategy to use the homeless. We know this, we have a copy of the notes from that meeting. They had a strategy that included the special election, they had a strategy to ruthlessly and exploitively use the homeless as a scapegoat for this situation. Also the Sepos so report and the Rose report, me. you're trying to run around that. Your time is up. All right, next speaker. I believe I have four minutes. No, you don't actually. You have two minutes. Really, you're not gonna give me the right to, to request a no. group presentation that I no, have. No, you have the group presentation for the item that was motioned to table. So you have two minutes. Well, why should I be surprised? Okay, um, there's a hullabaloo about civility, and civility has been the cry of Mayor Watkins and those who have controlled the council's agenda, uh, though without the popular mandate that might justify such control. Council members excluded grow impatient or angry. The public grows outraged. They speak out or try to. And presto, they are all uncivil. So when the mayor fails to make the civic auditorium available as tonight, 
and keeps much of the audience outside or in a second building, as tonight, in spite of repeated requests, or when she locks them out of the building after muzzling speakers who've waited hours to speak, the don't act like a fascist style salutes, and the raised voices are labeled uncivil and become the basis for further repression. When signs are raised that block no one, the mayor interrupts her own meeting to threaten the audience with eviction. Devices to thwart progressive measures. The mayor's selective recognition of favored council members and her ignoring of those, like Glover, whom she prefers not to hear from. Excluding progressive matters altogether from the agenda items while packing it with talk-heavy, staff-concocted items that take up time and space in endless chatter calling on the city attorney to provide Brown Act pretexts and to shift previously open items into closed sessions, highlighting partisan city officials like the chief of police who support her reactionary position as well as the assistant city manager. Institutionally, the city manager, city attorney and department heads have run the council agenda <laughs> and while the city council comes and goes, these unelected, highly paid officials remain in power unchallenged, unmonitored and for decades unaccountable. In practice, they set the agenda. That needs to be stopped and it's not a part of this recommendation. Okay. Why not? Your time is up. Next speaker. Hey there, my name is Eric Erickson, and I'm going to tell a quick story with a little bit of introduction. Um, I grew up here, Bayview, Mission Hill, Santa Cruz High, Cabrillo, UCSE. I worked there for a few years, so I'm 33. I'm just going to say, like, you know, my peers don't show up to this stuff, as I'm sure you're painfully aware. Secondly, I got involved politically after the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. After that ended, I got involved locally and with the Democratic Party. I was a delegate to the state party and I was appointed a PDC representative to the local DCC. So the story that I want to tell is one DCC meeting right over downtown that Cynthia Matthews, you were present at. I gave a presentation um, criticizing the Democratic Party about how they're corrupt and corporate influence has corrupted that party. That's another story. But Rochelle Ryan was a sitting elected councilwoman, as were you at the time. And after I gave that presentation, she called me an asshole, like loudly in front of a group of people who were like representatives of the community. You were sitting there and, you know, she didn't laugh or scoff like you did let alone maybe a laugh that wasn't heard, you know, and I never heard anything from you. So it just makes me curious what the motivation is here. Thanks. Uh, I want to say first uh, to Susie, and I've said it before, my heart goes out to you. I hate speaking louder. Um, nobody should go to work and like deal with that kind of stuff. Like, super true. I mean, she's smart and she has integrity and she's trying to do her job and she and I look at things very differently, but she's trying. Um, I think that's one piece of this. I think the, I don't, I don't want to do the blame game. Uh, it's no fun and everybody, we're all doing it. Um, to move forward and to actually use these recommendations to actually sit down and talk to somebody that, you know, you've been hurt by and you've also hurt. Like, you gotta, you know, man up and apologize, too. Um, and I, you know, and people up, too. Um, for myself, I'm, I got big personality and, you know, I'm, I have my values and I get frustrated and I mouth off sometimes, too. I get it, like, absolutely. Um, but it's not just them that needs to apologize and need to be able to step forward and stuff. Like that, having that motion and talking about false was not said. No, that false isn't part of that. It's substantiated, unsubstantiated, withdrawn, and somebody even gave an example from one of the policies. So to try to do this whole thing and try to point at people and all that stuff, like. We've got so much other stuff to do. I don't want to talk about this stuff. I like people and stuff like that. I want to help with homelessness. You guys do all sorts of stuff. 
but let's <coughs> just, just man up, woman up, whatever. Let's just apologize and move on and like see people as people. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, um, Madam Mayor, wherever you are, and council members. My name is Ed Porter. I've spent a lot of time in this room over the last 45 years. And I've had the experience of being a new council member. And fortunately, it was a different city manager, so I'm not casting aspersions. But none of this happened for me, what's on this page that I'm looking at right now. None of it. And so, I can sympathize a little bit that I'm, I'm not going to blame anyone. Um, this council has fallen apart somehow, and now we're fixing it. And so I'm gratified that we are fixing it, that you are fixing it, because you, we have elected all seven of you, and we've said in this evening of comment tonight, fix it, council, because we want to go ahead in camaraderie and respect and get our business done and not do the stuff that we did in item one. And it's time to do that. So <coughs> I will just say, like Vicki Winters, I played the tapes again and again and again, turned the volume up loud and soft. The sound on the tape is a cough that lasts about a half a second. It's not what is said in the charges. Yet, Council Member Crone apologized for it anyway. I guess I would apologize for a cough myself, but everyone should know it was a cough. It's good that we're doing this, and we'll come away tonight, maybe there's a turning point in this council, a little more time for Madam Mayor to do all the right stuff. And the right stuff is to implement this as effectively as you can, and make sure that all seven council members participate because that's where the dysfunction came from. My name is Reverend Beth Love. And first of all, I just wanna acknowledge each one of you because you're sitting there in the public eye and the public scrutiny. It's not an easy job. I wouldn't take it. And I know that each of you has the intention of service or you wouldn't have run. And so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm in support of these recommendations that are being made and I'm really clear that that's not enough because these are technical recommendations for a problem that's not technical. It's a problem that's adaptive. This is from the work of Ronald Heifetz and I highly recommend you check into Ronald Heifetz's work. When we're looking at a situation that's adaptive where there's um, um, conflict, where there's personalities, where there's people rubbing up against each other, where there's style differences, where there's issues of uh, oppression and exploitation and racism and all of these other things. We can't put a, a technical solution on it and expect it to work. It won't, it needs an adaptive solution. And I'm gonna, as a minister, I'm really gonna call on each of you on the council and even those on staff to like look deep in your hearts and look at what is yours to do in this. Because what I know about human relationships is that if we're in a situation and there's conflict, we're bringing something to that and it's on us to change. Um, and so I, I just wanna encourage everybody to see this as an opportunity, not just to fix a problem, but to heal and an opportunity for this council maybe to emerge stronger than ever. And so again, I don't see these recommendations as enough. I'm gonna second what others have said. I think there needs to be some communication training, some conflict resolution and some deep soul searching. And I would add, do a retreat or something, get to know each other, go hang out together, be kind and loving to each other and see if we can't get this all together and be a powerful, powerful community that we should be. So thank you very much for your time. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Claire, you all know me. I really enjoyed hearing the third hand knowledge this evening about what's been going on at City Hall and what it's felt like in this council chamber. I've enjoyed hearing the perceptions of what we've actually been experiencing and I've enjoyed hearing how dismissive people have been about the real and hurtful processes that our city employees went through as part of this investigation or that a simple conversation would solve an issue with an obvious power imbalance. I found it fascinating how easy it is to dismiss those experiences. 
There's a difference between being a bad person and being a person who has done something wrong. Nothing before you tonight was calling anyone a bad person. It was simply acknowledging that wrongs have been done and there should be a public acknowledgement of that. I've been in this chamber a lot, but I've never felt as disappointed in this group as I have this evening. I'm thankful that Lisa has brought forward next step actions to correct obvious deficiencies, and I look forward to hearing your discussion and action on those items. What I most want to say though, this evening, is I'm thankful that Mayor Watkins was brave enough to step up first. In being a leader and setting that example that we as employees would be listened to, it gave the rest of the women the faith that they in turn could be brave enough to report what had happened to them. So, Mayor Watkins, I thank you for that. My name is Kathy Agnell. I've been a resident in this city for more than 60 years. I've been a city employee for more than 29. I've experienced times of disrespect, <coughs> harassment, uncivil treatment as a city employee. And I didn't have the courage to do anything about it. I was fortunate that there were commissioners and the city staff that supported me and got me through those very difficult times. <clears throat> My goal has always been to make a difference. I think that's yours as well, all of you. I am sad and disappointed in the council's action to not support censure, which is defined as to express severe disapproval. Susie is my supervisor for the last two years, and I'm inspired by her. I will say it's demoralizing as city staff that management positions and elected mayors are not believed or supported. I'm a service employee. Will my voice be heard or respected? Thank you. To the city council, my name is Freeman Best, and I've been living here since 94. I'm an employee of the Santa Cruz County office. I'm a little league sports official, high school sports official for all the sports. Harassment, disrespect, I live it every day. You know, women for equal right, equal pay. And when you're working with the public, <clears throat> when you're working with the public, sometimes you disagree. And because the person don't speak the way you want them to speak, it's not harassment. Sometimes just a disagreement. But if you got to be scrolled, put on your lady's shoes, and you know, you just got to tough it up because of everything is not easy. You think it's easy for me every day as a black man living in Santa Cruz? This is a great place to live, but I, I see discrimination every day. Tonight, this lady sitting here, she went to this young lady that was sitting in the weather and asked her to move. What did she do wrong? And then you looked at the audience like, I made her move. I didn't like what you did to her. Discrimination every day as a black person, I see it, and I saw it in here tonight. Next speaker. Uh, I witnessed a disturbing act of exclusion and incivility at the first full council meeting after the 2018 election. I feel that this overlooked occurrence should also be addressed when the Rose Report recommendation of mediation and conflict resolution begins. At that 2018 meeting, Mayor Watkins made the expected committee appointments, giving between two and up to five assignments to all council members except to Drew Glover. Exactly zero 
for Councilman Glover, something I have never seen happen before. And I don't know if any of you have either. I have never seen it happen. Over 17 committee appointments were made that night. How would you have felt if you were the one person who was completely left out? Was this an error or could it have been on purpose? If it had been an honest mistake, an apology and an explanation would have been offered pretty quickly to the new counselor who had mistakenly been slighted in the mayor's committee assignment process. Because no outreach to Mr. Glover was made, I am left to assume that it was a purposeful action, not a good foundation on which to build council camaraderie at the first full actual meeting. Mediation and conflict resolution can serve to turn a gesture of ill will into one of goodwill. Please do not choose to continue to ignore this form of bullying that I'm talking about. It's a silent but equally hurtful bullying by exclusion. That was delivered to Drew Glover at his very first full council meeting. This slight has been completely ignored for nine months <coughs> and it too should be addressed as the Ross report advised by providing mediation for all council members. Hi, my name is Janai Herod and I'm not really good at speaking in public, but I'm gonna try. Um, we live in communities, um, but we seem to be all just pretty disconnected even with today's technology and whatnot. Um, with the advancements, globalizations and all, all that, I mean, we seem to know everything about our favorite celebrity, but we don't know our neighbor's name next door. We don't know who you guys are. I mean, you guys are making all the rules and decisions for the whole community. Um, I just see this whole thing uh, is petty. It's really petty. I mean, somebody was hurt, you know, in an in in a interaction with someone because of the words that were said. They're words. They're not sticks and they're not stones. And there's no reason why <laughs> they can't learn better, to learn how to do better. Um, I mean, our country was founded basically on diversity, on community, on people working together. And we've got this incredible experiment called democracy that just happens to be working great but our governments are, are tearing it down. There's always somebody looking up or somebody outside looking in, but there's just not enough community involvement in everything. And we need to learn how to talk to each other. We need to learn to respect each other. We need to welcome the differences. We're, it's okay to disagree. You don't have to, you can agree to disagree, um, but we need to We need to get to know each other all better. I mean, I've been living in my car in my RV for two and a half years. I don't know anybody's names here, but one or two people. You know, I come to a couple of meetings. My daughter just moved back with my grandkids because they couldn't afford to live here for a while, but things got better. Now they're back. You know, I'm fourth generation Santa Cruz. I'm, but people see me as a troll, you know, because I don't have a place to live. I just can't afford $3,000 a month. But that doesn't mean I'm not a, a good person or that I'm not someone <laughs> worth knowing any more than the people at the Ross camp that I keep hearing over and over and over again. Like, some type of, you know, <laughs> Parasite just to be homeless, you know, you're, you're not. So we need to talk to each other more. And Hi everyone. Um, I was actually just sitting at home watching this being streamed and I felt like I had to come down just to offer my full support um, and to say I believe the women who have experienced bullying in the city workplace, full stop. Um, I don't believe any fault falls on them for not being able to overcome unacceptable work conditions. So I wanna make sure that was really clear. There's a lot of people that believe that, that aren't here tonight, that are offering our support to these victims. I wanna make sure that you know that. You have a lot of support in the community. And let's not forget that two of these um, accusations were substantiated by a independent third party. I won't get into how that doesn't invalidate the rest of these complaints, but my heart goes out to those complaints as well. And it's not acceptable to have a council member acting this way. Um, I think if many of us acted this way in the workplace and were found to have substantiated complaints against us, we'd probably be fired or um, severely um, punished. And I just wanted to say that Mayor Watkins, thank you for doing your job in a hostile work environment, um, that I, I feel that in the room tonight. Thanks for being a leader. Um, we just really appreciate you, especially as a woman, so thank you.
evening. You guys have heard from a lot of people, so I won't take up too much of your time. I was also watching at home and felt the need to come down here and just lay a little support on for the women who have made these complaints. Um, I think that it's a really terrible thing that we have city council members who feel unsafe to come to work or feel uncomfortable. And I'd also like to echo that we do have um, two substantiated findings, which I think a lot of people are hand waving away as, oh, just suck it up or you know, put your big girl shoes on or whatever you wanna say. Um, but I think we should really be respecting that and putting some weight behind it. Thank you. I just wanna say a few things. I'm really happy about a lot of the recommendations. That's good. Uh, the mediation could have been done before the investigation, before spending $18,000. Um, but I'm happy to see that it's in there. I also agree with some of the people that said um, conflict resolution is really important, as well as um, something on institutional racism. I don't think a lot of people realize what that means. Um, and, um, the other thing is the false, using the word false, that wasn't part of any of the words that Ali Brokaw had mentioned. So I'm, everyone is switching everything around. It was only two items and both of those were so minor, but no one wants to look at those. And one of them was a laugh that no one can, I think the woman that was just up here, she spoke about, she was the one who observed a laugh. So that wasn't even, I, 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 he just believed, I, from what I gather from the report, it was believing someone's word against someone else's word. And the other one was over a small conflict of, of a room being, in the room too long than the, the time that was allotted and a remark was made. I mean, my goodness, all this, I think it's much deeper than this. I really think it's about something else and it, it's more about getting our most progressive candidates off. And I just, I'm looking forward to the mediation. I'm looking forward to doing other things because I really hope you can work together. Hi again, Beverly Day Show. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist who is retired. And what I, so all these recommendations are great. And what I know about people and change is that even when people super want to and they're paying me a lot of money, they can't. <laughs> so what I think would be a good recommendation that could have avoided, I believe, all of this is that somebody is available immediately when someone feels that they have been violated. It, you know, hearing what these women felt is, is heartbreaking to me. Seeing what's happening in the community is heartbreaking to me. It's, I feel it's just polarizing people and tearing it apart. So I think that if there was someone who was a conflict resolution person who was available immediately when someone felt that there was a problem in the workplace, because no one should have to work in a workplace where they do not feel safe. I mean, I think everyone here would agree on that. So that, that step, should be in place to have someone immediately available and it would not have had to go to where it's gone. So health in all, I think would involve having immediate, an immediate way of resolving the issue. And again, I want to implore you to denounce the recall because it is destroying this community and it's breaking my heart and a lot of people's hearts. And I respect all of you and you do what I could never do, sit here and listen to all of this. So thank you. Good evening, um, Mayor Watkins and council members and city staff and community. Um, I'm sorry if I'm a little scattered. I wasn't gonna speak this evening, but I felt really compelled. Um, so I work as a social worker with the county. I've been bullied at my workplace myself. So, um, you know, I'm not trying to say my experience has been the same as these, these women who have, um, 
you know, put themselves out there and share their story this evening. Um, and I, I hope that we can recognize these women's experiences that they've felt as well as working towards resolve and mediation. Um, I interview people for a living. Um, I ask people about some of the most difficult times in their life. I work for um, Child Protective Services. Um, and, you know, everyone's perspective on situations and um, incidences is, is differs. Um, so, and there's a lot of, you know, factors at play. There's, you know, the women who have spoken and I have talked about gender as being a contributing factor. We've heard from other folks talking about race being a factor. I think we all need to acknowledge these are all factors at play. Um, and as the um, woman who's a conflict resolution um, specialist or media mediator, I can't remember her title, um, said, you know, we need to look at all these issues and put them in context. And um, yeah, I hope we can recognize everyone's experience and, and move forward. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Rachel Dan. Uh, I wasn't planning to speak tonight. I'm nervous and having a bad hair day. Um, but I was compelled to speak anyway um, because of the action on the last item. Um, I was, um, because of the, the last item, I was disappointed and it inspired me to speak to this item. Um, I've been attending council meetings for this, um, for the past 20 years in this town that I love. Um, and I will tell you that the atmosphere in this room has gotten much less welcoming. And clearly work needs to be done by all members to make the public feel more, more welcomed. Um, preventing the public's ability to speak on the previous issue is unprecedented. Never in my years has a council prevented the public from weighing in on a duly noticed item on the agenda. Tabling the last issue was appalling and cowardly. To the council members who made the motion to table, that was shocking and disturbing. What type of atmosphere do you think that sets for the people of this town? Uh, we will remember what happened here tonight. This is not the end. The majority of this council will be remembered tonight for silencing your constituents and silencing women who are here exhibiting extreme courage to share their truth. Thank you, Susie, and thank you, Claire. I stand with you, even if the council majority doesn't. Thank you. Next speaker. Speaker. Hi, my name is Jane. I was here this afternoon being a very straight-laced professional public health person, and now I just wanna talk about being marginalized. I was so moved by the woman who got up and said, civility is a way to marginalize certain voices. I think that is the one thing that if people take away from this, that when you, someone is intense, someone is trying to get across a feeling or asking a question or really needing to bring an issue to the rest of the group who are not paying attention or don't wanna pay attention or have other concerns, Getting them to be quiet and nice is really nice, but everything is lost. And I have had that happen to me more than once where I have been silenced because I was too intense. I wasn't nice enough. If you talk to me in a nicer voice, I'm more willing to listen to you. I mean, this is not what we need when you are representing your community. Maybe, yes, sir, there are times for being civil. I'm not opposed to civility, but please remember that if someone is intense, someone really cares, and I do understand how staff could possibly feel, because I've been staff, and I've been staff to board, so I understand. But please keep in mind that as women, 
many of us in this room, including all of you up here, and maybe, you know, black men, and maybe someone who's in a position of power and feels like, God, I don't have any power. How am I going to solve this problem? Or whatever it is that each of you bring in terms of your own insecurities and the things that you need that please try to listen to each other and not to quiet each other. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett. Um, feeling really heartbroken tonight. Um, I want to suggest one more <laughs> recommendation that um, uh, there may need to be some kind of procedure that makes it equally possible for each council member to get items onto the agenda um, when they want to get something on the agenda. I've, I've understood, I've kind of heard rumblings that that may be a very contentious process that's very difficult for some of the council members. And I would hope that all of the council members can easily get items on the agenda when when uh, when called when they feel it's necessary um, and I just I kind of feel like there's a war happening when I really believe all seven of you sincerely want what's best for our city um, but if if you don't each hear all six of the others, it just becomes really, I don't know, I'm just heartbroken. I, I support mediation or whatever it takes to really hear one another. Um, and I'm not saying that there's two people that need to hear one another. I'm saying there's seven people that need to hear one another. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Pat Malo. Um, I was born and raised in this community. It's the only place I've ever lived. Hopefully, it's the only place I will ever live. Um, first, let me start by saying um, sorry to Susie and all the staff and all the people who have been caught up kind of in between a lot of this, I think. And, uh, you know, you should never feel that way at work, and I'm sure you don't get paid enough. Um, and so, you know, secondly, I'd just like to say that, you know, I think that this is a a rough period right now. Um, we've got so much conflict, not just on the you know council, but it seems like in the community. Um, and I think that the sad part to me um, is that you know the competing visions, neither one of them or none of our visions in this room are enough to address these issues, right? And so we need to be able to forgive ourselves for not having the answers forgive each other for not having the answers and come to the table around this stuff. And I know it sounds cheesy, but I mean, I think that's start one is we're all walking around this place like we got the solution. And I mean, we are facing major, major just local issues right now. Cost of living, all of this stuff. Every one of us, unless we're a multimillionaire, is going to get priced out of this community, one, one generation or another, or maybe we won't even have other generations because of larger global issues. And so, you know, I, I worked with you know, I, every one of you guys almost in the room on some issue or another, and, you know, I consider everyone allies on, you know, all of these other projects from multiple sides of this thing. And so, you know, usually I'm like entertained watching the TV show, but tonight I'm, you know, struck by the real life of this and just the, it's like, you know, there's plenty of projects I'd like to see done. We're all putting them aside because of this mess and I think we all need to forgive ourselves and each other for this. Oh, and if we can send the public to this stuff too, it might help a little, thank you. <laughs> to come tonight um, I was uh, at the Ross camp um, while Susie was there um, and I, I'm speaking as someone who there's been a lot of conflation people have talked about people having different viewpoints from Drew Glover it seems like there's been an idea that there's been this assassination attempt against him because of different uh, political views but I really like your politics and but I was there and I felt like what you did was disruptive. It did undermine our attempts. You know, we had a job to do. 
Um, I hope that we can make a lot of progress um, for homelessness. I like a lot of your ideas, but I hope that you can treat people with respect. Um, I think that sometimes there's this idea in politics that if you're disruptive, you can bring attention to an idea. Um, but I think that's probably not what we need to do now moving forward. Um, you know, it, it's scary as staff to like have jobs like that to do. Um, and to think that council members are gonna come, um, you know, for an example, tell people at the camp that there are motel vouchers available um, that need to be used for emergency hospital type situations and then have people at the camp not wanna move because they're holding out for the vouchers. And when I ask who told you that, they say that <coughs> council member over there in the purple shirt in the power color that's easy to identify, um, it undermined what I did. It definitely undermined what Susie was trying to do. Um, and I think there are probably other people like me that hadn't been planning to come today um, who didn't want to necessarily speak up because it's such a complicated issue because they're afraid to speak as staff. Um, and I, I do hope that we can um, come together in the future um, and that even if we have different political beliefs, we can all treat each other with respect, which I haven't seen <coughs> happening so far. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, it seems to me that most of the people that spoke before me are addressing item number one, not item number two. So I'd like to address item number two. Um, I think probably just two of these recommendations would I go along with if I was sitting up there, which would be number two and number three. Um, the rest of it seems like there's a minority on the council that wants to make some new rules that'll be more punitive because they didn't think Drew and Chris got spanked hard enough. And so we, we wanna make something that'll be more punitive than what's already there. Um, this, this council, uh, Um, guidelines of behavior was reviewed and updated two years ago. And so just because Drew and Chris did something that was looked upon as being wrong, now we wanna reopen it up and try to put more punitive <laughs> measures in there because we wanna make sure that the next time they get out of line, we can really smack them down. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure if I don't think there's any additional members of the community who wants to address the council at this time. Um, we'll go ahead and bring it back to council action and deliberation. I guess I'll just say, um, you know, it, it is, this is, this is very difficult. And to some of the comments that were brought forward, we are better than this, absolutely. And we as elected leaders need to be held to a higher standard. And we as an institution and a governing body need to ensure that every employee, commissioner, person who is working here or participating in our government is doing so in a workplace that's free of harassment, intimidation, and, um, and, and that's unacceptable completely unacceptable. Um, part of the healing process is accountability. My understanding is that is not on the table for discussion. And um, we'll go ahead and move forward with how we can institute some policies at this point to improve our processes so that we can ensure that no individual feels intimidated or has had, had experiences as some of the city staff who spoke up and had the courage to speak up this evening. I have um, a lot of admiration and respect for those folks. So with that, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for action on these items. Um, I'll go ahead and acknowledge uh, my colleague to my left. I just want to acknowledge as well the people who came up and spoke tonight, um, because I know that um, it takes courage to speak up when uh, you feel like you've been wronged. Um, and as the mayor said, you know, no one deserves to be discriminated against in at all in our community, let alone in the workplace. Um, we need to behave respectfully. We need to all try to work together. Um, and that is something that has been expressed multiple times um, on the city council. 
one thing for me that has been really challenging is that um, ever since February, when the initial bullying allegations came out, and then throughout this entire year, there have been multiple times when members of the city council have asked for mediation and conflict resolution to try to bring ourselves together. We've had two retreats. One was in March, I think the other one was around May, June. Um, the first of which we talked about communication with one another and how we could effectively communicate. We also discussed shared values for an entire work day. And one of the things that was very much strongly expressed at that meeting was that we wanted to have conflict resolution and some mediation to try to overcome the differences. At the second meeting, we again spent the morning discussing shared values and priorities uh, over the six month term. Again, one of the number one things that came up was conflict resolution and mediation among tension that was in the city council. Um, I feel like you know the fact that we haven't addressed this by now has led to more divisiveness within our community. After the election in November, and when we became when we were seated and started the city council in January, what I felt that came with being seated on this dais was the same energy that was put into both the no on M campaign and the yes on M campaign. That tension within our community came up here and little has been done to try to resolve it and to try to bring us together. Um, I feel like some of the members of the city council, we've been able to try to overcome our differences and work together effectively, but it hasn't been all of the members of our city council. And so from my perspective, before we go censuring our city council members and creating more divisiveness within our community, we need to first start by having a conflict resolution process and trying to see where we can overcome our differences and bring ourselves together. Because if we don't, we're just gonna continue to see more, to more, more and more divisiveness within our community. Um, everyone has said at these meetings that they honestly wanted to work together and work with one another. Um, everyone said they wanted to work in good faith and we need to be held accountable to that since we all said that we were gonna do that. And I think that's the first step for us to try to address these issues. Um, and uh, I'm happy to discuss some of the other issues as they come up. Mr. Kondati. Before the council gets further into the discussion, I just wanna remind the council that because a motion to table has been made um, under your meeting guidelines, once a motion to table has been adopted, um, the motion requires that all discussion of the item under consideration at the time of the motion be halted immediately without further discussion. So I would just caution council members to direct your attention to the item that's before you and not the prior item. Okay, agreed. Okay, so if there's any, um, Questions, comments, we can maybe just move forward. And Councilmember Brown? Um, I, I do wanna make a comment uh, that is kind of leading into uh, moving forward, which is what I have been hoping for a long time that we would be able to do. And I wanna say I'm really sorry to the city employees who feel like um, this is not a safe, work environment for you. Um, this is seriously a priority for me and I'm sorry that you feel that my um, interest in having a conversation about how we move forward um, rather than um, f focusing on um, you know, punitive uh, measures is in any way an indication that I don't support you because I absolutely do. Um, I. So I just wanted to say, I, I did want to say that. It's, I'm not, don't want to talk about the previous item, but I did want to say that. I do, um, you know, I want to echo Vice Mayor Cummings' remarks about the failure of, uh, to, to get any responsiveness on moving forward with mediation and conflict resolution after months and months of this brewing um, tension that has been, um, it has not made this uh, a safe, you know, a, a work environment that feels safe for me and I think for many people at this dais, um, in addition to our staff, in addition to people in our community, and I just want to see us find a way to move forward. I think that the recommendations that have come before us um, are, are a good place to start. I do want to see us 
um, commit to some kind of conflict resolution training and not just mediation, um, because I think that is really at the root of our challenge, that we, we have not been willing as a body to do that despite um, multiple members requesting that that happen. And so we are now at a place where we can actually try to um, move forward on that and I'd like to see that happen. I hope it does um, this evening that we can move forward in a spirit of collegiality in that regard. <laughs> Okay, now's the time for action. And um, so I don't know if you wanted to take these bit by bit, and then we, or if we wanted to have a council member make a motion. Um, I, I do have an addition I'd like to request at that time when that comes forward, but I can't make a motion. Council member Crum. I will join the, 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 the voices too about, um, you know, you should not have a work environment that you, you know, that there's hostilities and there should be ways um, <coughs> available to all employees to solve these issues. Um, on March 10th of this year, I wrote a letter, it's part of the, uh, the Rose Report, it's in the packet. Um, Reaching out to the, to the mayor, I said, Dear Martine, I'm writing this letter to you because I want to take responsibility for my part in the difficulties of our working relationship. I want to try to reconcile and work together in the future in a mutually respectful way. When you said there are perceptions that my colleagues, both Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover, are intentionally bullying me because I am a woman, I assume that you agree with those perceptions. I am taking those perceptions seriously because I have undoubtedly learned attitudes of inequality towards women simply by growing up in our culture. For a long time, I have attempted to unlearn these beliefs. I take to heart your comments and I will redouble my efforts at self-reflection. It would be helpful if you would let me know what I said that you found to be bullying behavior. I want to be aware of what language I use that contributed to your negative experience. In the meantime, I want to assure you that I respect you as a person and a woman in a leadership role. I wrote that on, on March 10th. Um, I've yet to have a, a response. And I, I again reached out to the mayor uh, and asked for mediation, for conflict resolution. And again, I, I had had no response and so I, I'm just uh, a bit frustrated um, about the, this, the, the whole process as, it, as it's rolled out. So I, I, I think that it's when we do the shame and blame before we get to the um, reconciliation part, it's, it's really difficult for, to take the reconciliation part you know, in a serious way if we're doing the shaming and blaming. Maybe we should have two different meetings um, instead of putting this on the um, the same agenda. Um, I think that I would like to see us take the the Rose recommendations and um, use that as our template uh, because I don't I see some of those Rose recommendations missing from what what's what's been recommended um, by Ms. Murphy. Um, one of them in particular, the first one that he recommends in the summary and as well as at the end of the report. Council members should avoid making public accusations of misconduct of bad faith against one another and against city staff without first privately and internally addressing these concerns and attempting conflict resolution and rectification when possible. Uh, and I, I think that there's a lot of politics going on here. And, you know, it, it's very difficult having this kind of discussion even in the atmosphere we're existing right now, just in, in, in our community. Uh, and somebody just said it about, uh, the vice mayor said it had to do with Measure M and, and, and anti-Measure M, and we saw some of that <coughs> tension at the, at the microphone tonight. Um, I would like to incorporate the Rose recommendations, there's five of them, um, into um, uh, the recommendations that are before us as well, um, and I wouldn't mind um, people voting on that as, as, as well, and I, I'm gonna pass it out. Thank you, Mayor. So I guess, I mean, one thing I will say as we move forward with next steps is, you know, in February it was a time, it was a different time, and, in, and at that time, um, 
I, I felt it was re, it was my responsibility as a leader to to say something, um, and beyond then. Um, I don't think anybody could predict that multiple uh, folks would come forward after that and an investigation would ensue. And so here we are now at a place that is um, going to move us as leaders if we can say we want to move forward with policies and procedures and we want to move forward with um, next steps. That's the place we are now. So in terms of repair, it's on this council to move in the direction or to consider some of the recommendations to move forward to not only ensure that we have policies that protect our staff or council members or commissioners, but we also have next steps in terms of process. I don't think the onus is always on those who um, come forward and speak up. So with that, we'll go ahead and have um, you present your motion if that's the case. Is that where we're at? Uh, well, I'd like us to, to look at okay. um, what um, Ms. Murphy put before us and, and then maybe separate the, you know, if, if up or down votes on each um, item and then also up or down votes on what um, the Rose Report recommended on page 89. Okay. Because, I, I mean, we did pay a, a significant amount of money and went through this whole process. It seems to me that um, some of the recommendations <laughs> are, are, are very good and, um, you know, worth sticking into the, the final recommendations. Okay. Okay, Council Member Glover and then Council Member Matthews and then we can go ahead and start a motion or breaking them down. The process. So that was a lot um, from all the different perspectives. I wanna start by to speaking to the staff members. I totally hear you and your uh, feelings around any interactions that may have taken place or any issues that you may feel with regards to uh, interactions with council members um, or myself included. I uh, wanna emphasize uh, in also what uh, council member Crone had mentioned about the February 12th meeting, which was what really set all of this off. It was before anything else really had happened. Uh, and immediately following the February 12th meeting, the following Friday, I believe, uh, I met with the mayor in her office uh, to talk about potential ways that we could work together and to address the statements that she had made uh, at the city council meeting, encouraging that we would uh, open into future reconciliation, which as with Councilmember Crone's request was never answered. So I'm really excited to see these recommendations for us to be able to move forward. But I also agree with what the mayor just said with regards to that it shouldn't be on the onus of the people making the complaint to uh, in act or engage in initiating the conflict reconciliation. I think that should be from the leadership of the organization, whether that be from the city council itself or from the city manager's office, which uh, from my experience, uh, the ways that conflict is dealt with even through that interaction uh, is lacking. And that's why I really hope that in these uh, motions that we can definitely incorporate that uh, city staff or especially the city manager's office is involved in the conflict reconciliation training and in the uh, ability to address issues uh, in real time so that we don't have to deal with complaints that go without there being any kind of interaction or conversation beforehand uh, where there are not unnecessary memos sent out with regards to barring staff from speaking with council members because they haven't even tried to go through any kind of uh, mediation or conversations. So there's a lot of holes in the organization with regards to the way that uh, conflict is dealt with. Um, I also really appreciated the statements from people that were recommending uh, race, class, gender, and power issues training. I think that's really important. I think that we should be incorporating aspects of nonviolent communication into this, also implicit bias training. So all of these things I think should be layered upon each other because outside of the policies, which I think d should be addressed and looked at to make sure that all of these factors are taken into consideration in the language, uh, I think that this is a beyond a policy issue and more of a ideological issue as well as a personality issue because there is right now in Santa Cruz an ideological battle for different perspectives on whether we're going to be working one way or another. And that was uh, shown in the election in 2018. Uh, that is shown in any online forum that you go onto right now to look at conversations and uh, indicative of the attempt to remove members of this body from uh, the city council solely on a policy disagreements. So. Uh, I look forward to what we decide here. Are you going to make this motion? 
Well, I, I, I would. Well, actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and yeah, acknowledge. I, Councilor Matthews. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, sort yeah. of like put them together. Okay, and then, yeah. we'll go ahead. And, we'll go ahead and acknowledge Councilor Matthews. I, I agree, and I'd actually be happy to launch a motion. Just looking over these, I think there's a huge amount of overlap between the staff recommendation and yours. Agreed. And uh, sure, I'd sure. like to know what your. Uh, <laughs> requested addition was before we get going? Sure, my requested addition is um, having the subcommittee or staff review the city's harassment and workplace policy and address any changes to the policies and procedures that, um, and then return to the council with a re recommendation if necessary in regards to personal liability um, for any elected or commissioner or other um, who is uh, has liability and for any substantiated harassment claims. This is something that both Congress and the Senate had done in the past in terms of um, putting the liability on the individual. And if our policy doesn't have that component and there was some sort of legal con consideration that we look at that in terms of our policy. Uh, that was a lot to process all at once, but um, I think what I'll do <laughs> is um, uh, go ahead and move the recommendation before us, and I'm going to make a few changes. Did you have some suggested changes too? As well. Let me put sure. this on, and then we'll work on it. Um, the first is to appoint a subcommittee of two council members to work with staff to develop a code of ethics and conduct policy for elected and appointed officials. So that's the first thing, and I'll just say that this is um, commonly done in many other cities. We don't happen to have one. And I think the first item that is on Chris's proposal, council members should avoid making public accusations of misconduct and bad faith. That seems like the sort of thing that could go into the code of conduct. Do you agree with that? I'm, oh. I'm trying to um, so would the suggestion them. <laughs> Would the suggestion be that that council subcommittee incorporate number one in terms of what they're reviewing and potentially incorporating into as, a recommendation? As one of the items to be considered in the code of conduct. Um, I, I, I would just like to vote up or down that. I mean, I, I'm under, I'm, I don't understand why we have a committee of two and not three, for example. Well, three I don't understand fine, how don't um, uh, Ms. Murphy said we could get this done in two months, which seems, when I talked to other people, it sounded like there's a lot more time gonna be involved in something like this. Uh, just if I could, I also spoke with Lisa, and there are good examples of this as starting points. So I think a committee of two or three with staff take some time and uh, in advance, I think individual council members would want to um, let staff know of the items, the issues that they want to have covered in the code of conduct. So a working committee could probably tackle that pretty fast. Um, that was just my thought. Um, so it could be, I don't care, let's call it three, you know, appoint a subcommittee of three council members to work with staff to develop a code of ethics and conduct <coughs> policy for elected and appointed officials to um, include um, accusations of misconduct or bad faith against one another among other issues. Just trying to get it out there. Does that, does that do it for you? I, I'm just like the, that one statement because I really think that that first statement goes to the heart of where we're at right now um, and what, why we maybe shouldn't have come here, got here, but we did, and this is uh, and somebody who's looked at it, interviewed all these folks, and said, as his first recommendation, council members should avoid making public accusations of misconduct or bad faith without talking, okay. or at uh, least looking for some can, sort of mediation. Okay, well, why don't we, um, I'll go ahead and acknowledge Vice Mayor Cummings, and then we'll just break them up so that yeah. we can eventually move yeah. on them. Okay, Vice Mayor. I just wanna mention to Council Member Crone, I think that the intention is that Currently, there's no code of ethics and conduct policy for appointed officials in the city. Um, and the idea is that we can put together a subcommittee to develop that code of conduct policy, which my assumption is that we'll all agree to if we're gonna serve as city council members, and that your item number one be one of the codes of conduct. And so when this comes back yeah. by this committee, we will adopt that. Okay, agreed. Yeah. 
That's where I was Thank trying you. to Sorry. go. Sorry, I didn't understand. Okay, do you want to make that into a motion to appoint the? Should we take them one at a time? I think that would be okay, good. Okay, then get I'll, them, I'll make as, uh, the first motion that we appoint a subcommittee of three council members to work with staff to develop a code of ethics and conduct policy, policy for elected and appointed officials um, to include that the council members should avoid making public accusations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The okay. language in Christopher's. And that council members should be encouraged to uh, contact staff with other issues they feel should be considered in the code of conduct policy. I'll second that. Okay. So that gives everyone a chance to direct their concerns to staff. Okay. Do we want to appoint those individuals now or do we want to do that um, in a, another forum? I think personally, I think what might work in this circumstance is to have you as our HR director to think of what a good mix of three council <coughs> members in regards to your interpretation. I don't think, at, I don't know how I can win in this scenario, to be quite honest with you. So for me, I think having an outside, somebody from the HR who wants to work on these issues with a diverse group of council members. Why don't I put out a call for volunteers after here yeah. and see what comes through. If I have more than three, then uh, I'll, I'll meet with everybody and, and see how we can't uh, whittle that down. Okay, great. Okay, so we have a motion. Um, for item number one, to incorporate item number one of Councilmember Crone's suggestions um, as a consideration as that subcommittee develops their code of ethics, essentially. Correct? Yep. Okay. Should we go ahead and vote on that? All right. Can I question? ask for a clarification before you do? Yep. Second part of that that I heard during the discussion was that council members um, should contact staff to include additional provisions in the a uh, code of conduct that not, council members would like to. Not provisions, issues should that, that should be considered. Issues that should be considered, yeah. perfect, thank you. <coughs> and that's right, to also allow for other input. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, any other questions on that one? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay. Then um, number two on Chris's, all members of council receive immediate training in the city Administrative Procedure Order 1B, the Respectful Workplace Conduct and City Council Policy 25.2. I think that very closely mirrors four and five um, and actually overlaps with three in different ways. Um, so the public doesn't have this in front of it, so I apologize for that. Um, I'll be the, the item three in the staff recommendation is that all new council members attend a live training session of the sexual harassment discrimination workplace conduct policies within the first 60 days of office and attend every two years thereafter as required by the state of California. What's different from that, from our current policy, is it requires a live training session, which I think we all know is a little bit more effective than an online training. And uh, it's within the first 60 days rather than in the first year. So um, I think that's pretty close to what your number two is there. It, no, it's the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we just go with that number three that's in the uh, staff recommendation. Yeah. It, the, the one thing it doesn't wait, say wait. is immediate. Um, it, it doesn't say immediate. And I think just to be realistic, if we say within the first 60 days, and then there's another um, uh, item in both, in different forms, in the staff recommendation in yours, talks about um, um, onboarding. Where is that? Um, <coughs> if I can maybe just offer a bit of a suggestion. Yes. Maybe we can go through staff what we ones? have for the staff ones. If yeah. there's elements that have been missed, then we can pull those that we want from the additional. I think right. to try I, to I reconcile I was just trying to two. find the I know, and I think it's just a little bit complicated and difficult for our city clerk yeah. to catch. And I think we'll have a chance to get to everything if we Got want. Got it. So I'm going to move um, item three, which is all new council members attend a live training session of the sexual harassment discrimination workplace conduct policies within the first 60 days of taking office and attend every two years thereafter as required by the state of California. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say, oh. I, I had a question around Mayor? this one item because um, is this 
a general sexual harassment discrimination and workplace conduct policy because I think that it's good that we have that training, but what I was gonna add to it was that we're provided the city's policy specifically, uh, which we weren't provided when we first onboarded, and I think that there can be you know, nuanced details within the city's policy, so if we can also be provided the city's policy within 14 days and sign an agreement or a letter stating that we have read and agree to the city's policies as well as the training. Yeah, um, let me just say that that gets down to number six here, which is direct staff to prepare a formal onboarding process for new city council members that incorporate sexual harassment, discrimination, workplace conduct policies. So, and if you looked at the um, discussion of that, <coughs> and you've all been there, you get elected, you get sworn in in mid-December, and then basically the city shuts down. <laughs> and then you come to the first meeting in January, and you gotta operate like you know what's going on, and you don't. And so um, I think the idea of doing that part of it early on, I don't know if you feel it's adequately covered in six there. I, th I think sometimes for the live training session, Lisa, you can tell me, don't we bring in external trainers for that? We do, and we also, we do incorporate in the live training. Okay. Uh, I just wanna also mention that as part of that training is, is unique to us so that we do the workplace conduct and we also do require the cultural uh, diversity training of all um, new officials so why as well. Yeah, then why don't we just fold that in? Um, so that would be then uh, all new council members do all that within the first two years as we're required by the state of California and the training shall also include Santa Cruz specific policies on Fill in the blanks. Workplace. Mm -hmm. We do the, the workplace conduct, respectful workplace conduct, as well as the uh, cultural diversity. We require that as well. Okay. Did you uh, I can include all those policies. Yeah. Okay, did you catch that, um, Bonnie? Got it. Okay, is that a, a, appropriate for the seconder of the motion? Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? This is item number three. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. <coughs> um, <coughs> Then I'm, I'm saving two till the end because uh -huh. I have some a little more complicated thoughts on that. Uh, number four, staff will review and revise if necessary the, I'm just gonna say APO, um, Administrative Procedure Order, Section 2A, and the APO Section 21B. And uh, the reason that the staff reviews those, this is what I have learned, <laughs> is that the administrative procedure orders are developed internally by staff. And so they, they will review based on the learning experience that we've gone through and look at the areas that need refinement or clarification. And I know from those, um, the staff members who spoke and their experiences, the whole issue of what was confidential about what they were saying and what wasn't was not clear. That was a big, um, big issue for them, so, and we've talked. So um, these are things um, that need to be clarified. And here again, I think if individual council members reading over the APOs see things they, they feel need to be dealt with, <coughs> they can get to our staff. But the, the review of the two APOs would be done at the staff level. So you're moving number four? That's number four, I'll okay. move that. Second. Question, uh, I'm just wondering, did, the, did um, Joe Rose's report, did he, why didn't he point this out, or did he? And I didn't see it. The, well, I think for, that's, the, that's one of my recommendations, is that now that we've had uh, a, a significant event occur, uh, unlike any other, we have learned some lessons as we've gone through, uh, not just only whether it could be definitions, but process as well, notification process. So I think a whole overlook of the, the entire policy is warranted. And yeah, so. For the discussion, Councilmember Brown, I mean, I guess I would just say my interpretation of this also is that the Rose report doesn't speak to it because part of the, where the issue came up was in the Rose report and what was made public mm -hmm. as part of that. So it wouldn't, so it was yeah. kind of a document that is the basis for consideration of this question. Yeah. Did, did, um, yeah, uh, but during this whole thing, uh, there's been a series of press releases released by the city 
and it has been very uh, defaming of Councilmember Glover and myself, and we've heard it from a lot, many people around <laughs> town. And I, I, I wonder if this also, the uh, committee could take up that also, that, that aspect of it and say, well, what, what, what is a press release when you're using council members' names and you're just using innuendo that's out there? It was, um, it was really, it was, that was, was hurtful also. Hey, council Member Myers. Well, I'm just gonna bring up then the use of Facebook and uh, framing me as a racist. So these are things that uh, need to go on, uh, we all need to sort of realize that there was things revealed that should have been confidential. There shouldn't have been predetermined <laughs> Facebook posts about the outcomes of the investigation. You should never, never call someone a racist. I've been an out lesbian for 34 years, okay? So don't, don't call me a racist. So I'm sorry that a press release upset you but do not defame me in this community. I think we'll let's take a get these motions done. I'm tired. I let's know, go home. I know, Don. Okay. Let's I'm sick of this. Let's maybe take a let's like maybe take a three minute breather, and we'll come back and we'll get through the motions. I think we're really there. To I think be we're honest. very They're close. Almost exactly the same. So maybe we could expedite that. I can't make a motion. <laughs> so well, I, I think I have a motion for. Do you want to, to break? I, Is that what you're thinking? I think we let's need a two minute. Let's just. Moving. Are you. Yeah, okay. Let's move. Okay. So I think if we could, I think th there isn't have, a need to we necessarily have number belabor four, this. And the issue was raised about a press release. I think that's the kind of thing when we go through the APO, that's where that should get addressed. So let's send that issue to Lisa okay. to talk about. So you move number four. Why don't you see? I second it. Okay, seconded. As, as written. Okay, Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. I want to get to number five. Number five has to do with the Council's policy, 25.2, and that's the one that we act on. So the staff will develop the APOs with input and then bring forth a suggested revised Yep. Council policy. So I will go ahead and move that the council review and revise as appropriate council policy, et cetera, et cetera, based on the outcome of number four. Okay, second. Uh, any further discussion? Councilmember Glover. Uh, I mean, that's a lot to take in what just happened. Uh, if I had done that, <laughs> uh, the world would have ended uh, based off of all of these things that are going on right now. Uh, I think number one, right, right here, that was um, of the Rose Report. Council members should avoid making public accusations of misconduct, of bad faith against one another and against city staff without first privately or internally addressing these concerns. I have no idea whether you were addressing myself or Council Member Crone. You were looking at both of us the entire time, and you just made a public accusation in bad faith against one of your colleagues without any anything. So I, I would just say I, I don't want us to rush through this because of that outburst. And I feel our speed picking up as we're starting to talk about these different issues. This requires our focus and our attention and we need to be very thorough because if there's that response to the assumption, I have no idea what Facebook posts and who you're, again, who you're talking to, but to have that response to anyone suggesting you're a racist, I think that that is why we really need to have some of this implicit bias and anti-racism training worked into our uh, training regiment because that was really disturbing and uh, intimidating to me. So okay. I would really appreciate it if you would not why don't do we, that. I'll just go ahead and pause for a second. Why don't we go ahead and just acknowledge the fact that item number two on the recommendations is to have some conflict resolution. And um, I think that Right now, we have an opportunity to choose a path that we can move forward with trying to institute some not only procedures and policies around improving our government structure, but we also have a path to say we will have an opportunity to have these difficult conversations. We are going to commit in some regard to some form of, of mediation and conflict resolution in the future. But tonight at 1020, um, after a really long and um, difficult evening, I'd say, we can take the we can let that be. So I guess my hope is that we can move through this knowing that one of the 
potential outcomes will be for us to move forward with some conflict resolution. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. So I think I've moved number five, which is revising, review and revise as appropriate policy number 25.2. That's the policy on discrimination, harassment, retaliation, respectful workplace that we adopt as a council. Did you already move that, you said? Or you want no, to move that? No, that's the next step. That's okay. after the review yeah. of the APOs, then that would be the next step. Okay, so do you want to make that as the motion? motion. I'll motion. second that motion. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. I will say the whole issue that this number one on Chris is about avoid making public accusations, I do think that's appropriate to go into the whole code of conduct decision and I will just say about Facebook, God well, only knows what goes out on social media. Okay, so but let's try to keep I it know. directed to saying. the content before us at this time, please. Um, then let's go to number six, which is directing staff to prepare a formal onboarding process for new city council members that incorporate sexual harassment, discrimination, and workplace conduct policies. I'll second that and add that we incorporate that new city council members and commissioners mm -hmm. also um, be incorporated yeah. into that mm -hmm. as well. Vice Mayor. I'd like to, wait, I don't know if that was, that second. Yeah, that was seconded. I would also myself. ask for a friendly amendment that this occur within the first 60 days of being seated or being sworn into the city council. Cause there's no, the. Yes, and, and we have in our, I agree. Um, it should be sooner than six. Should be, days. should be sooner. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and that's you know, um, uh, the staff report discussion says there should be a, a formal onboarding process for new council members, all council members, and this is this is where I say, come on, people, during the Christmas vacation, let's get that's real. Right. It lists all this stuff, so um, s staff will have to go off and work on this. So I think it's that issue and the real basics. Okay. So, and that's, okay, great. We'll try to expedite that. Go ahead. I just said the reason why I said 60 days was taken into account that council members get sworn in in December, they go on Christmas break, and then in January, that would, you know, be around the 60 day period. So the, for it to work, for the onboarding to occur, just. Yeah, I mean, so that's the motion, just as written, really, with the uh, addition of and commissioners. Okay. I second the motion. Yeah, and within 60 days. Adam. Okay. Okay. Incorporating in 60 days. I seconded it. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimous. And I'll just say, um, I've talked with Lisa about this, and um, it is a lot to digest when you're new, and so much to get a grip on things you never thought about. I mean, I'd, I'd honestly like to be a part of that process, and I, prob I think maybe someone who's brand new, so you get... You know, I didn't know this, and oh, you should know that. Right. Combo. So, I, I mean, that's for you. I think that's a great, when, when we start putting this together, I, I'm going to look to people who have been through the process. What did they need to know? What, what did, um, what was their experiences like? That's a, a fabulous um, addition to it. So now we get to number, did we vote on Actually, that? Actually, we, we did vote on that. Before we get to number two, which I think you're reserving for a little bit more uh, conversation, I'd like to incorporate, or if somebody would be willing to incorporate in the motion, that we have staff review our harassment and workplace policy, and if appropriate to, or maybe it's our city attorney, I guess, if it's appropriate to have changes to these policies, um, that they return back to the council with a re recommendation to hold um, any uh, city elected official personally liable for any substantiated harassment claims. Um, and remove uh, sort of the liability from the city because similar to what's happened at the federal level, um, they're recognizing that the taxpayers should not uh, shoulder those costs. That would be to number four. Is that what you're That, that sounds like a separate one, and that's okay. the city attorney. Okay. Is there consensus for, for having you explore that, or I can't make a motion, but that would be something you know, I'd be interested in exploring. I will say I know of that at the uh, higher levels of government. Um, never heard of it at a municipal level, but I see no harm asking for information on that. Okay. So, so if maybe you want to report back to Tony. I'll, I'll, I'm fine with that if you want to report back with any information on that as it relates to our policies. And um, if there's any kind of recommendation that we would want to come forward with, you can let us know. I could report back on options for the council yeah. to consider. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember Brown. Just a question. Um, you're suggesting that you'd like that to come to the full council and not be considered as a part of the subcommittee process it could consideration be. of our 
ethics and conduct policy in general? And I, I think we need more information. I think what you can do is, is hear what he has to say with regards to what is your capabilities on the liability side, and then the, the location that you can drop that in, if you choose to do so, would be within your own council policy. Okay. So we can we can incorporate it into that, and that way you have the um, you can determine what you want to put in there. So it could be to the full council. As, it it as could, right, in, in of the um, number five. Even though that is predicated on any changes in number four, it doesn't stop you from bringing that particular policy back at any time because it is, it, it is your policy. Okay. Yeah. So can okay. we just agree? Do we need a motion? <laughs> Would you uh, prefer a motion or do we just agree? Direct him to yeah, we'll just, uh, bring yeah. back information. It's a request for information, I think, is what we're trying a to do. Request for information if there's any type of recommendation as it relates to our council policy. Is there agreement upon the council in that regard? Regarding liability. Re regarding personal liability. Um, and I, I'm happy to share with you what I have <coughs> written, if you like. Or That's fine. But I'm, yeah. I'm happy to you research that and report back to the council. Okay. Will we just do that by consensus, by consensus agreement. Yeah. Okay. And then... Um, did you have yeah. a question about that? No, I was going to discuss. You Number can go two. first. Okay. Um, well, I think. Oh, this number two. No, no, this number two. Chris, num Chris is I, number two. If I can speak to that. Uh, well, I think we covered that, didn't we? My understanding is that was incorporated into number three. I, yeah. I, Did you have a question about that? Yeah, if I could speak to that a little. I think that there's a difference in the intention behind what Chris has brought forward as number two and what is going into um, the live training session for um, potentially new council members within the, the, the first 60 days of office. I think what came out of the Rose report is that um, there seems to be, you know, a, there seems to be some issues around um, an understanding amongst members of our city council of the respectful work, workplace policy and the different um, items around discrimination and harassment. And so my interpretation of what came out of the Rose Report is that we as a sitting body have immediate training in the, the APO Section 1B, which it sounds like is gonna change if we're gonna be, um, based on what we've moved so far this evening, um, around respectful workplace conduct. And so I think it's a separate issue where what he's recommending is that we all have the training, it is acknowledged by the public that mm -hmm. we've received this training, so that moving forward, if there are issues that the public knows and that we all know that we have had the training on this respectful workplace policy. So I just wanna. As Elizabeth uh, Warren says, I have a plan for that. Well, let's go ahead and see, we have our yeah. HR director. Well, everybody's supposed to complete it within this first year anyway, with the new state law that has occurred. So I know many of you have already taken the, the course this year. I can't <laughs> recall off the top of my head who hasn't. Um, so well, I'm more than happy to offer a refresher class if, if I, that's what you're looking for. I think what's, what, the in, what the intention of yours is that we take it collectively rather than individually taking the class. And so I think we could do that in number two, just say all council members will participate in a training on the Santa Cruz administrative procedure and policy. And I mean, we're gonna do a little training here. If I could, maybe I'll just recommend that we do that after we have staff review and revise yeah. it, because that makes the most sense if we're gonna have a change to it, because there's inadequate kind of elements that we've learned from this process that's missing, that maybe we'd wait, and as soon as it's been revised and approved, then we have a training in it. How's that? Sounds good to me. Okay, potential solution? Makes sense, okay. In terms of timing, that's how that would then, fit. Uh, we could just add that number three. Um, um, all members of the city council will receive training in the APO and city council policy upon revision of those policies. Does that sound like a good deal? Upon revision of those policies and it could be incorporated into the onboarding process moving forward from here. Councilman Brown. I'm sorry to complicate or to potentially complicate this, but I'm a little confused now because the training that I believe Ms. Murphy is talking about is, a, is an already established training mm -hmm. Um, which happens, uh, w which is structured regardless of what our specifics are. This is about the state law. So having that refresher isn't gonna, or, or doing it together as that training is not <coughs> going to get us to looking at whatever it is that we kind of 
put no, together. No, I think our, our the, when, we, when we do it in-house, we incorporate our policies into it. So okay. it, they're included. So if you do the, the, that's why the recommendation is structured that way because our live courses include the city's policies and that's when they're provided to employees. That's what we do with all of our employees. Okay. Well, that meeting I went to, but great. Okay. Um, so should we move on to two? Yeah. Okay. Um, I am personally not so interested in spending the large amounts of money spelled out here um, for uh, conflict resolution and mediation um, processes. They seem very much in depth and kind of going over a lot of ground that's been done in the past by different groups. Um, personally, I would <coughs> support um, all members participate in um, a conflict resolution training uh, conducted by qualified conflict resolution professional. And by that, I, I mean a collective training. And that the city then make uh, conflict resolution services available on an as needed basis um, as situations arise. That to me is more forward looking. Okay. Councilor Brown. Councilor Brown after. Uh, so while I can appreciate that. Just looking at the estimate for, say, the Conflict Resolution Center, which we heard a representative from this evening, uh, their total estimated cost for a holistic, multi-tier approach to conflict resolution is $11,325. We spent over $18,000 on the report that we're talking about right now, which gave us the instruction to do holistic and complete conflict re resolution. So I really don't think, um, well, I'm a little concerned, let me just reframe that. I'm a little concerned about us making a decision based off of price when we spend <coughs> $7,000 more than the estimated total on the divisive aspect of not addressing conflict uh, re reconciliation. And this whole concept of conflict resolution and reconciliation is near and dear to my heart because I firmly believe uh, that conflict in itself is neutral. Uh, we experience conflict every day. The, the way that we determine what conflict is is how we deal with it, whether we address it head on or through mediated conversation or whether we let it brew up inside of us and <coughs> rack up all kinds of different complaints and then uh, bring them all at once without even talking to the other person. So I would uh, encourage us, because I didn't hear a second to that motion, um, that I would make a motion uh, to move number two um, and which is to engage in conflict reconciliation or resolution training with a qualified professional uh, and approach the conflict resolution center to use their uh, contract or um, proposal that they provided uh, in addition to conflict resolution training to uh, instruct staff to come back with options for nonviolent communication training, unless that's already incorporated in the conflict <laughs> resolution training. Uh, and then in addition, specifically race, class, gender, and power issues training with an emphasis on implicit bias. Second. Okay. I was, Councilor Brown. I was gonna second it. I was writing my note, but um, I would. I was gonna second that, but um, I also wanted to ask uh, uh, if the maker of the motion would incorporate the um, part of the of um, Councilmember Matthews' motion about have making uh, services available on an as-needed basis. I think um, that doing something like what the Conflict Resolution Center has proposed, although we don't know exactly what that is because mm. we have a price, but not a whole lot of detail well, on what this plan. Yeah, there, is, there, so yeah. there is a plan, but um, in <coughs> terms of how it might get at some of the things that um, Council Member Glover, you're talking about, I guess, is what my what I meant. I by think that. how about um, that we can say suggest yes that we'd like to have. I mean, I'd I'd be interested in having all of those included. We, it would be yeah. worth asking. The Just for information, Ms. Ms. Bradovic is here from the Conflict okay. Resolution well, Center. Okay. So if you have any yeah. questions, yeah, I'm sure she can answer your questions. Um, maybe we could ask that question then uh, and or just provide direction that we would like to have that included in whatever um, comes, whatever training we get, as well as make, ha making these services available as needed. And I wanna make one more comment about that because I feel like it's really important that we have some kind of accountability mechanism built into that because part of the problem is 
even if they're available and nobody's making use of them um, because not everybody's on board with doing it, we end up here. <coughs> um, and so I'd like to have, a, you know, somewhere, maybe in the subcommittee, some space for having a, uh, uh, bringing us a proposal that um, kinds of holds us ac holds us accountable for for using those services as they are needed, and not um, just kind of if we decide we want to take um, an up someone up on the offer. I will, that was a, yeah that was a lot, but yes, I will totally I'll take I'll take all of that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's we'll go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge Vice Mayor Cummings. Just wondering if you could yes. just repeat the motion because I was looking at number two in the staff report, um, which is what you said, and then I wasn't, and that was something different. So could you just repeat? Because I wasn't sure where you were reading from. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the recommendations number two to move all council members agree to attend mediation conducted by qualified conflict resolution professional and approach the conflict resolution center um, to use the quote that they provided in the uh, agenda packet which cites the 11,300 and change no, number, um, but then also to incorporate, um, if it's not already in the training and maybe the representative from the non, uh, the conflict resolution center could come up and let us know um, if there uh -huh. is aspects of nonviolent communication training incorporated in that conflict reconciliation, which I'd imagine there probably is, um, but then also uh, where it comes down to race, class, gender, and power issues, <laughs> and if they're incorporated in there, and then with the implicit bias training, and I want to make sure this is cool with the second of my motion, I specifically want the city of Santa Cruz to approach the Santa Cruz County Community Coalition to overcome racism uh, and engage them in their cracking the codes implicit bias training, which has proven to be incredibly effective at opening up people's minds and understanding about the systemic racism and implicit bias we all carry with us. That's SCORE, right? Yeah. 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 Maybe we could do it for the interest of trying to, to get this through, that we could look into that at the future. Yeah, at, we at future we do, time. actually we do offer uh, an implicit, bi implicit bias training class for uh, here, but I would be very interested. I'm always looking for new trainers, different variety, so I'd love to get that contact information. I think we can uh, achieve what you're looking for from the staff's perspective, which I think council could attend to, um, I'm always willing to, like I said, let's let's try another group if, if it may be better than the one we're using. I don't, okay. I can't recall who we're using, but send that to me, that'd be great. Okay, so it seems like there's some interest in um, kind of now understanding the direction that the council is interested in going in that I think could be fine tuned hopefully as we move forward with what the next steps would be based on the contract potentially with the conflict resolution center. I'm happy to op uh, allow the opportunity if the director says that she can't do that or does wanna do that. If not, I, I'm assuming that it's gonna work since she's here and, and, and hasn't said, no, I'm not gonna be able to do that. And hopefully we can just get that fine tuned in terms of next steps. Um, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Glover. Um, that piled on a whole lot of more stuff than, I, run. <laughs> than I was anticipating. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering about the time because even the, um, um, the training conflict <coughs> resolution uh, training for council members involves private one-on-ones and then a five-hour training of facilitation. So that's a six hour training right there. And then there are all these other trainings that have been suggested. So I, I know they're all good, but um, I, I don't know uh, how much we wanna pack into um, the expectation for every year or if there'd be different um, trainings offered uh, at different times. The other question I have is the, the language here says all council members agree to attend mediation conducted by qualified conflict resolution professional. Did that mean when there's a problem, you agree to mediation? Or did it mean that we agree to a training on conflict oh, resolution right. principles and so forth? Um, I've used the conflict, uh, the city council has used conflict resolution center in the past very, very successfully with parties that appeared to be at war with one another. So I have a lot of respect, but I'm just wondering what we intend here. 
Maybe I could, if I could maybe yeah. just interrupt, and then I'm gonna go ahead and acknowledge yeah. Councilmember Glover, and then I'll go ahead to Vice Mayor Cummings. I don't think we need yeah, to go I'm through. I'm sorry, but I had my hand up and you acknowledged me. But and right. I, it's hard for me to keep me. track of everybody. Sorry, but. I'll just make, if I could, I'll, I'll first start with Councilmember Brown. But I guess what I'll say is that instead of us going through the nuances of the contract <laughs> at this time, perhaps we could have the ethics subcommittee look at what that would look like, work with the HR department and our um, contractor to fine tune the next step and bring forward the next iteration of it. Councilmember Brown, mm -hmm. forgive uh, me. We have been um, kind of speculating about what's possible with the Conflict Resolution Center. We have a representative here. I would ask that um, we <coughs> invite um, the director up and to just respond to the discussion that we're having to see if we can maybe just resolve it now instead <laughs> of uh, leaving wondering what's possible. and. Figure, trying to figure out what to do next. Sure. Good evening. So, um, my name is Leila Bratovic, and I'm the director of the Conflict Resolution Center. And uh, you all have the submitted proposal already. <laughs> and the proposal is really threefold with uh, an opening for future. Um, future needs as well. So there is, it seems that there is an immediate need to, that needs to be addressed which is uh, the, the training in conflict resolution, in communication, in breaking that spiral of conflict. And uh, that's really the first step. And <coughs> even before that can be done first, it would be really necessary to talk with each of you individually so that that way it, this is a tailored custom training for you specifically. So to make sure that we're addressing exactly the issues that you need, you need addressed. The differences between the training and facilitation, is, training is a training, and then facilitation is not quite the mediation, it's really getting everybody, sounds like uh, some of the work that you've already done on shared values and how do, you, how do you really want to approach conflict when it arises again? What are the next steps? So that can be this discussion that you're having now, like the next step is like when a conflict arises, we'll try to resolve it privately first. If it doesn't work, we're across the street pretty much. We can call the Conflict Resolution Center. We can have a mediation within a week, whatever works for you. It's for you to decide for us to facilitate the, the decision. Um, there's also the part of doing the training with the, with the staff. Um, same thing, same breaking the spiral of conflict, getting everybody on the same page. It's really what we're trying to do is change the culture of how we address conflict at the at the city council level, at the city at, at the city, so that when the future situations arise, there is um, common ground already. So, and then there's the of course the mediations, the mediations that have been proposed right now relate directly, as I, as I understood, to the, to the two cases from the report that have been substantiated. And that gives an opening also that potentially other mediations are needed. It's really, again, it's up to you. It's a voluntary process. So that's, if you have any questions, yeah. Well, I'll just say thank you for being here okay. and for being um, available to share. And it sounds like what you have before us is an, a good first step. And, we definitely have more to learn from that. So I'm comfortable moving in that direction at this time personally. Sure. Okay. Just want to say that it does include parts of the nonviolent communication. It's not fully just NVC. It does not necessarily include the implicit, like it touches, but it's not an implicit bias or any sort of um, racial gender training specifically. It's really communication, so. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as much as I appreciate subcommittees and stuff. Um, I feel that this needs to be moved on uh, almost immediately, especially because we've been waiting for months and months to be able to address the situation. So um, I think that we should move forward immediately with uh, the 
conflict reconciliation training. Uh, to answer the question of Councilmember Matthews, I think that we should all agree to participate in this mediated uh, conflict resolution training with the professional at the Conflict Resolution Center as a group uh, and throughout the entire process also the, with the individual ones, but also, as was mentioned and added to the motion, uh, make it an ongoing process so that we can have that um, available and so that there's a level of accountability to make sure people are using that as a first option before they go and file complaints or launch investigations and all this other kind of stuff. And then I also do, as much as I appreciate um, Director Murphy's uh, implicit bias training, I've heard from mm -hmm. people that it definitely could use some updating. Um, and I am very familiar uh, because I've gone through the SCORE cracking the codes training. So I would prioritize that one uh, to make sure that all the council members receive that specific training uh, because of how uh, holistic and thorough it is. It runs about four hours. And so that gets back to the question of time. Uh, I think that this issue uh, deserves a large portion of our time because it has slowed down and impeded the ability for us to move forward on the super important issues that we should be dealing with as a city. So if that means investing <coughs> 10, 15 hours of training in understanding all of these different nuanced issues and uh, different areas of interaction, I think that it is uh, it would behoove us all and the citizens of Santa Cruz for us to invest that time. All right, Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, I just wanted to say that for, for clarification, I think that number two is pertaining to the current city council members and that this is enough, that because we have issues right now that need to be reconciled and yeah. we've been needing to. So yeah. I just, I think what I was hearing before, some confusion around that is something that all city council members have in the future, but I think it's just, I just wanted to clarify that it seems like that's specific for us as a body currently. Okay, so that seems to be essentially what was also affirmed by the executive director. Okay, did you have additional comments? Yeah, I just wanna put it for the record that while I do believe that it's important for this group to go through the training because of the issues that currently exist, I think having preemptive training for council members, just like the other trainings potentially every two years since that's the overlap of the time that people are on, on city council uh, that may be beneficial because that will not only reinvigorate the knowledge in the minds of the people that are continuing after those two years, but also give a very robust and clear understanding for the new coming uh, uh, or incoming council members. Councilman Matthews. Um, I do want to get some clarity on the nature of the motion. Um, as spelled out here, it's... Um, 10 hours of training, just uh, interviews and training and follow-up facilitation on the conflict resolution, and then additional training on other topics. And so, so I, if I could, I think it's essentially accepting the conflict resolutions contract or proposal, and then um, <laughs> Councilmember Glover was gonna be working with uh, our director, Lisa Murphy from HR on implicit bias training and if there's a training that the council members can take as well as soon as possible would also be incorporated that. Does that summarize your motion? Yeah, just, uh, but also the race, class, gender and power, uh, which is kind of in the implicit bias training. So we'll start there and then if there's more we want to expand on, we can bring that secondary training back, but. Okay, know. so knowing that we can expand training beyond that at a certain point. That's essentially the motion. Council member Brown. I'm just wondering where the incorporation of some accountability to utilize um, conflict resolution and mediation as needed. Uh, I believe it. Uh, Part of the motion, wasn't it? It was a friendly amendment. Yeah, yeah, friendly amendment that you made it and me, we both accepted it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But thanks for clarifying. Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm a little confused because currently we do receive race and implicit bias training. So I'm just kind of curious as to how incorporating that again into this, like what's the intention behind it since we've all, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. we've all gone through that already and that's already incorporated into the city council policy. Yeah, the uh, implicit bias training is a specific and in-depth four-hour process that's paired with uh, 
uh, video and incorporates small breakout sessions with discussions and uh, exploration into uh, personal biases and unconscious behavior. So it's just a lot more in depth, uh, and it, I think it really carries a lot more weight because I've been, like I said before, I've been through it a couple times now, but also watching people go through it and the transformation that they have just in their understanding of the situation. I guess if I could, I just think that we can look into that and move forward, but for the interest of the item before us around the conflict <laughs> resolution, maybe we can, instead of trying to go to in that, we can just kind of maybe focus on that tonight and knowing that there could be more opportunities to look at what we've already had, what you're suggesting, what could be contracted with through our human resources department, how it might fit in for the purposes of this evening's item, particularly as it relates to what's agendized this evening, having it go through some of that conflict resolution components at this point seems appropriate. Does that work for you in terms of the direction that's been taken in? Uh, as long as we're working on it to potentially implement implicit bias training through SCORE and cracking the codes, then sure. It sounds like that's what our, uh, our uh, we require, like I said, we require the cultural diversity class that you have to take. And maybe it's time to update, refresh, try something new, do another look. Uh, that's, that's something we could do, but you all are required to take that. And then just to reiterate again, the implicit bias, which we do have that class, it's not required to take, but we do offer it. Um, but it can be time, as, as we were saying, to look at it again, revamp it, you go another uh, with another uh, vendor, or right. have you say, I have, that's absolutely fine. We don't require that class is what I'm, is, is the distinction I wanna make. Okay, so we can look at our policies around that. Does that fit? Sure. Okay. Okay, so essentially um, moving forward right now though at the, at the time with the recommendation of two and moving forward with the, um, the um, conflict resolution center, excuse me, right? Okay. Do we have a, uh, a time certain, uh, I mean, 60 days, are we gonna, uh, you know, that's our deadline to do this? As, as soon as we can figure it out. I'll start scheduling. You know how difficult it is for it to get you all together, but that's that's the first hurdle to overcome. But we we can start right away. Okay, that would be great. As long as right away. All right. Yeah, so just to clarify, with respect to the conflict resolution, we'll get started on that right away. That'll be the priority. With respect to the other trainings, we'll look at how we might incorporate that or update it within our existing uh, programs and, and and classes. Just to be clear. Okay. Okay. That'd be great. I had a question. Does this incorporate mediation? Because, I mean, I hear a yes, conflict it does. resolution training. Yes, con yes, 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 as, as described by uh, Ms. Bradovic. Yeah. In the packet, yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time.